I should have started from the title of the talk. Uh, I want to talk about calcium signaling and mechanics in embryogenesis, as Julia said. Um, and I want to start with some experiments that not only refer to embryogenesis, to show you this interplay of calcium signaling and mechanics. Then I want to talk a bit about calcium signaling and mechanical effects, um, some experiments we analyzed and then a new mechanochemical model uh, we are proposing for the interplay of calcium signal and mechanics, and then conclude. So, um, there is plenty of evidence that there are mechanically stimulated calcium waves in many cell types. So I will give you some examples. For example, you have mechanically stimulated calcium waves in airway epithelial cells. You can see the calcium waves starting from uh, the top left and then becoming uh, larger and larger and spreading in the tissue as uh, time goes by towards the bottom right. Then you have similar uh, phenomenon in uh, keratinocytes in the epidermis. Um, you also have a similar phenomenon in endothelial cells involved in atherosclerosis. So this is from a recent paper from the Barakat lab in a gold polytechnique where they shear the endothelial cells with flow and they find again uh, calcium waves as a response. And then uh, one uh, problem that we started looking at with colleagues in Cartiv and Oxford is uh, the following. I hope I can play this uh, movie somehow. Um, yeah, I come from here. So on the bottom, you can see um, calcium pulses, and you can also see uh, what is measured by the PIV, an imaging method, on the fertilizing egg. So you have an egg that has been injected with sperm in ICSI, and then you can see it's, they are subtle, but they are there, that every time that there is a calcium pulse, there is a whoosh mechanical movement in the fertilizing egg. And so it has to run. I will stop talking so you can uh, see that. It, it's subtle, but it's there, and the Tundi plots below can, tell, can show this correlation, right? But of course you can see that, uh, where is my pointer? Um, here, the correlation is not very good here, right? So you have correlation with the calcium and the mechanical uh, movement here, here, but then now we are in this time in the simulation and it's moving to the right. When it reaches about here, not such a good correlation. And why is this important? Because if you manage to establish the calcium signaling connection to mechanical movements in this case, you can uh, potentially go to new IVF treatments because um, one very big challenge in this in, in vitro fertilization is which embryo from the ones created in the lab you can transfer into the woman. So, and they also know from very recent experiments that if you know what calcium is doing, then you can decide because there is an optimal calcium pattern that corresponds to better pregnancy rates. So, but calcium, as um, and Dr. Pedersen was mentioning yesterday about calcium indicators with gecko, etc., you have to put dyes, also many other people know this, you have to put dyes and then you destroy the egg so you cannot image calcium. You have destroyed the OER process. So if you find a non-invasive mechanical way that to just image the egg, then you are in business because then you can use your sophisticated imaging to infer what the fertilizing egg is doing. So I'm spending some time to say this because I'm not going to say about the mass because I said that we just started, but it's part of the whole story about how, how calcium signaling and mechanics play a role in so many processes and in particular fertilization and embryogenesis. So this um, brings me um, to the problem that I'm going to also address mathematically, um, I will start with the motivation that came out of a visit of uh, John Chapman in Caltech back in 2000. Um, the experimentalist there showed him that uh, in this embryonic tissue, 
you have the stained cells, and I'll play it again. As the tissue is moving, you can see these flashes, which again are calcium. So there is some kind of interplay between this movement of the tissue and the calcium flashes that appear in the tissue. And in fact, they have found back then in the Wallingford paper, which is very well cited now, but not too much by modelers, that uh, if they interrupt uh, calcium, then you have embryo abnormalities. So calcium is very important in this process of conversion extension. And then, um, much more recently, uh, in the Scurridis lab in Cyprus, um, they had established that you need calcium to elicit contractions in apical constriction. Apical constriction, constriction sorry, is a very important uh, morphogenetic process in which you need it to close the neural tube. So again, they found that if calcium is disrupted, embryo um, abnormalities occur. So again, calcium is a very important indicator and is intricately coupled to mechanics. So I will, uh, did it play? Or oh, again, I have to. So it's uh, stained with gegoret, uh, the calcium flashes. So you can see them. They are asynchronous and cell autonomous, as they call them. So they don't, they don't have a coordinated calcium wave like in the other tissue types I showed earlier, but you have them flashing in various cells. So, oh, it's, so this begs the question, how does calcium signaling couple to mechanics? Uh, I'm going to present joint work with uh, Philip Main and John Chapman in Oxford and the Squiridis lab. Uh, Neoftos Christodoulou was his PhD, now he's in Cambridge. And uh, they did the experiments that I'm going to refer to that relate also to the previous slide. Just to summarize what we have seen from the experiments, you have mechanics eliciting calcium. You have this mechanical stimulation, it leads to calcium elevation. We have seen this in three different cell types. Um, but there are many more cell types and it's very well documented. There also have been quite a few models about this. So it's a one way uh, mechanics affecting calcium. And then you have also the calcium elitis mechanics as that's a more recent understanding of what is going on. And this relates to the experiments I have just shown. The Wallingford one, 2001, and also the Scurridis one, 2015. There are not many models, actually just one to relate with that and it's in the, um, uh, just published last year. So we took the data from uh, the experiments of Skouridis and Christodoulou, and we said, mm, okay, so you have mechanics definitely affecting calcium, this is documented. You have proved in 2015 that calcium elicits mechanics, mechanical contractions. There must be some sort of interplay between the two, some kind of coupling that is a two-way one. So before going into that, uh, to show how we analyzed the data and uh, that we found the support of this claim, um, I want to show you the time evolution of calcium and the surface area. So this is, this is a calcium and that's the surface area of a single cell, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's uh, faster oscillations of calcium. Um, I just keep missing my pointer. So this is a faster calcium oscillation, which correlates with the surface area pulsation. So this line is? This line is calcium, okay. uh, oscillation amplitude for calcium, and uh, then you have this surface area. So normalized surface area. So, um, where is the uh, evidence of two-way coupling here? You have, uh, as time goes by, uh, 10 cells uh, behavior was averaged, and you can also see the error bars here. So this is the average and the error bars. And then, basically, you have that as the surface area is decreasing, this is the phenomenon of apical constriction, you have the calcium oscillation frequency increasing. 
And also, uh, we were thinking, okay, let's stick to frequency, but no, we also need to look at amplitude. So we went to um, the next picture, and we said, okay, let's also analyze amplitude. And basically, exactly the same time frame I showed before, you can also show that amplitude is increasing. So basically, as the surface area is going down, due to apical constriction, you have both amplitude and frequency increase in your calcium oscillations. So overall, more calcium release, more and more calcium release. So there is something going on between the two. And what is a good model, a canonical model, let's say, the simplest one we can create that can explore this two-way interaction between calcium and mechanics. There has been modeling efforts before, um, actually from some very famous people, uh, Murray and Oster and uh, Tranquilo and many uh, had created related models, mechanochemical models, in which, however, they uh, used a bistable calcium release. So many people in this room are uh, expressing calcium much more than me, uh, surely, and they know that uh, now the understanding has moved in calcium after so many years, and you have the calcium-induced calcium, -induced calcium uh, release mechanism, and then there are many minimal uh, models of calcium that uh, capture this. There are also some more sophisticated ones, of course. And since there have been all these experimental and modeling advances in calcium signaling, we said, okay, well, it's about time that we update those old early mechanochemical models. So this is what we did. We updated the original mechanochemical models by the Murray, Oster, Murray and collaborators. Uh, the idea is simple enough. Uh, just to remind you, probably is very well known to many people in this room, so excuse uh, trivial information. So you have deterministic models and then uh, C is the cytosolic calcium. You have something coming in, something going out, out of the cytosol. Um, we examined various models, minimal calcium models, because uh, I, re I re uh, repeat, we want to see the simplest um, mechanochemical model of two-way interaction. And I list some of the models uh, here. And then we choose the ATRI model. It's looks old, but actually has been original, and it originally was for oscillations in Xenobus frog oocytes, but it was recently compared with seven other models, and agrees best with experiments, and you can find this analysis and the um, comparison of ATRI with many other minimal uh, calcium models in Estrada and Al um, here. And all models represent calcium-induced calcium release. So, why is it not moving? Hmm? Should move. Okay. Uh, what happened? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, so just to remind some people and introduce it to others, uh, the ATRI model uh, has calcium-induced calcium, calcium uh, release flux from the ER. You also have the pumps onto the ER that take calcium out of the cytosol. Uh, you have the percentage of inactivated IP3, uh, non-inactivated uh, IP3 receptors on the ER that are uh, summarized with this percentage uh, variable H. And then uh, here you have one important thing is that we take the IP3 as a non-dynamic variable, as a parameter in the system. So uh, going on from there, uh, just to make a note that we're going to track mu, which is a function of P, it's a saturating function of the IP3, and it's going to be our bifurcation parameter. Uh, this is explaining more about the models. There are quite a few parameters. In fact, we non-dimensionalize, so we could condense to fewer parameters through the non-dimensionalization. Um, very quickly, it leads to uh, limit cycles. It's a nonlinear model, so that's very simple oscillations, just to remind people what we're talking about. And that's for mu uh, equals uh, 0 0.3. 
And then the uh, bifurcation diagram uh, of this model, basically it's qualitatively similar to the other minimal calcium models in that you have no oscillations for low IP3 levels. There is a window of IP3 levels that sustains limit cycles. You have hot bifurcation here, hot bifurcation here, and then again you end up in a higher calcium state and you lose the oscillations. And we base that, uh, we expand on that, so we use this extra equation here, I'm going to show in a minute how we derive this, that has to do with the dilatation of the cell. So that's a new element on the R3, but also from the point of view of the early mechanochemical models, we replace them by stable calcium release with the R3 model. Yes? Where IP3 is secreted? Yeah, I'm sorry, where, where IP3 is coming from here in terms of um, the connection to uh, the biology? Well, it is this, um, um, basically when you have stimuli on the cell, then you get IP3, IP3 goes and binds to the ER together with calcium and then you get calcium out. So it's a product of the encoding of calcium in the, yeah. um, oh sorry, of the mechanical stimuli. What is the genesis? The what generate IP3 in your model? It's coming from which receptor? I mean, uh, you have a specific pathway or it's just no, in general? No, we don't have. We just say IP3 is there somehow. Uh, we know that that's the path I mentioned that you have the stimuli and then you get IP3 out of that, but we don't examine any pathways. It's very simple in that respect. And also uh, there has been a lot of discussion whether we should take IP3 as a dynamic variable, but we don't have experimental data on that, so we don't want to overcomplicate our model without reason, let's say. But it, it could be a good um, further step to examine more IP3 pathways of IP3. And, and thank you for the comment. Um, Okay, so uh, just uh, uh, coming to the structure of the mechanochemical model, you have this new variable uh, theta, which is a tissue dilatation, and then you have also this function uh, capital T of C, which is a calcium-induced contraction stress. You have bifurcation parameters, two of them, actually I shouldn't put this bullet here, um, but you have mu and lambda, that is the IP3 level, and then you have a new a bifurcation parameter, which is the strength of stretch activation appearing here. Because up this is, is the artery part, but then there is an extra thing, which is the stretch, stretch activation flux. So you can see here the two-way mechanical, uh, mechanochemical interaction. Basically, you have this variable C, and it's affecting theta, the mechanics, through this term, but then in this calcium equation, you also have theta affecting calcium. So you have a feedback loop on C and theta. So that's a two-way um, uh, mechanochemical uh, coupling. So how did we get that equation? Did we just imagine it? No, you can start consistently from the force balance equation for a linear viscoelastic material. Again, there is a lot of discussion, how do you model embryonic tissue? Why can't it be a linear viscoelastic material? There are so many big movements there. But you can show that uh, under some assumptions, and it was shown in recent experiments, again, in the Davidson lab that in, in Pittsburgh, that this is a reasonable assumption. So we proceed with the uh, force balance equation. We have viscous stress, elastic stress, that's a viscoelastic part. And we have also an active contraction stress that depends on calcium. So in one dimension, we want to see the simplest uh, manifestation of this two-way coupling. And integrating, we're going to get blah, blah, and then get down to this OD. And then here, you have the bulk and shear viscosity of the embryonic uh, tissue. You have a relaxation constant for the dilatation. But then uh, discussions with uh, Davidson Lab and uh, other people we just found many different parameters, and then we uh, ended up taking k uh, kappa theta uh, equal to 1. It's a bit less than that, but again, because the parameter values are not fixed, and also the R3 model parameters 
are not, uh, again, they are not all accurate, so you don't want to do too much precision here and have uh, so much uncertainty in the other one. So we stick to the simplest again, and um, then we have to decide what kind of contraction stress functional form we're going to use, and for this we need, uh, again, biological understanding of what is going on. So basically we know that this function, whatever we choose it to be, um, when calcium is zero, I shouldn't have any contraction stress because no calcium, no contraction. Then we also know that for high enough level of calcium, the cytosol responds saturates. And this is because I was discussing this with biologists. I'm an applied mathematician. I said I was really struggling with that. This is the correct function that we should use. And then the, uh, the final uh, explanation we uh, uh, came up with is that because there is a, a chain here, right? You have the calcium, the calcium talks to proteins that are calcium dependent, they sense the calcium, and these proteins somehow, they talk to the actomyosin network in the cytosol, and this elicits the contraction. So, however, this intermediary calcium sensing proteins will saturate. So, this saturation effect, we say, is going to also lead to a saturation of the contraction um, that is happening due to calcium. So, we're bundling this intermediate step. We don't see anything about proteins here, but we use that saturation effect of the proteins to say that this contraction stress should saturate. And there are other um, thoughts that it should come up and then go down, but I'm not going to look into that now. And as I mentioned here, many people yesterday, I was very happy to hear things about calmodulin because it's something that eventually I think needs to be thought about further in this context. And also myosin 2, they sense calcium and enable contractions. And the other um, small contribution we have done is that we have uh, created a new um, way of interpreting that stretch activation flux in the early mechanochemical models, that lambda theta. It was just a linear uh, dependence on the dilatation, which basically tells you that if I have more dilatation, more shrinking, dilatation is the expansion, but if you have more shrinking with the opposite of dilatation, then you get more calcium. So can I interpret that? through the, what creates this. So I guess this goes back to Dr. Holkman's uh, comment about, it relates to that, what, are the, what is the pathway? Um, what are these uh, ingredients that will enable this flux to appear? So our hypothesis is that there are stretch-sensitive calcium channels on the membrane, so we look at deeper into a smaller scale, and say that these uh, stretch sensitive calcium channels open and close with a certain rate. So we put down in the deterministic equation that we didn't think that, it was in a recent paper on retinal epithelial cells. But then we proceed further and we assume that um, the calcium transients uh, operate in a faster time scale compared to the opening and closing of the channels. Um, we linearize for small theta. This is consistent with the linear viscoelastic framework. Theta is small. And eventually, you can get a crude uh, interpretation of the macroscopic uh, cytosolic calcium uh, stretch activation flux as a combination of the maximum calcium uh, flux through a stretch sensitive channel, uh, opening. Uh, constant of the channel and the closing constant of the channel. I'm pretty sure our approximations are quite crude and this could be improved, but I think it leads into uh, a linking of the scales that this macroscopic term that was put there, somehow you can derive it from a much more newly um, understood knowledge on what is happening on the cell membrane. So these stretch-sensitive channels are not well documented, there is not much information on it, but they should play a role because obviously the cell is sensing mechanical stimuli and it's doing that in some way. So uh, the reason we, one of the reasons we chose the ATRI model is because actually you can do a lot of things analytically. 
So I'm not going to bother with explaining how we get these parametric expressions, but the crux here is that you can get the Hopf curve and you can study your um, oscillations basically analytically. Coming back to the fact that the Atri model is very qualitatively similar to other minimal calcium models, so we can extract these insights to many other mechanochemical models. This was the uh, aim we had. Uh, so basically we plot this and we find for the particular case that we choose this hill function of order one, that eventually, starting from no stress activation in the Atri model, they have this window of oscillations here, and this window keeps decreasing. Eventually, when lambda is large enough, which measures the coupling between calcium and mechanics. Can you remind us what lambda is? Yes, so lambda is, um, oop, what have I done? Thank you. Better go with my. So lambda is there. So it's just it's that parameter that links the theta to the c and makes the the coupling. So going back. So as lambda is increasing, you have vanishing of oscillations, and this is very important actually because this is what they observe in the experiments. In the uh, experiments in 2015, they show that loss of oscillations correlate with a high calcium state, and this is very important because it it is the state that leads to calcium uh, to embryo abnormalities. So the vanishing oscillations is a very important thing we need to track. This is what we got out of this work in connection to the experimenters that say, okay. Okay, your model is showing uh, oscillations vanishing. This is good because this is what we see. Of course, it's not data fitting, right? It's just qualitative comparison. And I remind you again of the bifurcation diagram because then I'm going to evolve with it with the other um, uh, bifurcation parameter lambda. So as I go up, just to show you, you'll get the, amplitude, the maximum amplitude uh, minus the minimum amplitude decreases. So you have this loop shrinking. And eventually, when lambda is 1.5, close to where the oscillations vanish, then it becomes smaller and smaller and eventually will vanish. Yes? It appears that you go from subcritical to supercritical. That's true. Yes. Okay. What's spotted? So I thought not to. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so it appears you're going from uh, subcritical to supercritical hop? Yes, very well um, spotted. <laughs> Can, uh, do you have an explanation for that? No. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, we know that, but I shouldn't be so abrupt. Uh, I don't think it really matters in terms of the actual biological problem. So as mathematicians, uh, actually there was also a lot of uh, analysis of the bifurcation structure we did, but for the biology, I'm pretty sure that all these uh, minor windows of things changing from subcritical to supercritical probably is not important. Do you think it's, it's, it's important? It could be important. Because this is interesting. Well, it, it just means if you came up from the upper branch, your oscillation amplitude obviously wouldn't change uh, smoothly. Mm -hmm. You would go from no oscillations to high oscillations. So it, it is important. So it, uh, okay. th yeah. That's just a, a speculation whether that could be important or not. But Right, OK. But we should look more into it then. Mm -hmm. To see what is the biological significance of that. Um, of the, uh, since we are anyway in a, a discussion round, so uh, do you know how they c or what is the way to change lambda in experiments? How do they modify lambda? Um, well, you need to play with the contractility of the. I don't know. It's going to change uh, the function t though, the contractility parameter, um, contractility of the cytosol. So lambda in itself, I'm not so sure. But this is actually, this is exactly the next step. You need to get more and systematically uh, manage to study calcium together with the mechanics. So identifying what lambda is in the experiments is important. Do you have an idea? Okay, <laughs> maybe later we discuss. Okay, so 
Um, the ATRI model, you also have the frequency increasing with the IP3 level. Then the mechanochemical model, where you have lambda and mu, you will find that the frequency increases as mu and lambda increase, which ties up with the analysis of the experimental data we did in the beginning of the set of slides. And then, sorry, if you fix IP3, um, then you find that this loop increases as you go uh, from new, from a low to a high IP3 value. Um, and again, this is consistent with the experimental analysis we had about the amplitude increasing um, in the experiments. And then the other thing we wanted to look at uh, precisely because this uh, Hill function is just a hypothesis, right? You want to study it for various different cases. So one thing that we did, we changed alpha, which we call the mechanical responsiveness factor of the cytosol, because one over alpha is just the length scale of ascent. If you, ha if you are here, the smaller alpha, I alpha is, the faster, because it's not, it's not time, it's calcium, the quicker you're gonna get um, to your saturating value. So it it's reflects to how the cytosol responds. It's just another way to quantify the response of the cytosol to calcium. And we find, again, the same qualitative behavior, oscillations vanishing. Um, then we change the Hill coefficient. Again, the behavior persists. So there is something good about the Hill function. It, it shows a robust behavior, uh, so that's interesting. And we looked the model asymptotically, so I have not a lot of time. Um, basically, uh, in the ATRI model, you know the calcium is a fast messenger compared to the um, dynamics of the IP3 receptors. So we did that analysis, and actually, even though it's qualitatively similar to many minimal calcium models, mathematically, you have instead of the Van der Poel oscillation, where you have two slow phases, here you have just one. So you have more spiky oscillations in the ATRI model. So it's, this goes towards understanding more our system um, analytically, just to have a better understanding of what we have in front of us. And then we extended this in the asymptotics of the mechanochemical model. Here you need to do an assumption. Uh, what is the time scale of calcium compared to the tissue cell mechanics. You need to do that assumption. So what we as assumed, and we are motivated by this picture, is that, uh, that the calcium transients are more rapidly evolving than the area changes. So inspired by that, going back, we just take uh, the calcium to be a fast messenger again, but the other two parameters, uh, variables theta and H, to be uh, on a slower time scale. So um, we ended up with uh, studying slow manifold and fault curve, and there is a new uh, asymptotic um, region called the transition layer that matches with the spikiness of the oscillations, and. I'm not going to go further into that. It's just to show that uh, the system can also lead to a lot of analytics. And we are working into getting uh, also the asymptotics into a, another publication now. And just to also talk about briefly about other things uh, we're looking at and remind people that calcium is a complicated stochastic multiscale phenomenon. I haven't talked anything about stochastics uh, before. I'm going to talk a bit now. So you have IP3 receptors, cluster of receptors going to the whole cell. Recall that those uh, non-autonomous and synchronous, uh, sorry, cell autonomous asynchronous uh, transients in the experiments of Scurridis were stochastic, actually. Well, you had these random flashes. So you need some stochastics there. Um, so this, you can see the flashing on the red, these red things. 
These are all calcium flashes, the red flashes. <coughs> so how does the increasing stochasticity affect the efficiency of calcium oscillations? So this is work uh, with Rudiger. I'm not going to say much, but um, it's interesting to see how you go to the decoding of calcium because you know that eventually these calcium sensing proteins will talk to the ectomycin network. But you also have other calcium sensing proteins that do other things in the cell. So it's a general problem how calcium is decoded in the cell. And we modified the Lirizel model to put uh, stochastics in there. Uh, we used the hyperin Gillespie algorithm. Um, and we find significant variability, which we, I repeat, is closer to the experiments. We couple then this to the stochastic Lirizel model to a decoding model for protein, which is a single OMD. It's a simple one again. And you cannot tell much from this picture, right? So what do you do to get some analytical insights again? So what we did is we said, OK, we're going to look at on and off uh, calcium signals and see how they tra are translated in protein response. And the way to do that uh, links a bit to the signal processing uh, literature in the sense that we want to look at the duty ratio, which is how much of the time the signal is on versus how much time is off. This is about two thirds to one third. Um, you want to also have a comparison, the ratio of the two time scales of the calcium and the protein. And you also have an effective activation rate. And basically, the deterministic such uh, work was done in the Salazar uh, and Al paper in 2008, 10 years ago. But then there was a validation of the mean protein value in uh, recent experiments, 2016. And then you can also see in other uh, quite famous experiments that these on and off calcium pulses are what people use in the experiments. So yes, they are good for analytics, but also they are used in experiments. And then what we want to do, we want to randomize that setup. So we want to randomize the nutrition, we want to randomize the amplitude, and see what happens to the protein response. Does it become better? Does it become worse? Usually when we talk a thing about noise, we think that it's degrading things, right? But this is not a given. In, there are cases, for example, in stochastic resonance that noise cont uh, is a positive um, phenomenon. It enhances things. So just uh, the last plot I'm going to show is that, for example, if you take the width of the pulse drawn from Gaussian distribution. And also, we also examine other uh, gamma distribution, exponential distribution. You can find that in some cases, stochasticity can enhance, but it usually degrades the efficiency of calcium. So this is deterministic, and this is the stochastic. Here you see um, that the noise degrades the protein response from this random input of calcium. So the summary. Uh, we uh, have done a new analysis of uh, experiments in the Scurridis lab, and we showed that this supports two-way feedback between calcium signaling and mechanics. Then we propose a new mechanochemical model, which is an update of the early mechanochemical models with uh, modern calcium dynamics and their understanding. We decided to model the contraction stress as a hill function, and we did very different uh, explorations of that hill function and reinterpreted the stretch activation flux as contribution from the stretch sensitive calcium channels. Um, we managed to do this bifurcation analysis semi analytically, and we showed that oscillations are eventually suppressed, which leads to embryo abnormalities in the lab. And then um, we done asymptotic analysis of the system, and then I finished with the stochastic modeling of randomizing well-established deterministic uh, models and showing protein response. So where do we go from here? 
we want to extend the canonchemical model in more dimensions. As uh, if you remember, it was assumed to be in one dimension. This is not realistic because the experiment I showed you is a 2D uh, view. What? Okay, and then uh, we want to incorporate eventually stochastic effects. We want to be sure about the parameter values of the mechanics. What is the contractility? What, are, what is the viscosity? What is the Young's modulus, the Bunsen's ratio? All these uh, things that we already studied, but we want to be more accurate. Probably new experiments are going to be needed. Um, and then we want to go into the comment of new experiments. We want systematic experiments to show loss of oscillations under various mechanical stimuli and cytosolic uh, states. As Alex asked me earlier, what do you do with lambda? This is where uh, the investigation for lambda should go. How do you relink the ingredients of your model to what is going to happen in the lab to examine things further? So, thank you. Um. Okay. We have time for questions. Any questions? You want to start? Uh, yes, yeah, so this, uh, this may not be so relevant, but there's a long history of modeling muscle contractions. So mm. that's a one way interaction of calcium causing yes. contraction mm -hmm. and which also involves actomyosin proteins um, but it also has other specific features like cross bridges which I don't know if it exists in these more mm. rudimentary systems so uh, can you make any comment on yes, the relationship um, to your modeling? Yes, um, basically uh, muscle cells are excitable cells so basically, we're, we're doing all about non-excitable cells, all these contractions that you see in these epithelial cells. So there is uh, definitely a connection, um, because also there you have, uh, remember which protein is that it again affects the actomyosin uh, fibers, and then you get the contraction. So definitely that path is there. But um, we are differentiating somehow ourselves due to the fact that the, the cells are non-excitable. And in the muscle, everything is much more um, structured and coordinated, for example. And here, if you see the picture, it's different. You have these asynchronous uh, things. And so it, it doesn't manifest in the same way, these contractions of non-excitable cells with the muscle contraction. But I do agree at the same time that there's definitely a link and probably a mathematical link. We haven't went and gone to find uh, such models. Do you know then of models that do this two-way? Um, do you have I can't some? think of any two-way models yeah. offhand. But I guess there's also more uh, geometric organization or structural organization. Mm -hmm. You have fibers that run in a particular direction where it looked like your contractions were more non-specific. Here. Hard to say, see from just the pictures. You're saying that here it's yes. more specific. Yes, so there is this big, I think it's big difference, but and this is why we said, okay, let's start from this simple model that was created for such uh, situations before and put the, ca the modern calcium dynamics there. At the same time, in muscle contraction, I don't know what kind of calcium models do they use there. Do they use similar kind of stuff? Well, like I think of, cardiac models where they have a combination of calcium entry through plasma membrane channels which yes. is that's mostly just a trigger for calcium release from the SR mm -hmm. so there could be some similarities but, but I don't think there mm. I don't know if there are autonomous oscillations I don't you know, think there are the autonomous heart, yes if it's mm -hmm. not yeah. triggered by electrical activity and it's electrical there yes so it's, um, yes, so this is chemical. There is no electricity, no voltage uh, effect here. Um, we have to look into that further because we put a paragraph in the paper that, okay, we have to be, uh, we differentiate this because it's for unexcitable cells, but obviously this machinery, the cells have to link calcium to mechanics cannot be just totally novel in the non-excitable cells. So there is definitely a connection. Thank you. 
uh, coming back to my question about the lambda value, so yes. Um, so what I would do naively would mm -hmm. that I would probably play around with uh, the actin linkers. So because there are there drugs that kind of weaken uh, the actin linkers, so they, that they are blocking, and then that that your actin uh, network would be not as stiff, and then could be a way to modify your con uh, contractability of the cells. Mm. Or do you have a good reason to say that this is stupid? No, no, I think it's correct. Uh, what it, should, it should definitely uh, affect the, um, the contractility in this way, but I'm wondering in terms of the structure of the model, are you changing lambda then or are you changing the heal function characteristics? Because there are two things that link to mechanics in the model. So this is what I'm not clear about. That I think when we are uh, saying, okay, I'm gonna uh, play with the contractility of the tissue, I think I'm changing my heal function, which is the yeah. response of the actomasin network to calcium. The contraction. Yeah, response. Oh, I see your point. Yes. So it. Don't don't talk. Don't talk yet. <laughs> uh, the actin, the actin in the uh, fibers in the cells, they can they can release calcium as well. So uh -huh. it might be your lambda. It's in your calcium equation and it's a source. Right. Okay. Uh, you can check this out. I also uh -huh. want to add to Artis' comment. There are models. James Need has done models of smooth muscle cells, where I think they have mm. IP3 calcium dependent dynamics coupled to the mechanics yes. in there. I uh, discussed a few this years with ago. Uh, James Neat, the yeah, IPC so independence. He's, he's done a lot of work on this. Yes. Um, um, the, and in, I, as far as I recall, in non excitable cells as well, not just excitable like the cardio. So he cell. did it in airway epithelial cells, yes. and uh, basically they found there a specific experimental evidence that um, the IP3 plays a dynamic role. So they had to put it there, but in these embryonic epithelial cells, we don't have such evidence. They so have more. They have more recent papers where they change their mind. So just just look him up. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I, I discussed with him actually yeah, uh, uh, yes. over email. I uh, not yeah. in person, but uh, yeah, it was a huge issue because he revised the paper the first time and he kept saying about the IP3. And um, the thing is, it, you need to make a balance between whether you put it in or you leave it out because then you increase your complexity of the system. And you're not sure that it's helping you to understand things better. Yeah, I know so very well. It's I a dilemma. To, yeah, in my PhD, I did this stuff, so I know very well. Ah, okay, then, yes. so I'll discuss yeah. with you uh, more then. One yes. more comment related yes. to the, your supercritical and subcritical yes. bifurcation. If you want to, to look at it also from experimental point of view, mm -hmm. you have a small region of bi-stability. It is small indeed, but your system according to your theoretical it's analysis by stability window yes. yeah so yes. you could perturb if you can uh -huh. and end up with oscillations or uh, a steady kind of state behavior like a constant uh, so the suggestion is to perturb so that uh, the initial conditions the initial conditions so that what what we play we change though, from with oscillations the critical to, to but the, what about the supercritical? Super well, critical? in the regime where you have supercritical, you have a bi-stability. That's oh, why yes. it might be yes. important. So then That's uh, all I'm saying. Yeah. Change initial or conditions may not to be study important. that yes. Yes. in more yeah. detail. Yeah. But do we have any uh, understanding of how then biologically would help us to understand this? I don't know. <laughs> it might be important for the why the cell sometimes changes. Well, I'm just speculating. But yes, you had yes. these observations where mm -hmm. sometimes you have mechanical response without oscillations or you have... Um, oscillations and then you have a coupling with the yes. mechanical response. Yes. So it might be important. I, I really okay. don't know. It's just yeah. A, yeah. So yeah, we'll explore different initial conditions to mm -hmm. see the transition. That's the classical way to, yes. yeah, to check Thanks. this. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if I understand then you don't need necessarily IP suite to generate uh, those no. oscillations. You don't. And actually yes. So many years ago with AD, we looked at uh, contraction, calcium-induced contraction actually in dendritic spines, where you can have actually, you know, this myosin uh, activation by calcium. Mm -hmm. And here actually, there is a specific goal of the contraction, is to bring the calcium or, the, or materials from the spine to the dendrite. Mm -hmm. So here I haven't understood clearly I mean, can you explain what is, I understand that calcium can induce this contraction. Yes. What the contraction 
is exactly doing. He does something for calcium, he does something for something else. It's a very nice choreography, like apical constriction on conversion extension as the embryo is growing. Then you have all this uh, rearrangement of tissues in very specific ways. So contractions are part of that choreography. And so so, but for the cell itself, it does something specific in terms of it has to reorganize something in the cell. Why? When you, I mean, it's just a byproduct that that because you have myosin, because you have all this element, then it will contract because simply calcium is there. Yes. But it has a specific function inside each cell. What has a specific function inside? I don't know. Like for example, I give you the example before. If for a yes, spine, so when it contracts, mm -hmm. it pushes the materials from the spine head to the dendrite. Here there's a function, there's something specific. Right, so Do you have something specific here? That yes, yeah, so the apical constriction is relates back to this choreography, but I will be more specific. So you have an apical constriction, this ratchet-like decrease of the surface area. So every time you have the calcium, then you have a decrease in the surface area that eventually will allow the neural tube to close. So you need this reduction in the surface area that, and you need calcium to make that happen. Is that specific? And, and so then it means that this is a collective effect. So, so when it happens somewhere, then uh, all the cells, as you've shown in the movies, mm. uh, uh, behave I mean, in a similar manner. So does mm. that mean mm. that if you study this calcium uh, uh, dynamics, we should look at the same time at the entire network or the coupling of the network, yes. not just a single cell, to yes. look at this, how this calcium and the contraction can affect Definitely. actually all the cells. Um, yes, and uh, that's why I said in the uh, future uh, work that we need to look in more dimensions. What I meant is that we need to look at the tissue because you have these embryonic epithelial cells that are closely um, adjacent with, and they have gap junctions as well co um, communicating with the neighbors. And so there is a network effect. At the same time, uh, you also have this asynchronous uh, nature of things here. So yes, there is definitely a network collective uh, motion that should happen uh, to lead to the embryo, uh, the neural tube closure. But at the same time, it's uh, instructive enough to look at the single cell where you say, ha, huh, the um, effect of the neighbors is actually felt through the stress-sensitive calcium channels. In which way? Because you have a single cell, and when it's shrinking due to calcium, then these stress-sensitive uh, channels on the membrane, are f uh, the, it's being pulled by the neighbors, sorry, due to the network effect, it's part of this uh, tissue. And then there is a mechanical stimuli that is being felt. So this mechanical stimuli that is being felt is, is, has to do with the fact that it has neighbors around. It's not just a single cell in the lab. I'm not studying a single cell. It's a single cell that fills the neighbors, basically. Okay, and, and the last question is when in the experiment people look at calcium, mm -hmm. calcium is increasing or when you have oscillation, it's uniform in the entire cells? So that you can you can model the cell as a single point, um, or there is more well, there is sub compartment, cascade, right? Uh, you have this cascade, and um, maybe Alex has done a lot of work and Rudiger on like that. You have uh, micron domains releasing calcium, then this is organized on a cluster of receptors into these uh, puffs, and then you have a uh, whole cell. Oscillations. So, just to say that I'm modeling myself with a point, in many cases, not accurate because all this cascade of stochastic events has to be respected and modeled to uh, give, depending on the. So, so there are nano compartments. There are compartments of calcium where actually calcium is not invade the entire cells, but just they localized. Yes, there are localized calcium releases, and then these are. Um, coordinate. Sometimes they don't lead to whole cell oscillations, sometimes they do. And then it depends what is being measured and what is being uh, of interest. So in our case, yes, uh, in the mechanochemical model, we, use at, uh, we look at whole cell oscillations. But it's not accurate in other cases. Okay. Let's thank Katharina again.
Okay. All right, so we have a second talk, um, Rudiger Tool from University of Nottingham, and he will talk about some uh, special temporal calcium signaling models. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you very much for the kind invitation to speak. What I would like to do today is to present our work on stim aura microdomains. In particular, I want to walk you through the modeling development process and highlight some of the mathematical details that we actually stumbled upon. And afterwards, I'm going to show you how we actually applied the model. Now, the first question is, what actually is a stim aura microdomain? And here, we need to go back and actually look at what is arguably the most versatile calcium signal. And just to bring everybody onto the same page, so when we look at calcium oscillations. In a lot of cell types, especially non-excitable cells, they're triggered by an agonist binding to a cell surface receptor and then following a cascade, IP3 is formed, it binds to the IP3 receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum. Then calcium is released from the ER and later on calcium is resequestered to the ER by circa pumps. Now this continuous cycle of calcium release and calcium resequestration is thought to underlie calcium oscillations. And a nice example is shown here where they have used a compound called LCT4 for mast cells and we can clearly observe these transient increases and falls of the intracellular calcium concentration. And at that stage everything was fine until somebody did the same experiment in zero extracellular calcium concentration. And what they observed originally, and this is a much later experiment, is that those calcium oscillations actually run down. So after a few peaks they are gone. And after the original experiment, what happened was a flurry of experiments to figure out what actually happens in the case that you have zero extracellular calcium. Now, it's not just a passive influx over the plasma membrane that would actually solve this problem. It is much more intricate, much more involved. It was not until like 12 years ago that the molecular components of this influx pathway were discovered, and they go by the name of STIM and ORI. So ORI is a molecule that sits in the plasma membrane, here shown in green, and STIM is a molecular sensor that sits in the ER membrane, here shown in blue. And when your cell is happy at rest, the calcium concentration in the ER is full, and both ORI and STIM are essentially diffusively distributed. And that's what you can see hopefully here in these two panels, where in red you have STIM, in green you have ORI, and it's all smeared out, so there's no spatial structure to it. But as soon as the ER is depleted below a critical level, which happens during calcium oscillations, STIM starts to migrate to so-called ERPM junctions. And these are parts of the cell where the ER membrane is very close to the membrane, or to the plasma membrane. And what then happens is that ORI also starts diffusing, and at some point STIM holds onto ORI, they actually form a physical connection, and calcium flows from the extracellular space through the ORI channel into the um, cytosol. And this is also shown in here. So this is the state when your ER was depleted, and what you observe are these clusters, these puncta of STIM, and those puncta of ORI. And if you were to overlay these two images, you would get a nice orange image showing perfect co-localization. Now, when we zoom in what actually happens in one of these ERPM junctions, we see that so calcium flows in, and then there are circa pumps on the ER membrane that take calcium back from the cytosol into the ER. And actually, originally, people had suggested that there would be a direct physical link from the plasma membrane to the ER, some sort of tunneling, but that hypothesis was refuted, so now we know refilling of the ER is a two-step process. You need to get the calcium in through the ORI channels, and then the circa pumps take the calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, at that point, you might wonder, why should anybody care about the ORI signaling? The reason is that if it's disrupted, you get issues with immunodeficiency. You have issues with uh, the heartbeat. You can even get issues in motor neurons. So there is a whole lot of cellular um, processes that get disrupted if STUM on ORI is not working. And I would like to show you another example here. So this is again a similar experiment that you, I showed to you earlier. A mast cell is stimulated with two with LTC4 
in the presence of two millimolar extracellular calcium. And then we observed these nice regular calcium oscillations. But what they did in that particular experiment is they looked at gene expression. In particular, they looked at the levels of NFAT. And what they found was a significant level of NFAT activation here shown in gray. Now, when you do the same experiment in zero extracellular calcium, so the, the stim ori pathway is essentially knocked out, what they saw is essentially a much reduced level of NFAT activation. But then the really crucial experiment was that they did the same experiment, so zero extracellular calcium, but blocking the PMCA, so the pump that extrudes calcium out of the cell. They observed calcium oscillations that statistically looked exactly like the ones in two millimolar extracellular calcium. You couldn't distinguish them. However, at the level of gene expression, what they saw was essentially a much reduced level that is more comparable to when you have no extracellular calcium than when you actually have the two millimolar outside. And this is what really intrigued me. So something is happening in this ERPM junction that is crucial. It is not your global calcium signal that drives this NFAT activation. It is a local signal that then feeds down to a signal in cascade. And that's what I really would like to understand. Now, the question is, why are these actually called stim oral microdom? Ah, sorry, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Just to remind briefly, so what kind of cells has this been? T cells or no? Some I would need to look them up. It's it's not T cells. It's another cell line. Okay. Thanks. So in this experiment yeah. or this paper, did yeah. they speculate of what this might be that help that uh, rela relates to gene expression? I mean, like, what's the mechanism? Not, not really. All they said is that you, you have transcription factors that are activated. So they looked at them, they knocked them out, and showed that essentially... No, that's clear to me, but okay. I just don't know how this is happening. Well, what, what might be going on, though that's this local depletion near the plasma membrane, how this can link to the no, NFAT? No, no, that's actually that's still an open question. So nobody knows? No, as far as I, I'm aware of... Yes. All they can say is that something happens in that microdomain and that it is crucial, but how this really works down to where these effectors sit and how they actually then move from these microdomains uh, into the nucleus, this whole pathway. Yeah, because NFAT is activated by comodulin. Yeah. So something, th there is that, a link, that could but, be, yeah. but, but how? Yeah. Do you no, know? that is, um, that's what I found so interesting, nobody knows. So they speculate about the, the speed of PMCA, so how, how fast PMCA can sequester this calcium signal from the ori, because this would be my obvious uh, understanding that the PMCA is just catching up with the, I know, so is you, if, you, if you have a block of PMCA, then you get your modulation back, yeah? Yes. Okay. I, I mean, you, you get your calcium oscillations back, you don't get your gene expression back. Okay. So yes. then you don't uh, control the calcium as good as the PMCA can do? No, what happens is that when your PMCAs are blocked, you essentially don't lose the calcium across the plasma membrane, which means that your circuit pumps are sufficient to refill the ER, which means you can keep driving your mm. calcium oscillations, but you don't need to involve the um, stim ori pathway. So there is no calcium influx over that particular machinery, and the speculation is that the effector molecules reside in those ERPM junctions. And because those ERPM junctions are not involved when you block the PMCAs, that's why you don't get the gene expression. Yeah. Um, another question, more related to your first slide. Mm -hmm. Is it known how, uh, when you deplete the ER, I can understand there can be some signaling on the surface of the ER, but yeah. how is the signaling to the plasma membrane to cluster ori? Okay, yes. How does that happen? <laughs> so what happens is, let, let, let me go back. Okay, so in the depleted state, essentially stim sits diffusively as a monomer in the plasma membrane. And stim has what is called an EF hand. 
So that EF hand binds calcium. Now when the calcium concentration drops, that EF hand loses the calcium, it just unbinds. And as soon as that happens, stim molecules start to dimerize. And then those dimers start to diffuse towards these ERPM junctions. There's a really nice paper that shows that that happens subdiffusively. An open question still is, how, how do they know where these ERPM junctions are? Yeah, that, that was my that question. That is, what, what is the mechanism that actually drives them to that? That's open, nobody knows. Um, and then when they get to these ERPM junctions, they stick. And again, there are ideas that are proteins like a post partner of stim that sit there. There are speculations that there are already circa pumps in the ERPM junctions that hold on to the stim molecules. Once the stim molecules have arrived there, essentially ORI starts diffusing. And when it gets to these ORI stim accumulated stims, then stim grabs on to ORI and forms a conducting channel. And the other thing is that um, there's really physical context to so that stim molecule. Once it loses calcium, undergoes conformational changes. So you can almost think like it's a jackknife that has an arm that sits here, goes up like there, and then moves to the plasma ER membrane like this until it reaches the RPM junction, and then ORI right comes in it. So that, that's the underlying physiology, how that happens. And uh, has anybody done super resolution single particle trajectories yeah. on this to uh, look at uh, the distribution, the interaction? So what they have, well, there are various experiments. One is uh, single particle tracking. So that's where they got the diffusion coefficient for stim and ORI, and they saw that free stim and free ORI diffuse subdiffusively. But as soon as they get to the stim ORI, when they accumulate, the diffusion coefficient drops massively. And so that's one indication that they actually form a complex, that they are stationary. So that's done. There is a lot of molecular biology in the sense of understanding how stim works at the gating level, like which are the important residues, which you can phosphorylate, which you can knock out. Because the stim molecule the, consists of different domains, and one is this ORI binding domain. And a lot of experiments just express that ORI binding domain, because that's enough to essentially induce the influx. And for instance, there's a really nice study where you knock out your EF hand, and you only take your stim or a binding domain, and then you get constitutive calcium influx, because as soon as that hand binds, that's enough. Okay, okay so, um, now why are these actually called microdomains? And the reason is you just look at their size. They are roughly 200 to 300 nanometers wide, but they're only 15 nanometers high. And that's from some structural um, experiments. You can do electrographs and get this out. And so to date, there is no imaging technology that can actually resolve the calcium dynamics in such small volumes at the resolution that we would need. And so for a modeler, that's ideal because that's how we can gain insight by trying to model the calcium concentration in these small volumes. And so what we want to answer in particular are these three questions. The first one is, does the positioning of all right channels and circa pumps is important for ER refilling? We already saw that there is some sort of spatial distribution within the ER membrane, but what is the effect of that? The second one is we know that cells express different levels and different isoforms of circa pumps. There's circa 2A and circa 2B. What is actually the impact of that? And finally, there's a nice recent study that came out that looked at cross-linking of all right channels. And the question again is, does this help with ER refilling or is there something else going on? Now, to answer these questions, we wanted to model as close to what we think the biological reality is. So we set up a three-dimensional model for these ERPM junctions. And the full model consists of four domains. There is the central domain, which at the top has the ERPM junction. Then this bit beneath it is the ER that essentially sticks out. And I should say this is not drawn to scale, just to illustrate the domains. And then around this, we have the cytosolic bulk and we have the ER bulk. Now the reason why we want to eventually model this is to understand how the microdomain interacts with the ER per se, like this, but also what is the impact of calcium spilling out of the ERPM junction and interacting with the bulk. 
What you already see here from a modeler's perspective is that you have different boundary conditions, and I will come back to this. You have physical boundary conditions here shown in solid, which are the physical membranes, okay? But you also have something that are non-physical boundary conditions like here, where you just have to match one part of the cytosol to another part of the cytosol. And here, mathematically, you just need to ensure there's continuity of flux and continuity of concentration. Now, to begin with, we only focus on the central bit, so the ERPM junction and the sub-PMAR. And throughout my talk, I will stick to this color scheme. When you see purple, that means all right channels. When you see green, then that means circa pumps. As you can guess at this point, an important ingredient are actually the fluxes through the aurite channels and the fluxes of the circuit pumps. Now, for the fluxes, we just take the single channel current for the aurite channel and then convert it to a flux with your usual scaling. So you have the um, Avogadro constant and you have the um, uh, valence. And also, we're going to normalize everything with respect to the surface area of a single channel. Again, there are estimates for that. So we get um, unit fluxes. The other one is that oh yeah, I should mention that the flux through a single or through a single or right channel is only 2.1 femtoamps. Now to put that into perspective, your classical L-type uh, gated calcium channel carries roughly a thousand times more calcium ions than these or right channels. And so if that was something again interesting. How does the refilling work? if essentially your input is more like a trickle than a torrent going through that channel. Since we are interested in the interplay between the cytosol and the ER, we used a bidirectional circuit pump. And just to show you what the model looks like, so we have a dependence on the junctional calcium concentration, here shown as CJ in blue, and the luminal calcium concentration shown in green. And what this model can do under certain conditions, it can reverse the flux. So you usually the circuit pump takes calcium from the cytosol into the ER, but potentially, and there's experimental evidence for this, that you can reverse it. And so we wanted to be as flexible as possible, so we put in this expression for the circuit pumps. Now that is the geometry of the model and all the major fluxes. So now we need to put in some dynamics. So we assume that in the junctional domain we have pure diffusion only and we're going to have non-trivial boundary conditions. So at the top we have our circa, sorry, we have our ori channels that carry the calcium in. At the bottom we're going to implement the circuit pumps over here, which are these non-physical boundary conditions, we just clamp this to the base level concentration of the cytosol, so roughly 100 nanomolars, and the initial condition will also be 100 nanomolar. For full disclosure, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, we're going to smear out these fluxes through the aurite channels and through the circuit pumps with a spread function, and that will become important in a few slides. Now for the ERPM for the sub-PMER, we actually have boundary conditions. There's only flux coming in through the circuit pumps. At the bottom, we're going to clamp the calcium concentration to a depleted ER. And so there are speculations of how much that actually is. And we put it to roughly 150 micromolar, which is enough actually for the EF hand to let the calcium go. So that is one of the constraints that we know we can put into the model. Then because the mantle is the physical boundary of the ER. We're going to put no flux boundary conditions in here. And as an initial condition, we actually going to use the full depleted ER, which is again at 150 micromolar. Now, what you have seen is that the dynamics in the ERPM junction and the sub PMER is both linear, just a diffusion equation. And so we wanted to make explicit use of this for developing our numerical scheme. And when people think about linear diffusion equations, one thing that immediately comes to their mind are Green's functions. And so that's actually what we did. For a cylinder, you can work out the Green's function in closed form. And once you have the Green's functions, everything you ever wanted to know about those dynamical systems is known. All you need to do is crack these two integrals. And so the first integral essentially takes your initial condition. And here, x can be either the concentration in the sub-PMER or in the ERPM junction and propagates that forward, okay? So it's just a spatial integral over the Green's function. And the second bit just um, takes care of the 
boundary conditions. So you can see that when you have flux boundary conditions, you just need the Green's function. If you have boundary conditions with a prescribed value, so a directly boundary condition, you're going to work out the derivative of your Green's function. But that's essentially all you need. And at this point, you can take it and actually design a nice numerical scheme from that. So just assume I have my calcium concentration at time Tn, and I want to have it at time Tn plus 1. All I need to do is essentially treat the calcium concentration at Tn as some sort of initial condition and propagate that forward. And then I need to take care of the boundary conditions. And the point here is that these boundary conditions obviously can change over time, but within one time step, as you always assume, they're not going to change, but you can still propagate this fully forward. Now, when you have this description, there are certain advantages of it. The first one is you can pre-compute that Green's function, okay? Because in your simulation, you see that all you need to do is integration, but you don't need to compute this over and over again. Now, your Green's function computation can take a day, but that doesn't really matter. Because once it's computed, you just store it. And all you need to do is to call it and essentially do some clever matrix man manipulations. What you can also see is that you can explicitly integrate out time in here. So you can store the time integration of your Green's function. And the reason is that this function, so our boundary fluxes are assumed to be constant over a small delta t, which means all you pull them out of the time integral, so all you're left with is a time integral over the Green's function, and again, you can do this, which reduces computational load during the simulations. Because we know the Green's function analytically, we can work at very high spatial resolution. So we are not limited by how far we can go. The only limitation for your spatial discretization is essentially how much memory your machine has. And so if you want to resolve steep gradients, you can do this. There's absolutely no issue. So what you then realize is that the main contribution is this spatial integral and the spatial integration over the surfaces. But since that integration is spatially independent, I can actually divide my space up in different parts. I can parallelize that. And so if I really wanted to push for high efficiency computing, you can just parallelize this. Okay. Good. So because we're using Green's function, the first test that we did to convince ourselves that we didn't make a mistake is to exploit the fact that at t equals zero, your Green's function is essentially a delta function. Okay? How do you test that? You take a nice test function like a Gaussian, you convolve your Green's function with that test function, and you see whether everything overlays, and indeed it does. So here the red line is the initial Gaussian, the blue line is the convolution, and I just want to highlight that it all matches, okay? So that we are going down the right way, and this is essentially a cut to the z direction, the r, and the theta direction. So at that state, we were really happy. So it looks like we are heading down the right direction. But obviously, we are interested in fluxes. We want to get the flux through the circuit pump right, and we need to get the flux through the override channel right. And so here is just a snapshot of a simulation. So this is the circuit pump. And this cut here is essentially you take your 3D volume, you cut through the radial direction, through the circuit pump, and then you see this influx of calcium into the ER as you would expect. And then I ask Emma, who was the PhD student on the project, well, just tell me what the flux actually is, differentiate into the Z direction, and everything is going to be fine. And so she did that, and uh, she varied the grid into the Z direction to get better and better approximations. And what we found is that essentially that derivative vanished. Now that was a real disappointment because we thought that with the Green's function and what is called the magic formula, we would be heading down the right way, no issues. And so we were worried that we had made a really big mistake in computing the Green's function. So we went back to the drawing board and actually looked why this boundary condition doesn't seem to be satisfied. So. Um, just again look, so this is the sub PMER with our diffusion equation and this is essentially the solution that we have and we need to differentiate it with respect to Z. Which means the term that's really crucial is this one here. Now notice that this involves um, integral over the surface up here, so that is at height Z equals L2. And then we need a temporal integration and differentiate the whole expression. Okay. 
So unfortunately, now to really appreciate the next steps, we have to look at the Green's function. And it looks a bit involved, but I don't want to go into details, just for those of you who are familiar with it, this is your usual Bessel function, so that looks good. The part that I want to draw your attention to is this one here. Now, it turns out that your spatial integration is going to go through smoothly, no issues. And so the next part is you're going to integrate over time, which shows you that you're going to bring down this factor of mu m squared, so you essentially end up with that little expression here. Okay? And now you see exactly what happened is if you differentiate that with respect to z, that cos will turn into a sine. Then you're going to evaluate the sine actually at z equals L2, which means you have L2 minus L2, which is going to be zero, so you get the sine of zero. So every single term in that series actually vanishes. And that's what we saw. So at least our simulations were consistent with this expression. The trouble is you're not allowed to do that. And so that's what I want to highlight. Actually, when you differentiate this and you explicitly plug in what your mu m's are and you introduce a new variable x, so that essentially when z goes to L2, as you can see over here, x goes towards zero, you get a function that looks like that. It's highly discontinuous. So essentially what we are doing is taking a limit x towards zero around here and you can see that that limit just doesn't exist. So this whole series is non-uniformly convergent, which means from, for our numerical scheme, that was essentially the killer. And the reason why I put this in is to highlight that when you take solutions from the shelf, like this magic formula, which is often advertised as solving all the problems that you can have with linear diffusion equations, you need to be very careful when you implement them numerically, because you can actually run into these issues. The only thing for us was that the Green's function was consistent. You would numerically expect this. So at that stage, we were slightly disappointed, as you can imagine, because we have worked out the Green's function, we tested it, but nothing worked. But fortunately, there is another way of solving these linear equations, because the thing is, we want to exploit this linearity. We didn't want to stop and say, fine, we're going to do finite elements now. We want to see whether we can go f further with our semi-analytical approach. Now, the basic idea is you take your concentration field and you decompose it into a spatial temporal bit and only a stationary solution. Now, the spatial temporal bits you solve with homogeneous boundary conditions, but with a given initial condition, and you solve the stationary solution subject to your non-trivial boundary conditions. The good thing is that this first bit here is just your Green's functions. And that's good because we could rescue all the hard work that we had done on working out the Green's function and testing it. Now the only thing we had to work out were these stationary solutions. Now you might recall that the um, diffusion operator in cylindrical coordinates separates. So you can essentially use separation of variables. But then you look at your actual geometry, you see that you have one, two, three boundary conditions that are non-trivial. Now you can't use separation of variables in higher dimensions with more than one non-trivial boundary condition. So would that stop us? No, because the problem is linear. So you can again just decompose your problem with three non-trivial boundary conditions into three problems with one non-trivial boundary condition shown here. You can add them up, superposition holds, and everything is going to be fine. And so just to convince you that the boundary conditions are not satisfied, because that was why we started this whole endeavor, this is again this one of the solution contributions. And I want to draw your attention to this purple expression here. When we differentiate this with respect to z, you see you're going to bring down essentially a factor alpha over a. That's going to kill this expression a over alpha. And then you evaluate everything at z equals h. And so which means that those terms cancel and you end up with this expression here. At that stage, you open up your magic book on Bessel functions. And you're going to realize that this is nothing but a delta function. And this is great, because that means that that whole integral collapses and gives me back the flux that I want. So I know now that we're heading down the right direction analytically. There shouldn't be any surprises. The good thing is, there aren't any surprises numerically either. This time, the boundary conditions are satisfied. Here, what you see is that I can simulate now a flux through an all right channel. I'm going to take a radial cut through the position of that all right channel, and you can see the flux coming in here. When we look from the top, we have this nice 
localization. And now we differentiate with respect to Z. And once we differentiate with respect to Z and we're going around the phi direction, which is shown here, or we're going to cut along the R direction. And you can clearly see it was a unit flux that we put in. We recover the unit flux. So that's true. Okay. So in terms of validating the model in terms of flux, flux and boundary conditions, that was all fine. So the next step was we want to model the actual physiology. Now, not much, actually nothing is known of how all right channels are distributed within the ERPM junctions. This is completely up to speculation. Some people say they form rings, so we did that, so we took five all right channels, put them on the ring, and this diameter is 30 nanometers. And we simulated it, and we had this red curve here. Okay, so we got these little wiggles. And you might say, well, so the Green's function is a bit wiggly, so you get out wiggles, but the most important point is you get these high concentrations at roughly 100 micromolar, so these little wiggles just above base level is just the price that you have to pay. Now that answer wasn't good enough for us, and the reason is actually biologically. We are interested in refilling of the ER, which means we are interested in driving the circuit pumps. Turns out that these oscillations more or less live around the activation threshold of your circuit pumps, which means if we had these oscillations, we could induce artificial fluxes into our model and then misrepresent the actual ER refilling process, which is what actually our model is about. And so the question is, is there a quick fix for that that actually doesn't involve a lot of numerical load? And the quick answer is, yes, there is. So typically what you do in these simulations is because your ORI channels and your circuit pumps are quite small, you treat them as point sources in the model. And so that is shown here. We just have flux through one surface element. But then what Emma thought was, so why don't I smear out the flux slightly, okay? So instead of having going through just the central green element, I hope you can see there is a bit of faint green on either side. So Essentially, you smear them out, and what you can see over here to illustrate that, in the plaque scenario, we essentially have a flux through one surface element, so it peaks at one point only. And now we're just going to have these little side bends there. And that is actually enough to smooth out these wiggles, okay? So numerically, that is not going to increase the load at all. Whether you have a three-point support or one-point support, it doesn't really matter. What is important, you get out really nice smooth curves. And so this function W that smooths out your delta function was the solution to this problem. Okay, and at that stage, we decided, okay, this is the model, it passed all the numerical tests, so what comes next is that we can have confidence in our numerical simulations. So as I said, we wanted to understand the refilling of the ER, and since there isn't evidence for how the ORI channels and circuit pumps are actually positioned within the ERPRM junctions, we tested different configurations. The first one is what we call the clustered configuration, and that's the one where you have five channels sitting on a ring with a radius of 30 nanometers. Then we have a, a similar configuration, which is the non-clustered one, where we increase that radius to 50 nanometers. In the middle, I show you a snapshot for the calcium concentration at the plasma membrane. Now, the first thing that you notice is you get these high levels of calcium just at the locations of the ORI channels, and that's exactly what you would like to see. Um, when you go through the non-clustered configuration, you again see these high concentrations. Now, the difference between these two panels is that in the center, you have a much more highly elevated calcium concentration here compared to here, and I'm going to quantify that on the next slide. But what is more remarkable is when you look at the ER membrane. So this is a cut just at the ER membrane. And what we observe is that for the clustered configuration, we get this connected area of really high calcium, while for the non-cluster channels, the calcium concentration is much smaller. And also, in here, you have a really hard time to discern the contributions from the different all right channels, while in here, you can still see them. So there's one there and one there. And to quantify this, we took cuts along the radial direction. Now the first thing to notice is that for the clustered configuration in blue and the non-clustered configuration in red, the peak concentrations are pretty much the same. And that's good because clustering and non-clustering shouldn't have much of an impact on the peak concentrations. But it's that little plateau here 
that essentially is the contribution from the clustering. That originates from the overlapping of the single nanodomains of individual channels because they sit so close, those concentration profiles actually merge. And then when you go onto the ER membrane, you actually can see the much higher calcium concentration for the clustered configuration compared to the non-clustered ones. And in case you're wondering what these little dips are, this is essentially the action of the circa pumps, exactly what you would expect to see. Now when we saw these curves, we thought, okay, so there must be an impact on ER refilling. And uh, turns out, this is not the case at all. So here, I show you cuts through the ER into a phi direction. So essentially, think you have your uh, circuit pump sitting on the ring. Then you take essentially the slice along the phi direction. And then we see the ER calcium coming in through the circuit pumps. But in the cluster configuration, you have this little band of slightly more calcium coming in. But overall, when you go a bit further away from the ER membrane, there isn't much of a difference. And the reason for this is, is that when you look at the circuit pump activity, so the calcium ions pumped per second as a function of the calcium concentration, then for the clustered configuration, you have a concentration sitting over here. For the non-clustered one, you're sitting over here. So that is just a reduction by a few percentage points. Um, that is essentially not enough to give you a significant difference in terms of refilling. Essentially in both cases your circuit pumps are maxed out and that's why you get what you say. Now we thought, okay, what happens when we move our circuit to B pumps further away from the all right channels? Again, nobody knows where these circuit pumps sit. So we only looked at the clustered configuration and at some point the circuit pumps are 30 nanometers away and in the other scenario they are 60 nanometers away from the ORI channels and again there isn't much of a difference okay so for circa 2b it doesn't really matter what the relative distance is between the ORI channels and the circa pumps but cells also express different isoforms so there is circa 2a there is circa 2b and so we looked at circa 2a pumps and now the scenario is different this is for the clustered configuration, this is for the, sorry, this is for the circuit pumps being close by, this is for the circuit pumps being further away, and you can clearly see when you compare the colors, you get more calcium in <coughs> for the circuit pumps that are close by compared to the circuit pumps that are further away. And can we understand this? Yes, indeed we can. These are again the response curves. So this is a curve that I already showed you. This is now the curve for circuit 2A. Now circuit 2B, are uh, high affinity, low capacity pumps, while circa 2A are low affinity, high capacity. And so I again indicated the calcium concentrations that you find when the circa pumps are close by compared to when the circa pumps are further away. And now for the circa 2A you can see because the calcium concentration drops quite a bit when you move your circa pumps away, the pump rate for the circa 2A drops significantly. And that is the reason why we see a better refilling for circa 2A in the presence of closely associated circa pumps compared to the ones that are further away. Now at this point you might say, Rudiger, this is all very nice, but honestly, couldn't you have guessed this? Because if you have these curves, it's obvious when the calcium concentration drops for the same amount for circa 2A and 2B, then circa 2A should be affected much more. And I agree, I could have guessed that. The point is, you have absolutely no idea where on this curve you actually are. Nobody can measure the calcium concentration in an ERPM junction. So at the moment, modeling is the only way to get a quantitative understanding what happens. And that's why we designed that 3D model to really know where on these curves we would be located. And so that's one of the advantages of our model and the benefits. We can now understand what the impact of downstream molecules is because we can read out the calcium concentration. Excuse me. Yeah. Where can you explain again where those curves are coming from? Do you compute it? These, these circa curves? Yeah. Oh, so um, these are uh, experimentally determined curves. So there is um, more or less agreed understanding that circuits are coupled, sorry, are modeled by Hill functions. And so the KDs for them are more or less known. If you hunt enough, you can find them. And so these are essentially the Hill curves coming out from experimentally determined parameters. And so there are 
uh, independent of the cells. This is a g generic intrinsic property of the CRCA 2B and CRCA 2A. Yeah, so, so that's belief that uh, those isoforms do not vary too much between different cell types. Now, I wouldn't say that there aren't specific cell type dependent modulations. But overall, there is general agreement that CIRCA 2A has a much higher capacity than CIRCA 2B, and that they are also activated at different levels, that essentially CIRCA 2B is activated at a lower concentration than CIRCA 2A. So the overall shape is cell type independent. You might have modifications in the maximal rate and the KDs. A and both are expressed at the same quantity in each cell? No, that's, the, th that's a really interesting point. You can get differential expression levels. So it's, again, different cell types might have different levels of circa 2A and circa 2B. And there are speculations that in the ERPM junctions you can get a mix of A and B. And so people start looking to identify them, just pull them down, see what's there. And so for us, it was essentially an in vivo in silico experiment to see what the impact of a mixture of 2A and 2B could be. I don't understand why the 30 nanometer and 60 nanometers are don't correspond to the same concentration. Maybe I missed something for both. Um, I think. They, uh, I might have just misplotted them. They should be at the same concentrations. But because, because if they are the same concentration, the, the ratio between the two is not going to be as bad. But no, it's not the ratio between this and this that is. No, uh, yeah, okay. So, but, but, but what you see here, this, the ratio from here to there, is essentially, I think, a drop of 15 percentage points. This here is almost a drop of. That's 50%. what I'm saying. If you move it, move the green ones to the right, it's not going to be as much. No, it, it's it, it, it's still quite significant. Okay. Okay. I mean, you, you move this one a bit up, so you're essentially there. It's still uh, a much a much more significant okay. drop. So. Um, okay. Okay. No, no, no. I uh, can you go back one slide also? Sure. Uh, let me. Sorry, just wouldn't it be that calcium is lower because the circuit is more effective? I don't know. Well, what you. Well, you could yeah, 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 yes, 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 yeah, that, that could be reason. Yeah. Okay, if you go back one slide, mm -hmm. okay, I see a difference, but uh, concentration, I mean, the gradient is not that big, right? It's between. No, but I should say these simulations are only run for um, a like real t simulated time of 10 milliseconds. So if you were too long, if you were to wait longer, that difference it actually would amplify. A amplify and okay, amplify. Okay, yes, okay thank you. Okay, and so this um, is a slide where we're going to come back to a point that I made in the beginning, namely that different effector molecules sitting in the ERPM junction could be differentially activated, and the question is why. The reason is that you get really intricate micro patterning or micro shaping of the calcium concentration depending on where your auride channels and circa pumps actually sit. And so this is a cut through the um, ring of the auride channels. This is a cut through the ring of the circa pumps for clustered and non-clustered. And just what I want to show you, you, you see these tongs of calcium coming in. So these are the effects of the single channels. And now you can see is depending on where you put your effector molecule, they can actually see different calcium concentrations and could be activated differentially. And you also get a nice interaction between where the circa pumps are and where the aura channels are. Because remember, the circa pumps and the aura channels have to be off offset. They are not sitting beneath each other, just because they are big molecules, so physically you can't stack them. So whenever I talk to experimentalists, I said, no, you need to move them apart. And so the 30 nanometers that we put in is a current estimate, I should say, for the minimal distance between an aura channel and a uh, circa pump. And so you see these little tongs coming in here from the top. These are essentially the remnants of these nanodomains for the single all right channels. And so again, you can see if you think about you're putting in your uh, signaling machinery into the ERPM junction, then you could activate them the differently depending on where they are. And so that is actually one ongoing discussion about STEM ORI model or STEM ORI as um, 
mechanism. Is it more important for ER refilling or is it more important for signaling? And here essentially all this spatial patterning essentially doesn't impact really a lot on the ER refilling. So it's more like a homeostatic process that keeps working. But if you were to think in terms of signaling, then this could make a massive difference. How? How? It makes a difference because if you think that um, you have a molecule that is calcium activated, and let's assume that it's only one molecule that then um, activates, let's say, gostantocamodulin or another pathway to gene expression, then you could think that depending on where that molecule sits, it sees a different calcium concentration depending on the KDs of that molecule, you should get different activation levels. And if you think you've got more structure in the microdomain, so molecules are not necessarily just nilly-willy diffusing through the microdomain, but are tethered, then you could imagine that because of their differential exposure to a calcium concentration, you get differential activation. Yes? No? Okay. Okay, good. So um, with this I would like to move on to my last part of the talk. So recently Don Gill and his group looked into cross-linking of all right channels. And now what happens is, so he, here are your um, stims again, and as I said earlier, stim has this little hand sticking out. And now what STEM does is it scraps onto one all right channel, it scraps onto another all right channel, and what they find in the experiment is you get much more flux through these cross-linked all right channels compared to the situation where you essentially have uh, all right, sorry, STEM only coupling to a single all right channel. But that was not enough in the experiments. What they actually looked is our global calcium oscillations, so whole cell calcium oscillations. Uh, they are driven by IP3 receptors. And what they found is when they have cross-linked channels, you get a higher frequency of calcium oscillations compared to when the channels are not cross-linked. And that is quantified here. So your STEM1 alone gives you a higher frequency than when you essentially have this um, heterodimer where um, STEM21 actually can't bind to the ORI channel. Okay, and the question now is can, can we understand that? Because you can think you get a higher influx here, what's the impact on the IP3 receptor? Okay, so first thing to do is look at what the concentration profiles are going to be like. Now one of the ideas is for these cross-linked channels they form a really tightly arranged lattice. And so from a modeler's perspective this is the first shot as a tight lattice. And the other configuration is more apart, and so that's the other one. We also um, reduce the flux through these channels that um, responds to the reduction measured in experiments. Now we again see this increase in the calcium concentration just at the center of these cross-linked channels, and the same is translated into the concentration at the ER membrane. When we now look at the non-cross-linked channels, then you can see the different contributions from the ion channels, but obviously because we reduce the flux, you don't get as much, and again, we have a much more diffusive contribution at the ER membrane. Now, when we take cuts through the ERPM junction, so just going along the z-direction, you can see this nice bands of the calcium concentration going down to the ER membrane, and the same is here, but there's little that comes down to there. So once we saw this, we thought, now this time, this time there needs to be a difference in ER refilling. It turns out the concentrations are still be beyond essentially saturation levels for circa 2B. And so just to illustrate that the cross-linking and the non-cross-linking channels overall don't give you much of a difference <coughs> in terms of ER refilling. So this is done for circa 2B pumps that sit close to the ORI channels. But as I said, nobody really knows where these circa pumps are. And one hypothesis is that they are actually distributed around the periphery of these ERPM junctions to essentially mop up all the calcium that comes out of the ORI channels so that it doesn't escape to the cytosol. You really want a sort of constrained um, microdomain. And so in this case, you actually have a difference 
because for the cross-linked one you get higher calcium concentrations than for the not cross-linked ones and the reason is that in this case the calcium concentration doesn't decay to the same extent going from the center to here compared to when you are when you have these non-cross-linked channels which have a smaller amplitude and there's less overlap of the microdomains. So in this case, um, you actually would get an effect. The thing with the circuit pumps is because nobody knows where they are, you could also speculate, well, this geometric arrangement might actually be quite beneficial. If I cluster everything in the center and if, as experimentalists believe at the moment, the circuit pumps actually sit outside of the ORI channels, not in the center, a cross-linked configuration, which is uh, occupies little space, can give you more space for the circuit pumps. And so we tested that as well. So here we're putting essentially two rings of circuit pumps around and given that we have more space in the cross-linked version to the non-cross-linked version, we get more circuit pumps in here and that is essentially a double boost for the ER refilling. We get more calcium into the ER than for the cross non-cross-linked one. And now you can see why cross-linking would actually really help with the IP3 oscillations. Because if we get more calcium into the ER, then you can think more calcium goes to the IP3 receptor and that is then um, a beneficial amplification. Okay, and actually that leads me nicely to what we want to do next. So far we have really focused on the central part. So we had our sub-PMER and our ERPM junction. And so to understand this interaction between the IP3 receptors, we need to move further. We now need to implement our full at least three domain, if not four domain model. And why? Well, obviously, calcium has to diffuse from the sub-PMER to the bulk ER. Now, the thing again with the IP3 receptors is there is evidence that they are close to the ERPM junction. I mean, Colin Taylor did some work on it, Don Gill did some work on it, but again, nobody knows how close they are. There's often talk about preferential access of IP3 receptors to the calcium that comes out of these all right channels. But how this really works is an open question and again for us a strong motivation for the modeling. And now you can see what could happen is that calcium that diffuses through the ER actually then binds to the IP3 receptor. However, that is a quite controversial point. For the reanodin receptor it is known that it expresses luminal gating. And so there's talk about sensitization that has been well established. For the IP3 receptor, there is no evidence that there are luminal binding sites. So one line of thought good, if there had been luminal binding sites, they should have discovered them by now. But since nobody has found them, they're most probably not there. On the other hand, there's a really interesting speculation that you don't need luminal binding sites for luminal gating. The reason is that you might have calcium trickling out from the ER through a sort of subconductance state of the IP3R and then binding onto the, lumen onto the cytosolic side. So we get some sort of fake cytosolic coupling or gating but by calcium that comes through the ER actually and not through the cytosol spilling over. But that is a hypothesis that we would actually like to test in terms of how quickly does calcium go from the microdomain through the cytosol to the IP3 receptor or through the ER to the IP3 receptor, whether there's some sort of race in terms of who gets there first and what the implications are for the calcium oscillations. And the other thing is these are all local models, okay? So we are looking at a single microdomain. But we know that the calcium oscillations that are measured are global. So our ultimate goal is to actually build networks of these microdomains and then try to understand the emergent phenomena of cell-wide calcium oscillations driven by these localized dynamics to really appreciate how localized signaling affects global variables that are often measured in experiments. Okay, and with that, let me summarize what I showed you today. So we developed the first three-dimensional model of a stim ori microdomain with having different compartments for the cytosol, the sub-PMER, the bulk ER. We also explicitly looked into ori channel location and circuit pump location. And what we saw is that these, that the position of these ori and circuit pumps can actually form spatially distinct patterns that then might or might not have an impact on downstream signaling depending on the activation levels. 
we saw that clustering of ORI channels does not necessarily enhance ORI ER refilling depending on the CIRCA subtype. For CIRCA 2B, it was only weakly affected. And that was because essentially all the fluxes saturate. For CIRCA 2A, the story was more diverse. Here we saw a difference between 2A, sorry, between clusters being closer by of the circuit pumps or further away. And the last point is we started to look into ER refilling when the ORI channels are cross-linked. And here the story is that as long as your ORI channels sit close, it really doesn't matter. But if you have peripherally located circuit pumps, then it's really different than the cross-link channels enhance the ER refilling because you get more calcium coming out that can then drive the peripheral circuit pumps. And also the idea is that cross-link channels, because they might occupy less space, give you more space for putting circuit pumps into the ERPM junction and hence refill the ER. And finally, let me acknowledge the people that I worked with. So for years, I've been working with Steve on modeling intracellular calcium. We had an extremely talented PhD student on that project, Emma, who just finished her PhD. And in the last part, we started to work with Don Gill, who is at Penn State, and Robert did a lot of the crucial experiments. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, in general, I think there should should be little problem uh, in interpretation of uh, signaling role of this uh, ORI calcium fluxes and uh, um, needs to refill these stores because I mean stores must be satisfied finally. Like mm -hmm. uh, steam will send signals to ORI until uh, uh, stores are refilled. Yeah. And at the moment stores are refilled, signal will stop. Yeah. And uh, uh, intracellular signaling of calcium uh, shouldn't be dependent on this particular mechanism because it is sort of, you know, mechanical but not functional. Uh, in terms of all cell. So there is little link which is missing in this understanding to like to paint all the all the entire entire picture. What 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 can you say to it? I'm not I don't think I entirely agree with what you say that essentially um, everything should work independently of the fine details because essentially um, all that Stim and ORI do is to refill the ER and because it's a mechanical process so it essentially runs more or less autonomously in the background the calcium concentration in the ER drops, Stim and ORI come together and then once the calcium concentration is high enough the whole thing goes back to essentially its initial state and then you have these cycles and see th to me that's the point of having a homeostatic process that you want to keep your ER refilled because that is important for driving calcium oscillations because if you don't have enough calcium in the ER, there's nothing you can do. You're gonna run out of it. Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course, in, in, in terms of only oscillations, because they are uh, dependent on, uh, on uh, stores, yeah. so of course that's true, but all other signaling uh, pathways in the cell may be uh, store independent, but, but still calcium dependent. So in, in this case, link is missing. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure you can call it that there are cases in the cell that A, don't depend on calcium oscillations, and they might not feel that. But the point is, there are a lot of processes that depend on calcium oscillations. And I think the point that we are making is we are interested in this particular class. And I'm not saying that every calcium signal, sorry, every calcium dependent signaling mechanism in the cell needs them all right. I would always constrain that to say those that depend on calcium oscillations and that depend on the localized signaling in the ERPM junctions, that's what I'm interested in. So I think uh, that's a caveat that always implicit in the work that obviously I only can make statements about the processes that I, we model and are interested in and not um, overall. Okay, no problem. Yeah, great. Um, how fast 
does the ER communicate to the RI channel? So if the ER empties, how long does it take before the influx of calcium stops? Okay, so one estimate is roughly 30 seconds. So, can I go back? Yeah, so if you think that usually your stem molecules sit out here, so there's an idea that there's a two micron radius around the uh, ERPM junction where most of the stem molecules that are used in activating the ORI channel set. And estimates have shown that if you apply Tapsigargan and then have your ER deplete, it takes roughly 30 seconds from ER, from the onset of ER depletion to the onset of um, influx of the ORI channels. And what about going the other direction? Uh, if you don't use uh, any reversible stimulus like that's a gargan, but let's say IP3. Yes. Remove the IP3 and the ER starts refilling. Yeah. How long will it take for the uh, influx to end? Also 30 uh, seconds? Or is that no, the, the influx is, uh, um, I believe, much quicker. Mm -hmm. So that determinates in seconds, definitely not 30 seconds. So what you have is a much longer rest phase out here, mm -hmm. and then they're going to come in Refill, but that influx is really seconds, not 30 seconds. Thanks. Um, do these RI channels have some kind of gating? Are they calcium sensitive? I mean, these are two independent questions, maybe. Um, they have calcium binding sites and they have quite a lot of phosphorylation binding sites. So the actual molecular structure of the ORI channel is quite involved. And what I didn't say, because I didn't want to overcomplicate the story, so these ORI molecules that sit in the, ER, in the plasma membrane, at the resting state they're usually monomers or dimers, but to actually form the channel they need to form either hexamers or pentamers, and so you have on top of that all that machinery going on. Okay, and do they open and close sort of stochastically as voltage gated channels or are they yeah. just open ones? No, so there? actually that is a really good question uh, because when people think about ion channels, stochasticity is the next thing. So people looked at um, all right channel fluxes and while there is variation, it's believed, and that came out in PNAS last year, it's not stochastical gating. It's essentially um, once they're open, they're more or less stay open. You get some su su some subconductance changes. And actually, in terms of calcium gating, there's one hypothesis that you have calcium-dependent inactivation, which actually, coming back to um, Arthur's questions, that what determines the um, determination of the ORI flux could <coughs> also be driven in part by the calcium concentration in the um, the RPM junction because you get a feedback from the cytosolic side onto the gating state of the ORI channels. So. Okay. Um, just then there was the, um, the question of distance, the yes. 30, 60 nanometers. Um, have anyone done um, experiments with BAPTA, some other buffers to, because this is what you do with say BK channels yeah. versus SK channels to see that. They no, they haven't done any um, experiments with uh, buffers as far as I'm aware. What they're trying to do at the moment, at least Anand Parag is working on it, is really getting high resolution imaging data to really see that the distance between the ORI channels and the circa pumps. Now what people have done before is they did um, immunocoprecipitation and so one argument was they didn't, they pulled down the ORI so, and they didn't see the circuit pumps coming with it, and then they decided they are essentially too far away. So there is no physical link, and that was one. But essentially, I keep asking the same question, I want to have a number to put into the model, and the answer is always, this is, would be really nice, but the experiments are really hard, and I think Don Gill is also working on it to get some mutants so they can actually do high resolution imaging for that, because they really believe that that distance is important. Thanks. Do you have any idea about the stability of these complexes? Because you say that the stability of these steam ori complexes, yeah. you say that the refilling is maybe very fast, and then how long the plasma membrane, ER membrane contacts stay together? Well, so because they are moving all the time. Yeah? No, 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 they're not. They're 
as soon as they enter the ERPM junction, they're more or less stationary. There is very, very little movement. So as soon as STEM holds onto ORI, that complex has a negligible diffusion coefficient. I mean, it still wiggles, but that's essentially close to zero. That complex is rather stable, so it only really starts to dissociate once the EF hand of the stim binds calcium again. That then triggers a conformational change that says, okay, now release the um, or right activation domain from the stim molecule. And it's only at that point that they're going to dissociate and then I will diffuse out of the ERPM junction. But the actual complex, so as my understanding goes, is rather stable. But you would, you would say that the junction is defined by the complex or is defined by something else? The junction per se is defined by the ERP, like the extension of the ER with respect to the plasma membrane. So people think that when you actually, let me go back. So essentially, it is this extension here that would define what the ERPM junction is. So it's not the functional positioning of the ORI stim complex that defines the junction. It is that your junction is the physical space and the ORI and stim actually live in there. So the junction could potentially be larger than where stim ORI so if you were, essentially what, what, what people tend to do is they look at these puncta and then they, go and they, they measure them and that gives you a lower bound for the size of an ERPM junction. But then there are also electrographs where you can really see the ER coming close to the plasma membrane and that's the estimate that we have. Yeah. So yeah, in the, the slide that you just sh showed, the, um, I don't know if it's just an artistic concept, mm -hmm. but it seems that ORI and, and STEM1 are touching each other so that we have the impression, contrary to the simulation you have shown, that there's a direct tunneling finally from the extracellular space to the ER and the calcium nanodomain is extremely restricted to the point that we have the impression that um, calcium can go directly through some kind of uh, very nano column. Is this, what, can you comment on this, yeah. uh, about these distances and how this is actually important? Because if indeed uh, um, you have such a space restriction, yeah. then just the calcium will go from the extracellular space directly to the ER and the effect of diffusion or being lost yeah. in, the, in the cytoplasm might be not that important. Can you mm -hmm. comment on yeah. that? So having this, you mean like a physical almost contact going through the ORI channel past the stem more or less straight into the ER? Now, um, that was experimentally refuted because that was one of the first ideas thinking you get this sort of fast tunneling. And the reason is you can block your circuit pumps and when you plug your circuit pumps, you can't get the refilling into the ER. So that was the indication that you can't have direct access from the extracellular space into the um, ER. You need to essentially go through the cytosol. No, but I'm talking, I understand for the circa, yeah. I'm talking now about this, e, this uh, STEM1 or I interaction. Yeah. If they are very close, it's, it's not even, you know, like few. Yeah. A, a nanometer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then, can't you, without uh, involving circa here, can't you have here a direct pumping without the calcium being lost through the cytoplasm once it, it enters through this um, ORI one? Oh, you mean going through the stem? That's right. Oh, no, the stem doesn't have a pore. It doesn't have a pore. That doesn't have a pore. The stim essentially, um, the ORI channels really, those six subunits form the ring. And so that's where the calcium enters. But stim itself doesn't form a pore. So what the stim molecules do, they only hold on to the ORI subunits to mm -hmm. gate them. But essentially, if you were to look beneath the stim molecule, there is, plasma, there is the membrane of the ER. So there is no hole in there. So 
you could have imagined that the slim aura molecules essentially fo form like a mini gap junctions, if you wish. So like the aura channel having one half of the gap junction and the slim the other half of the gap junction, but that, that's not what people see in electrographs and um, looking at molecular structures. It's slim doesn't have any conducting properties. It's really sensing and gating. I see, and, and there is a direct uh, physical interaction uh, between this uh, uh, STEAM-1 and yes. uh, CERCA? Um, that is a really good question and again up to debate. So what people think that happens is that there is a molecule called POST, partner of STEAM, and POST binds to STEAM and POST binds to CERCA, so it's essentially the mediator so that you can keep circa close to your stim molecules, which would then give the circa's preferential access to the calcium that comes in through the ori channels to which the stim molecules just hold on to. So that, that's one idea. I mean, they identified that protein and they pulled it down with stim, but there's still a debate how close that actually is. A and the final question yeah. is, I understand the, the flux was not that large as you, you mentioned yes. at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So why not having uh, uh, use Brownian and stochastic simulations mm -hmm. yeah. that would have avoided you to go to this Green's function and you uh -huh. would get the fluxes and the everything like for mo almost yeah. not a lot of work. Is there some specific reason you had in mind or? Um, yeah, there's a pragmatic reason is that uh, the PDE modeling came to us more naturally, but actually we are now uh, investigating exactly that question. So I was talking to Kit Yates the other day, who has been doing a lot of Brownian simulations for signaling microdomains, and that's exactly what we want to test, is how good of an approximation is the continuous PDE modeling compared to a Brownian motion single particle. Now there is a paper out where they did it for IP3 receptors, where they said, well, essentially when you look at IP, the number of calcium ions in the microdomain around an IP3 receptor, we should actually treat calcium ions individually. Now because the current of an IP3 receptor is much higher than what goes through an ORI channel, they quickly ran into issues they couldn't track all the ion channels. But actually for the origins, because they have a lower current, that is something we want to explore and actually see, do the results that we have match up once we individually track ions. But yeah, that's, that's essential on our agenda to ver verify that. Thank you. So, uh, just a qu very quick question. Uh, you're planning to look at the IP3 receptors, so yes. are you planning to move away from the green function uh, hybrid method, or you're still planning to? Well, I, ideally, we would love to keep this. So, and in the first instance, I would not necessarily implement a full dynamic gating for the IP3 receptor, but essentially use some threshold models that can tell me, okay, depending on what the calcium concentration is, put a flux in. So a simple two or three state model that would allow me to keep the time stepping of the Green's function. Because at, at that stage, we are more interested in the actual flux through the IP3 receptor and not the long-term behavior where you essentially get effects of the stochastic gating and reopening and all mm -hmm. of that. So um, that's what, what we currently think. I mean, in an ideal world, if somebody knows of a really good way to um, couple those green function mechanisms to a variable time step stochastic scheme, I would be happy to implement that because that would be the ultimate solution of modeling the stochastic bit to the, this. I mean, I know Alex has done some work on so, um, hybrid stochastic schemes, so that would be another way for doing that. Okay. All right, okay, thank you very much, Rudiger. Okay, right, thank thanks. Rudiger again. some ATP left. Uh, I don't know, but I, I, if people want to go and eat now, I mean, I, I since it's <laughs> okay.
Okay. No, 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 it's fine. Yeah, okay, yeah. Let's, let's <coughs> we have plenty of time. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, because we start at three, but is, but lunch I. Break is long, okay, so. okay, no problem. I. I All right, so uh, the next talk will be given by Mathia Kariel. Is it correct pronunciation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, who will talk about the snare machinery involved in the neurotransmitter. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, th this presentation, uh, in this presentation I will uh, show you the results of, uh, like fr from a quite recent collaboration uh, between, uh, okay, myself, my uh, PhD advisor, and uh, so Fred Pincé at uh, from ENS, and this is the work mostly of the postdoc uh, Fabio Manca. Uh, so, so this is the, the say one uh, one study and one work, and so we're, we're going to talk about. Uh, the fusion process, so this is just to summarize probably what uh, everybody knows in this room. Uh, so fusion is, is pretty much everywhere and it's the way, uh, it's, the, the, it's the moment where uh, vesicle just deliver some, some cargo that is enclosed in this uh, bilayer sphere. And uh, you find that, of course, in uh, neurotransmitter release, that's what we're going to talk about, but not only. And basically, what we are dealing with uh, is, is the, the process of fusion requires, so there are a lot of studies uh, on to determine what's the landscape here. So this is just schematic showing you that there is an energy barrier that has to be uh, surpassed and that would require like by pure diffusion like seconds uh, uh, and um, so uh, to so some process don't don't really care if it's low or very fast but obviously for a neurotransmitter release it has to be quite fast and uh, so so in order to uh, to help uh, this this process um, so snare proteins are attached to, to those vesicles and they uh, cross-link the, the, ve the vesicle membrane with uh, plasma uh, or target membranes. And uh, so basically you have a, uh, so a, a VAMP uh, a helix here which is bound to, to the vesicle. Uh, there is the uh, syn syntaxin and, VAMP, uh, and SNAP25. Uh, well, and all this uh, complex molecule can be divided in, in, in a sequence of, of residues, and I'll talk about that later, but uh, uh, well, this is the protein we are dealing with. So the, the, the fusion, uh, the, this is a, a movie that uh, Fred uh, like showed me a, a couple of years ago, and uh, showing uh, how, how this, uh, this fusion is happening. So basically, uh, you see, uh, um, so first, so before the, the movie happens, the, the vesicle uh, has to be uh, tethered uh, to, to the membrane, and this phase is uh, called, uh, okay, tethering or docking. Then uh, several snares can be recruited, and there is a, a structure uh, so here the vesicle is docked and in neurotransmitter release there is a, at this moment, well, the, 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 the vesicle are ready to release their, their neurotransmitter and uh, a calcium uh, influx just trigger the last uh, stage, uh, the last part of the process where the snare proteins that cross-link the two membranes just undergo a conformational change uh, corresponding to a, uh, which is called zippering. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's like a, a zipper that, that quickly uh, uh, brings or, or push the membrane together and uh, ultimately this leads to, to fusion. Now, we are, sorry, yeah? Okay, so we are interested here, uh, this whole talk it will be about uh, time scales. 
and uh, how fast this fusion uh, can occur. And so we have experiments, uh, so designed uh, so by Fred, but it's also known from, from previous work, that uh, a single snare is, is already able to mediate fusion. And so here you see the results of an experiment uh, with uh, uh, some DNA origami where you can uh, prepare a system where you're pretty sure or you can control uh, the number of interactions or snare interactions between the vesicle and, uh, and the target membrane. And here, uh, what, what you see here is that a single snare can trigger fusion and, and this happens within, say, let's say one second. That's the order of magnitude. But in uh, neurotransmitter release, so here what, you are sh what I show you is some uh, da data uh, Fred just gave me uh, yesterday because uh, I, I wanted to have something to show to, to, to a, a result showing that it's indeed fast. So here what you measure is, is uh, an indirect measurement of the, of the, the, the fusion process or the, the zipping of the snare. It's just, it's just an electric uh, signals and this uh, different, uh, I'll say, so this, the wild type, so the, the red curve is the one that we are interested in here. So it, this is just to show that in neurotransmitter release, uh, that the process is way faster, like few orders of magnitude faster, and the, the characteristic time scale is uh, 100 of microsecond. So, so in, in the, in, at the synapse, uh, when you have the, the calcium signal that triggers the fusion, everything happens in, in say, uh, a, a few hundreds of, of microseconds. So the question is how can the, the same uh, machine uh, work at, at, at so different uh, speeds? So that brings me to another subject, and this is actually how uh, this, this whole collaboration started, because in, in, uh, we have the same type of uh, observation in, in muscles. So classically what uh, can be done, uh, what has been done, like mechanical tests on fibers, you take uh, uh, a fiber so, and you, you put it in a, in a, in a loading device uh, where essentially you control the length of, of the fiber and you activate uh, the fiber by, by say electric uh, stimulation and you tetanize the fiber. So what you see here is the, the length, which is kept constant, and this is the, the rise in, in the force. And after you reach the isometric uh, tension, you apply a sudden uh, drop in the length. So basically you wait until the muscle is tetanized and then you do this. Uh, and uh, you observe uh, uh, several things and basically what you, what you see is that the tension uh, drops uh, like immediately with, with the step and then partially recovers uh, like a fraction, a significant fraction of the, 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 the initial tension within uh, say one, one, mile, one millisecond. So that's very fast and uh, but, but you see the time scale for the tension rise is more like a hundred uh, of, of millisecond. You can do the same type of experiments now if you can control the, the load. Uh, you also see, so here you drop the tension and you see how the length of the fiber evolves in time. And you also see that there is a fast transient followed by a, a steady state shortening. And you can measure uh, the velocity here of the shortening and this is a blow up of what happens uh, after, uh, after the, the force drop and you also see that there is some kind of something happening immediately with the step and uh, a second phase uh, which is a, a very rapid shortening that occurs also in the, within mi one, two millisecond. Um, so here this is to, s to summarize that we, have, we are dealing here with say two time scales one is associated with, say, the rise in tension or uh, the, the force velocity curve here. And essentially what you are seeing here, the time scale that controls this response is basically the ATP turnover. So the motors, uh, molecular motors are doing their, their jobs and uh, they, they, they pull on cables. I don't know if, if everybody is familiar with, but, but basically what, what uh, actomyosin system 
uh, does is that you have cables of actin filament and motors that are cooperatively pulling on, on, on the fiber and to, to do so they, they, they burn ATP in order to attach and detach and this whole cycle uh, of, of, uh, of the motor takes tens to hundreds of, uh, of uh, milliseconds. So here also on the same time scale this is how you can reconstruct so-called force velocity curves. Those are really like a standard or basic experiment that you can perform on, on uh, skeletal or muscle fibers. Uh, well, so the signal now, if we're interested in what happens at the fast time scale, so historically, so people, so people measure uh, the, the, so what you see here is the applied uh, shortening and the tension that you uh, see immediately after the length uh, drop and after this so-called fast force recovery and what the system does is that you start here with a tension you, the tension drop and this is very like it's elastic response it's linear and then it recovers partially and the, the larger is the force drop the less force you can you can recover um, and so this is the historical uh, result. So it was first published by, by Huxley and, and Simmons. So the, this Huxley is the same as uh, Hodgkin and Huxley. And uh, so, by, so th th what is famous about th this paper is that at that time, so this measurement was, was made. And uh, so Huxley and Simmons uh, proposed uh, from, from, say, this curve, uh, the, the mechanism of the power stroke. So they, they say, okay, we have this response and this can be reproduced by assuming that we have, so th there was no knowledge about this crosslinks or, or motors uh, at that time, but, but this mechanism of having, uh, uh, say, a motor that would attach and then do a power stroke very rapidly, uh, this, this was the, the pioneering, uh, the, the, say, the landmark that, 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 that was verified after. So uh, it's only in the 90s where, where people uh, really saw the, those structures and could measure the size of the stroke. Um, well, okay, I, 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 I don't want to go into details here, but well, just, just to mention that you can recover the rates uh, at which you, you say recover force or you, you have this rapid shortening and there, is a, there was a whole uh, work uh, that has been done to explain why in this setup you have a very fast response while here the response is much uh, slower but I, I'll come to that later. Now back to, to the snares um, so I like to view uh, so here what we see is that this fast response is uh, caused by the, the, the conformational change of the, the power stroke. So you, you get a, a fast recovery of the force because the attached motors, they, they just do like this. So they, they pull quickly on, on the filament. So they are attached, you release, and then they just uh, recover a, a fraction of, of the initial force. So, so this is a conformational change. And in the fusion uh, molecular motors, there is also a transition that happens after the, the, the say, the, the, the switch by, by the calcium. And this is also uh, so the, the so-called zippering of, of the snare proteins. So we are dealing with the same type of, say, schematically mechanism of a, of a conformational change. There is a switcher there. And why the, the muscle is so fast in, in recovering force is that because and, and the, the structure of those molecular motors are, are uh, forming a very structured, uh, uh, they, they have a, a, a very organized uh, structure. So this is uh, the, the contractile structure, which is called uh, a sarcomere here. And this is the, the half sarcomere. And if you take the cross section, you see a very nice uh, hexagonal lattice. Uh, so it's very, very regular. And in the fusion in contractile unit, also many snare organized or organized uh, at at the, the at the synaptic uh, uh, like at the synapse, and uh, they form well. Supposedly, they form uh, 
very uh, nice uh, ring structure where here you see six nerves and in between what you, you see here this the synaptotagmine so that's the, the calcium sensor that is disrupted uh, when calcium arrives so we are so basically the units so in order to achieve a fast response the units have to to get somehow organized and to they have to cooperate and we are interested in, in uh, investigating uh, what what is cooperativity where does it come from and uh, essentially it comes from the fact that that they all linked together by by some some mechanical backbones so they talk to each other through uh, through the mechanics okay so since the two uh, say uh, the muscle and the, and the fusion machinery are can maybe work on the same principle we we will uh, take uh, the model that was proposed by by Huxley uh, for this uh, force recovery and we try to apply that uh, framework and that model to to the snare protein so what do we have we have a, a conformational change of the attached motors and uh, this is represented simply by a, a bistable uh, snap spring where uh, what so this would be, say, the, the actin filament, and this is the, the mysin uh, motor. And there is an internal degree of freedom here that, uh, that represents the, the, the conformational change. And upon uh, this change, uh, some kind of elastic element is, is pulled. So, it, what, so what you end up with is that you have, uh, say, a fixed length here. And by changing S, basically, you, you, you increase the force. Um, so we use the same paradigm in, in the, in the, on the snare proteins, so we have uh, a conformational, so this is here, it's, it's uh, to, to be uh, very sim simple, it's, it's like a, a spin, so it's a digital unit, it's one or zero, open or closed, and it's uh, linked in series with, uh, with an elastic element. So that's uh, basic, so I will detail further, but that's the, the, the principle. Uh, of of the model, so the, the 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 nice thing about having uh, just a, a spin variable, a discrete variable, is that uh, everything is tractable an analytically, and that's uh, and of course, if uh, you fix the total uh, say length of this device uh, by by switching, you increase uh, the force. Okay, so now I'm, I'm entering uh, in more details, uh, uh, like I'm showing you what's inside the box. Uh, so if you have a, uh, a, a snare, so our bistable device, free of all uh, constraint, so there is no force apply on it, uh, then it has two states, and those are discrete. So if the snare is open, uh, say the distance will be uh, around seven nanometers. So I, I I'll come back to the how the parameter I adjusted. So for now it's just an order of magnitude, and it has uh, an energy of about 28 uh, kBT. And when uh, the, the 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 switch is on or when the, the protein is folded or zippered, uh, you have a configuration like this, and uh, the say the shortening of the device is of, of about 7 nanometers. Now this, uh, this protein is anchored uh, between two membranes and so it's so when um, so if, if the, the protein is at a fixed Y so the, the vesicle and the membrane is at some intermediate Y then uh, what this configuration gets uh, frustrated so, if, uh, so you have to to extend those states so that at uh, any given uh, intermembrane distance uh, you have a certain energy and that's just because you are stretching or compressing a spring. So here uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a very simple model where you have basically two states and they extend to infinity because the digi this digital uh, unit uh, is uh, always exists in, in the model and uh, you end up with uh, two states uh, that ha have uh, quadratic energy for, for simplicity. One parameter is this uh, bias here. And um, what essentially what you're saying is that at any given 
this any 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 y any any distance. So this y would be the will be the distance between the membranes. You can switch between those two configuration. And to switch, you have to provide uh, in the in this model uh, rates. And um, so these rates have to satisfy uh, detail balance, which means that here on on this part of the graph, then. Uh, states with uh, high energy have to be less stable than, than this state, so the, the, the rate will go downward. Uh, and, and so it means that, okay, and, okay, and uh, so rate goes like this. And uh, for simplicity, but this is not uh, uh, like a very restrictive uh, criteria, uh, we, we say that here the rate to go from, from this state n to state c, so that would be uh, the unfolded and the folded, this is just a constant and this is basically just detailed balance here. And uh, the opposite happens uh, on, on this side of this uh, uh, y star. And, um, you have exactly the opposite, so here it's constant and here. So every the information about how mechanics is coupled to this uh, transition is here because what you have here is simply a difference in elastic energy. Uh, so how many parameters do we have at this stage? We have the stiffness of, of uh, the two states, we have this A, we have this bias here, uh, and what this bias means, I, I didn't tell you, but, but it's, so it's, it's simply uh, how, how far you have to stretch the, 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 tells you how far you have, to, if you start from here, how far you have to stretch in order to, to, to make this, this state reachable, in a sense. So it amounts to the, uh, it's the mechanical work that you have to perform in order to, to open the, the protein, basically. So Kc uh, and K. So here at this stage we have five parameters. So this is the simply linked to the time scale of spontaneous uh, switching. And um, so how do we calibrate uh, this uh, simple uh, SNRP model? So here we use uh, so single molecule uh, mechanical test. So you put uh, a protein, uh, a snare pin in uh, an optical tweezer device and you link it to the DNA handle and, uh, and we can uh, okay, have a mechanical picture of this and so this, this is a typical trace that you see so here uh, so the force increase and then you see uh, a series of, of, of jumps and this is uh, corresponds to opening of, of those residues that I showed you uh, before. And we are so the, the, the transition that uh, is, is uh, associated with, with this last stage of fusion is this one. And here what you see is that uh, at this level of force you see oscillations in, in this, uh, this opening and uh, you can reconstruct statistics of, of, these, uh, of these jumps and this is, simply, uh, so this is simply the equilibrium distribution and uh, you can uh, adjust that to the data. So here uh, those energy levels are the same as before but now you have to take into account that what you measure is this YB so the stiffness that, have, that you have now is the, the combined stiffness of the DNA and uh, the parabola that I showed before. Okay, so, so you have in series uh, the handle and, and the protein itself. The problem is that with, with uh, this uh, setup is that those are very soft compared to, uh, to, 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 the, to the rigidities here. So you cannot really have, this, this is not a nice probe of, of, the, of the elastic parameters. So, uh, but but okay. For the the other parameters are are well well characterized, namely the the the, the distance between the two configuration, also the energy bias. At least the order of magnitude is is pretty uh, well uh, determined by by this fitting. Um, now, so this is for for one snare. Now we want to. What we want to model is a, is a team of of uh, snare pins, and uh, so here there is a, a major assumption. Here is that at at the scale or at the scale of this ring, because the, the snares are not so far apart, uh, the membranes locally it can be assumed as rigid. 
so this can be this, that would be a next step of, of research to, to, to remove this constraint. But at this stage, we want to to have an insight on the, the how they cooperate. So this the the simplest setup you can you can have, and this in this setup the the, the snares operate in, in in parallel basically. So they are connected to two rigid plates. And uh, so here n will be the number of, uh, of elements and nc will be uh, the number of elements that are, uh, say, zippered. Um, so the dynamics of this, since the y is common to, to all the snares, and we, we saw previously that the rates of, of switching and uh, or folding and folding was just function of the elastic distortion of each individual element. You end up with a, like a 1D uh, Markov chain where at each uh, time step you can either uh, unfold, uh, fold one element with this, uh, with this rate. K plus is the rate to go from N to C. Uh, you can have uh, unswitching event with this probability or no event with this probability. So this is very, very standard. Uh, so that's for, so far for, for the cluster or the bundle of snares. Uh, then we have to put this uh, uh, against the, the, the fusion barrier that I showed on the second slide. And we model this barrier by simply a Gaussian. Uh, so to have an exponential increase here in the, in the, in the energy. And so, and we we consider that the fusion uh, has occurred when the intermembrane distance go below two uh, two nanometers. So what happens here? So the shape of this function has, has is useless here. So th the process ends up when when you go beyond this uh, these two nanometers. So. Uh, so basically, the, this number y is two. So zero was the if if you remember, uh, zero was the uh, well, it's not here, but zero was the the point y equals zero when the the, the snare is is completely fully uh, folded at at zero force. And here, uh, this uh, two nanometers is is the point where the the, the two membranes cannot uh, are becoming unstable and and fuse. Okay. So three parameters for, for, this, uh, for this function. Uh, so the, the height of the barrier, uh, the characteristic uh, length of spreading, and, uh, and the position of the barrier. So this one, uh, w so these, are, these parameters are found, the orders of magnitude are found in the literature, and uh, we made some, some little adjustment I will show you later, but, but basically the numbers are, are here. Yeah. So, but now it's totally coincidence. So, um, so that you have a si very similar energy barrier numbers is totally coincidence. So you mean this this so I mean 26 and the 28? Uh, yes. In fact, in fact, yeah. Th this these are I independent numbers, and uh, but but it's not. Uh, you will see. Uh, it's I don't know if it's by accident, but it's it's it happens to be like this. I mean, it has been measured, and the, indeed uh, it's the same order of magnitude. Uh, like uh, so, th this this let's say the order of 30 uh, kBT is uh, typical for. So there are a lot of reference that reports like uh, this energy for fusion, just just membranes, and uh, the mechanical test that you can do on on single snares, it's also the same uh, amount of of, uh, of energy. Um, okay. So uh, to summarize the, the, the model, uh, we have this parallel uh, bundle of snares. Each snare has this, uh, uh, this model for one snare. You have two states uh, 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 equipped with some elastic uh, properties, uh, switching uh, or folding and folding uh, transitions, and uh, and a fusion barrier. So to couple uh, the, the this uh, dynamics of of, uh, 
of disc disc discrete dynamics of, of folding, uh, we have to, to prescribe the link with the with the, mem the, the the vesicle movement, and that's simply a Langevin equation. So what you see here is a viscous term. This is uh, just uh, thermal noise, and here, so the the vesicle is submitted has to is submitted to. Uh, so the, the, the force of the snares, just derivative of this uh, combined energy and uh, the gradient of, of this uh, function. So uh, this is what we are, we are dealing with. Um, uh, and uh, so we have five parameters for uh, this part of the model, three here, and the additional one is uh, the viscous term, the, vis the drag here, and we just use a stock slow and this gives us, uh, uh, say, characteristic time scale for the relaxation of the position of, of the vesicle uh, of about uh, 4.5 microseconds. So at the end of this, uh, say, whole calibration, I told you that the stiffnesses of the, of the, the snare were not uh, completely, uh, say, accurate, so we have some leeway here. Uh, then orders of magnitude of these parameters and these parameters we can play a little bit but mostly uh, it's uh, those values and we have this uh, maximum uh, zippering rate uh, which can also be linked to, to experiment but okay so far uh, those two are, are still uh, under uh, determined but so now what I show you here is just a result of the simulation. So this is time on the x-axis and this is the position of the vesicle. So the initial condition, I, I forgot to mention that the, uh, for our simulation is that the, the nc at time equals zero, so the, all the, the, the snares are uh, open and uh, the vesicle is positioned or the, the membrane are positioned at uh, seven nanometers apart. So it's, it's the initial state is basically a relaxed state. Everybody's uh, open, there is no force, and you just uh, run the simulation from that point. So that would, in a sense, mimic the very moment where uh, synaptotagmin is, is removed, and, and there we are uh, at the beginning of our simulation. So what you, you see is that for uh, a time tau one, uh, basically nothing happens. You see sometimes uh, one snare undergoing the, 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 the zippering transition. After this time you see an abrupt uh, shortening of, uh, so the two membranes are coming very close uh, uh, together. Uh, very, so the, now the membranes are just above the fusion uh, threshold and then you wait for a second time tau 2 uh, before you see the fusion. So this abrupt jump is very uh, is synchronized with the collective uh, zippering transition. So here you have four, it's a simulation with four snares and they all, uh, they all collapse at the, at the same moment. And if you see here, this, this trace, this, the, the collapse happens uh, exactly when uh, the, the membrane distance, they just uh, coincide with this uh, barrier that, that was between the two parabola. Okay, so now uh, what we're interested in is the, is the, is the number uh, or the, the how the, those time scales depend on the number of, of snare proteins that you have in your bundle. So the second time, so the time uh, tau 2 here, uh, simply de decreases uh, exponentially with uh, the number of, of elements and uh, so such exponential decay has also been reported in, in Ben's work but, but with uh, in fact the, the, in, so the Ben O'Shaughnessy's uh, prediction is uh, so it's based on a different uh, mechanism and so here we have a very uh, very abrupt uh, drop for this, uh, so the more snare you put, the faster it gets. That's kind of an intuitive picture. But the so now if you if you plot the other time scale, uh, so how long you have to wait before uh, actually the, the snare collectively uh, switch is increasing exponentially with uh, with the number of snares. So at the end of the day, what you have is you sum. Uh, those two times, you, you have a, a sharp, oh, no, sharp, you have a, a minimum of in the, the fusion time scale, which is associated with some kind of optimal uh, size of the of the cluster. Um, so uh, back to the, the calibration issues. Uh, so what do we know 
so that goes back to the, to the beginning of the talk, is that if you have one snare, experiment uh, tells you that it should fuse within, uh, within a second, so that's uh, so the, the, the say the stiffness is parameter and we, we allowed ourselves some leeway on this barrier like one plus minus one kbt uh, so to, to reach this number and we know that the, the, the fusion let's say in vivo is a hundred of microsecond and so that's how we we, we calibrate the, the parameters also to have this point and this point but the the message here, so, uh, so one snare should fuse in one second and uh, uh, the minimum fusion time should be of the order of hundreds of microseconds. So you see that the, the difference, like four orders of magnitude, is achieved by just adding a few, uh, a few units. Um, so to understand... Uh, Excuse me? Yeah. So, uh, uh, I missed the point why T1 is, ex uh, is increasing. Yeah, that's the whole thing. So I, I'm going to explain that. Okay. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> uh, so, maybe, uh, so to understand uh, why why it increases, so uh, let's assume uh, that the 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 viscous time is uh, is long compared to the the characteristic time of switching of of the of the snares. So this allows us to so there is uh, we separate the time scale basically, and uh, so this allows us to eliminate the dynamics of this uh, switcher and basically the number of uh, of folded proteins will be just given by the equilibrium distribution at a given intermembrane distance and we just follow the dynamics of this y of t and at each y of t we have say an average number of uh, uh, of nc so this the, the, the so g we get rid of of this uh, uh, discrete dynamics and uh, we somehow average uh, over the fluctuations of, of this variable equilibrium fluctuations this equation and we end up with an, some kind of effective uh, dynamics which is just uh, say a, a diffusion in some effective potential that contains uh, the, our fusion barrier so that's the original uh, landscape but what was before the sum of the so uh, and uh, the energy depending on, on the folded elements so this uh, sum of the individual energy now it's a, it's a, it's a free energy and uh, parameterized by y that comes with a coefficient n in front yeah Uh, I might misunderstand your notation, but when you average the equation in the red brackets, what? yeah, why do you still have an, old, an SDE? Because wouldn't the last two no, no, okay, no, no, it's okay, it's, it was schematically no. Of course, uh, you uh, you do not average over say realization of of the of the random noise, but it's just that you you say in a sense that that this NC that was uh, a parameter for this E snare like like here is is now uh, distributed according to uh, this uh, and and uh, so so it it's it would here in fact in in this model since this is linear it really comes down to to replace uh, let's say NC here by average NC and this is uh, analytic because it's linear okay so 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 what you end up with is, is just an average drift based on the equilibrium uh, distribution uh, and uh, so so this this is a kind of a, a reduced model and uh, since everything is analytic this is the expression for for this uh, for this landscape here so now let's take a look at, at the shape of this landscape so now uh, in on this slide there is just one snare so uh, what you see I in a dotted line is just the, the fusion uh, potential, so the same as before, this Gaussian. Uh, the F snare is, you see, it's, it's, it's like interpolating between the two parabolas, basically. So, uh, so that's the, the free energy uh, for the folding of, of a single snare. And uh, so the sum of the two is, is the red curve. Uh, Okay, so basically here you have one uh, state corresponding to, to the two membranes far apart and the snare is, is open. Here, uh, this, the second point, the, the membranes are very close together 
and uh, the snare is, is uh, folded and then um, and then you have to wait until uh, thermal fluctuations allow you to uh, to, 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 to go over this uh, fusion barrier so you see we have uh, two stages in this process the first one uh, is associated with overcoming uh, this barrier of the effective potential and the second one this barrier of the effective potential so uh, then you can use uh, classic uh, Kramer's uh, approximation for the escape rate from this state and this state and it depends exponentially on the, on the barrier and, uh, and okay there is a prefactor here that, that depends just on, uh, basically on the curvature here but this is, this is to, to mention that uh, uh, the end dependence so in the, in the previous slide uh, the, the, the effective landscape was basically this uh, e-fusion plus n time uh, the f snare. Uh, so, since it's all about n dependence, I just want to say that this uh, here uh, n is in here, but n is also in this uh, parameter. But the dependence is much less less stronger here. Um, now, how does this effective uh, landscape change when you when you change uh, n? So this is uh, the previous slide n equal one, but now if you increase n everything uh, coming from this f is proportional to n so you add this effusion that does, has nothing to do with n plus uh, this effective free energy that depends uh, linearly on n and well is pr proportional to n so the first barrier start to increase when you increase the number of elements while the second barrier decrease so the more snare you put the slower it gets to, to, to it, it takes more time to overcome this barrier whereas the second barrier is, uh, is can be overcome much faster and I, I'll explain a bit further so we can uh, say estimate how those barrier depend sorry depends on the on the number of, of elements and indeed uh, we end up with something that decreases exponentially with n and something that increases exponentially with n so one important uh, thing here uh, is, uh, is this parameter because the, the fact that there is a first barrier is intimately linked to the fact that here we have, we have a, a gap here, well gap, uh, a, a, a energy difference delta E. So if there were no this, this, uh, this guy or this, if this was not here, then this barrier would, would disappear automatically. Okay. So this barrier uh, has been uh, well measured so this is a recent paper where you see so the transition we're interested in is, is, is uh, again this one so it's between 4 and, and 2 so here there seem to be uh, a barrier so it's not very high but it's there and maybe there is even another one here so from those, uh, say, this reduced model where we simplify dynamics of the switching, we can uh, compute uh, escape rates and they match the, the simulations of the, of the, the full system. Um, so this, this is, uh, I, I maybe skip, well, so no, this is not very, well, this slide is, is uh, well, interesting. So it's just that our prediction so, uh, as I said, we, we have some leeway on the, 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 say the numbers that we put in the model, but basically the, 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 the main feature that we have a minimum uh, and an optimal uh, uh, cluster size is it's really a, a, a qualitative feature that, that, that uh, is robust uh, even if you, if you perturb uh, the parameters. And the number uh, here, you s for instance, you see the fusion barrier is, is, is uh, varied quite, quite large, but still the number is uh, of uh, the ult uh, optimal number is it doesn't vary much. It's, it's always below 10, basically. Okay. With, with but again, this this all uh, this is all because you have this uh, this uh, this intrinsic barrier inside. Now, the physical picture is is, is very simple. So our initial state, why do we have this, uh, this increasing or this uh, slowing down when we increase the number of, of, of snares? So suppose that your system is, so in, is, it is initially here, so all the snares are sitting nicely in a stress-free configuration. Now, if by chance one uh, element uh, switches, so it goes up here, so it switches at a given uh, y, and so here those guys are exert no force while this guy now has a high force 
So it tends to push uh, the, the whole crowd in, in this direction. But now here you have a lot of snares there and they are compressed. Okay? And since they are compressed, they exert a force that they want to go back to this, this resting state. So it's like you have a crowd and there is one guy say, okay, I want to vote for this, but if everybody uh, vote for that, then he will uh, count down. And uh, so it's like, a, it's, it's really a cooperative mechanism. Okay, so if he, he by, by, by changing state, is frustrating the crowd, but the, the crowd is stronger because there are a lot of elements there. So, but it's all because you have here this, uh, this kind of compressive part. So this barrier is very important. So similar, uh, uh, so this is just to, to, to say, uh, draw again a parallel with, uh, yeah, you had a question? No? Ah, uh, with, with the muscle. So in the muscle we have pretty much the same uh, setup, except that we have an additional spring that accounts for the elasticity of the filament. So that's uh, another ingredient that we could add our, in our model to to again have a, a lump stiffness of the of the membrane, so we, we do not uh, st we still put the snares uh, between two rigid plates, so they all share the same say deformation, but uh, there is an additional uh, rigidity for for the membrane. So the interesting thing I in this uh, system is that so here this this is a, a schematic for is for muscle. You have two states. So between A and B, A is uh, all the, the the proteins are open, and B uh, they are all closed. And uh, if this is infinitely rigid, okay, and, and I have to say here that you control the, the total length in, in just in this slide. If this is rigid, then they, there is no crosstalk between the elements because they are sitting between rigid bars and deformation is imposed, so they, they do whatever they want to do. And there is no, uh, there are only individual uh, transition barrier between the two states. While if this guy gets softer, then if one element, uh, say, switches, so it increases its force, then uh, it, it tends to, to pull this, okay? But since there need to be force balance, if force increase here, then the, the overall, the force of the other has to decrease to, to compensate, to, to maintain the force balance. The result is that if uh, this guy is, is a bit softer, it takes energy to, to, to move all the guys from A to B and you have this macroscopic barrier that emerges. It's exactly the same as in our system. The only difference is that in our system uh, there is no overall force or overall constraint applied so it's like this spring going to zero and uh, this is where you get the highest barrier basically. So in so in, in muscle, then you, the, 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 there is a, a phase transition. So everything here is can be mapped, in fact, into a Heising uh, model. But here, the, the, in fact, there is a phase transition uh, that depends on this uh, parameter, global elastic parameter. So this backbone, and uh, well, this this all so this whole thing has been studied carefully for for muscle. But since I'm already out of time, I won't I won't detail this. But uh, so at the end of the day, what we have is a, is a fusion as a two-stage process. Yes? So, so if I, I am. Yeah. So if, if I understood well, this is when there is some uh, signaling, like calcium signaling, no, here everything is mechanical. So, so here uh, every, uh, everything that happens is just after calcium. Okay, and, uh, because what, what is preventing this uh, cooperative mechanism between Wiesner in the absence of calcium? What, what is moving apart this energy barrier to prevent any... So, so uh, that's the role of the synatotagmine before calcium. So it's, it's, it's like there is a, it's like you have a, a handful of bistable device and intrinsically they want to, to do like this. But before fusion, you put a truss in between. That's the synaptotagmine that prevents them. So this, it's like you have an additional spring that, that, uh, that prevents the two membrane to, to, to come close. And uh, that's also an interesting uh, thing that can be added up to, to the system. So 
Okay, what, what I showed is that with, with this simple model, we can decompose uh, the, the fusion process with n elements in two stages. So you start from an unfused configuration, then you need to, uh, to have a cooperative uh, zippering of the snares, and that's the first process that brings you to an intermediate state where the two membranes are very close together. So the snares are pushing the membranes, and then once they are close enough, uh, the, 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 the fusion occurs by just uh, thermal fluctuations. But the more snare you have, the closer you can put the membrane together. So the, uh, the higher is this, uh, is this second rate, so that's the tau 2. But in order to synchronize a large number of units, you need more time. Because as I said, if one element uh, switch, then uh, the, the, it has a higher probability to move back to its previous state. So in order to have the, this collective uh, 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 zippering, they need to, to zipper all together. And, and this is a rare event if you have a large population. That's why this rate uh, decreases exponentially with n, while the other one increases exponentially with n. And our study says that, well, the, the, resu the result is that there, there is an optimal number of, of a few units. So I'll, I'll end uh, by, by using, uh, showing you two, two famous quotes that I, I, I love because I, I've been trained as a mechanical engineer and I entered this biology uh, like uh, feeling a bit uh, as a stranger, but in fact, this Andrew Oxley, uh, who was uh, okay, uh, these are two Nobel Prize winners, but they all say the same thing: uh, the mechanical engineering of living machines. And and, and Jim uh, says that when protein operates at the subcellular level, they behave in a certain way as if they were mechanical machinery. And here again. Uh, if you get to the nanoscale, the objects start to behaving as, as if they were mechanical. So this is all about mechanics. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, just I wanted uh, to comment because um, uh, with David, we, we did some modeling about also the fusion in um, influenza virus. And actually, uh, it requires four uh, proteins for the fusion. So but we obtained this number with a different theory. But, uh, but again, uh, there are more and more uh, proofs that uh, we need a lot of this influenza hemagglutinin to trigger the fusion between the virus membrane and the endosomal membrane. What, what, what is missing, you said? Uh, so the, the virus is covered by some proteins, which yep. are called hemagglutinins. Okay. And there are more and more um, experiments that shows that you need at, at least three, four hemagglutinin to trigger the fusion. So it, it was just uh, made me think about like uh, the cooperative uh, fusion machinery in different. So uh, the, the, these are not n not snares, but they work. In yes, the same but way. again, you need some cooperative uh, work between different motors to trigger the fusion. Oh. With a but in, in fact, in fact, this this model, uh, uh, like the, the say the Huxley or this two stage uh, two state uh, Ising type model uh, has been. Uh, well, in fact, it has been discovered many times or used many times on very, very different systems. Uh, two examples is the, the, the Bell model for, for the cohesion of, uh, of a bond. So it's, it's basically the same thing. So the, the, the rate for uh, debonding uh, an adhesive uh, patch in, is a, so you have two states, attach, detach, and uh, the detachment rate is proportional to the force. It's exactly the same uh, kind of model. In hair cells, also there are uh, calcium channels that are closed and opened by, by, by uh, uh, say, a spring. So uh, it's again a door uh, attached to a spring that can open, close, and again the same model has been has been used. So and and, and there is always uh, cooperativity behind because this the number uh, plays plays a major role there. And so, so I understand this four to six is uh, like the prediction of this model. Is that correct? So so experimentally, uh, people have looked 
in that direction to <laughs> to sort of verified or yeah so uh, so uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say uh, we are uh, no uh, in fact the the, the difficulty uh, uh, so the difficulty with with this is to prepare a system where you know how many elements so is to, to how many n do I have uh, but uh, uh, well the <laughs> I think it's, it's right yes we can we can say or <laughs> I don't know Fred yeah. if uh, I'm allowed to tell this yeah it's very yeah 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 tomorrow I try to present something where we hope we can Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really a, here. It's a prediction. Yes. Um, you said it's a prediction, but I, I thought you were showing us that you had calibrated the model yeah. to achieve this predict. Well, you you calibrated to achieve the right uh, time scale. Yeah. So I guess yeah. the number of snares is a prediction. Yeah, the number of snares is, is a prediction, but what uh, I, it's true that there, there is a calibration. We have buttons, and we know that we have to match uh, two two time scale. But but there are things that that I, I believe are are, are pretty uh, strong. Uh, it's uh, let's say here, for instance. Um, so so again, what you see here is the is the fusion barrier. So this height. Okay, you cannot play much with with this uh, this 30 kbt. I I, I think, but maybe uh, also from from the tweezer experiment, uh, you can uh, measure say this amount of energy because you you measure the force that's necessary to to unfold uh, the protein. So this also uh, the order the order of magnitude of of, of this uh, energy uh, difference. You, you know it now and also it's pretty accurate that you have seven nanometers from from here uh, to here because this is also measurements now uh, since you have this uh, delta e and here you go from uh, so since you have this delta e between the open and close then okay you can tune uh, the the stiffnesses but what happens here will be similar. So what you see here is when you arrive at that point, you are at 10 uh, kbt left, and to reach the 2, you see, well, here it's like, say, 5 kbt in some sense. So uh, this tells you that uh, as soon as you've given, uh, say, the, the size of this uh, energy difference, you know that, and you have, you know this distance. You know that at least a few kbt will be will be there, and to to reduce the to reduce the fusion barrier. So, uh, okay, th there is some fitting, but uh, it's it's all since you have here uh, uh, some force remaining, some energy remaining. If you if you multiply the number of snares, then you will multiply this uh, remaining energy, and and. Uh, so uh, and and the fact that you have let's say five, uh, then the, the 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 decrease of this barrier will be very fast, like the time scale because it's exponential. So if you have five, then uh, you just have to put one, two, three snares, and already you you get uh, you get a few orders of magnitude faster. So it's it's all because here you you have this this remaining force, and. Uh, uh, so the hypothesis is that this is there. Well, uh, of course, if the parabola that is here was here, then there would be no remaining force, and that would take uh, much longer. But this, so, so the fact that the, the picture, the overall picture, looks like this, or apparently looks like this, uh, that we are confident that with only a few units, it will get below the, the 100 microseconds. So there, there is some tuning, but. As soon as the main uh, parameters are there, maybe it may be, I don't know, 7, 8, but cannot be 20, for instance. It cannot. Just because you have to. No, I, I need to figure out. Thank you. No, uh, what is not totally clear to me how you um, develop your effective F snare potential? Because, I mean, you, you show that you have to, this two spring potentials, 
right? But then here you skip somehow w um, so one or the other parabola at, at one point. So how do you decide this? Do you look into two populations and match the populations, or how does it work? So uh, it's so here on if I, if I uh, had drawn. Uh, the, the two parabolas, that the initial uh, two, two, two levels of energy, one would be exactly here and the other one here. So there is, so in fact, the, 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 the exercise is the following. You have a fixed uh, distance and you have two stages because the, there were two, two parabolas. So at any uh, y, you have, a, uh, uh, you have two states. And uh, the probability to, to be in each of these states, I if it's equilibrium, can be computed analytically. Okay. And, and this is, uh, is, is directly related to, to, uh, to this landscape. So it's just, just basic uh, statistical mechanics computation. You have to, to build up the partition function, and here it's okay. all analytic. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's based on the assumption that the, the folding and folding yeah. is, is fast compared to the dynamics of, of this variable here. And uh, what I was wondering, so how temperature dependent your, your potential is? So I mean, are there any measurements about the fusion and uh, processes in terms of temperature dependent? Um, so I think the, the, there are two questions here. The, 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 okay, the initial potential, the two parabola, so we assume that there is some, some elastic parameter there. Uh, it's oh, it's very simplistic because it's just, uh, uh, but uh, it it can be uh, this elastic properties also can can uh, uh, come from uh, some entropic uh, like frustration uh, of of the of this uh, big molecule so that would give also rise to some repulsive force if they are too tightly uh, packed. Uh, so that's one physical origin, uh, maybe of, of those, and those would be affected by by temperature. And then for for experiment at different temperatures, this I, I, I cannot answer. I, I don't know. Um, and so, and a very last question. So the c collective behavior is mediated uh, by the membranes, right? So that the, the so that the snare proteins are all coupled to the same membrane, and then the forces there then have a collective effect. Yes. Basically, it is. The, the, the it's the so fact that they are they are they are all uh, attached so to the same backbone. Yes. So, but, so, so, but you do only think about planar membranes then in your in your model, right? Whereas in, in reality, yeah. the, way, with but the, the, the radius is would be radius so is large enough so that locally we can assume it's flat. Uh, or and, and and in fact, if they they form a ring, uh, like uh, like the, the say the azoline uh, would be would be. They would, they would, they would see the the, the same. Uh, well, it, it's it's not it's not completely uh, correct. But uh, if you if you see here, of the curvature is is way too large. Uh, uh, so 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 in fact, it's locally uh, around this ring is is is, is pretty flat. Uh, and even if it was not flat, uh, the the since the distance are are short. You can still assume that it's rigid, well, even if it's uh, if it's uh, if there is a curvature, because the 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 distance is so short, so they they there cannot be one guy uh, way below the other the other guy, like in terms of of uh, pulling the membrane. Uh, I don't know if it's clear, but. Uh so my question is uh, linked with the previous. Qu previous question about the synaptotagmin and calcium signaling. So I think experimentally they know that in the neural cell, for example, the about 15 molecules of synaptotagmin around the vesicle. So how would you link your number of N with the synaptotagmin if you would like to include it in the model? So, uh, so the, 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 okay, the, there is definitely some, some some questions about the, the structure, like uh, uh, the geometry of, of this machine, and how uh, you can map like uh, six snares with uh, 16 uh, synaptotagmin. So, uh, okay, the, the, there are works. Uh, this is the picture that I showed you with the, the structure of the ring. That was a paper that titled is Hypothesis in Feb's letter. So it's not crystal clear what the structure is. So there is a lot of work on that uh, currently, but. Uh, uh, and uh, the the other 
the, the interesting thing that I, I, I see in the, the role of C-datotagmin is really like if you let the system free here, at, at, at some time it, it will go there, okay? So, uh, so, it, so the synaptotagmin is preventing the, the, the zippering. And an interesting uh, question is that if synaptotagmin is not robust enough, then you would have some, some spontaneous uh, release, and this is observed. Uh, s but so, so you need to stabilize this system, and so how stiff the synaptotagmin has to be in order to prevent uh, a spontaneous uh, fusion uh, that would crash, basically, the, the synaptotagmin. So that's, that's interesting because uh, also uh, we can, uh, say, estimate the, the, the stiffness because if, if it's too soft, it, it will blow. Uh, if it's too rigid, uh, well, it will stabilize, but what is the limit? So that's, that's a question also, uh, uh, maybe we can link the stiffness to the number of synaptotagmin, and, but, but so far I, I don't know if there is a clear number, uh, like uh, three snares, uh, ten synaptotagmin. Or but the disruption of synaptotagmin is also, is also an issue because uh, calcium, I, I, I think that uh, two calcium can bind one synaptotagmin, right? Or or one to one, or so 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 here. If you want to release the, the if you want to release the, the, the pool of snare, uh, it's it's strange if you have to wait that ten calcium come and disrupt all the synaptotagmin. So probably one uh, is destroyed and then it destabilizes the the whole thing. So but then it's it's locally. So it would be like in our cluster, maybe one guy would see synaptotagmin uh, disappear, but the other the synaptotagmin would still be there. Uh, so this whole future development may be possible. Yeah. All right, so maybe last question before lunch. So um, I, I, I don't quite understand your model, but um, is the idea that if a snare is half zippered, that it is making it harder for other snares to zipper, or there's absolutely no resistance? I mean, the thing is that, you, you know, that the, the, the barrier to go from half zippered to zippered is nothing. Yeah, it's, it's very... Two, it's two KT, so it'll be, yeah. you know, um, overwhelmed instantly, yeah. uh, you know, almost instantly, right? So, you know, if you imagine a situation when you just have snares there, and nothing in between, nothing yeah. pulling the membranes apart, and, you know, you have, say, four which are zippered, and two are unzippered, I see no reason that the unzippered guys should in any way interfere with the zippered guys. I don't see how they should communicate. Uh, be because because the, the assumption of the model is yep. that uh, is is. Um I mean, the only thing resisting the um, membranes coming together is viscous resistance, and that's very tiny, and that gap will be closed really fast. Yeah. Much, much faster than any fusion time. Yeah. You know, which is, as you said, hundreds of microseconds. Yeah. So, so uh, okay. Uh, so, so it's true that the barrier to, to okay, to, if, if this is the picture, there is only one snare, then here there is only two KBT required to, to go, to close this. Okay, so the membrane would, would indeed uh, uh, drop by, uh, I don't know, seven nanometers or so, but it would happen quickly. Sure, sure. Uh, sure. Because the two yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think now, understand it, yeah. Now, if, if you have uh, uh, more snares, right. then, uh, for instance, um, okay, uh, this, this one is closed, so, so it, it, it's all linked to the fact yeah, that... Yeah, but I mean, there's no force pushing you upwards. There's a, there's a, there's a force balance issue here. Yeah, yeah. There is no force pulling you upwards. Yeah. There is not. No, no, no. No, no, no. What? No, the, the no, 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 no. Open snares. But, but, but I mean, this is the original point I'm making. That yeah, yeah. half zippered snares, I see no reason why they should interfere with the closing of this gap. So... Uh, you know, it's a zippered true, snare, you, you know, because here, if, you, here if you have a half zippered snare, yeah. what, what does that mean? That means there's um, a length of vamp, the V snare, which is unstructured. Yeah. And there's no reason to suppose that that should interfere with the membrane's ability to close down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, I mean, yeah. maybe maybe you should analyze that carefully, physically. What 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 interference that should have? That's that's a very particular hypothesis. I, I, I think there are two, two, two answers to that. One could be maybe it behaves a little like a polymer, the, the one that are transferred. And the second part is maybe the zero layer induces a, a small repulsion, which explains the, the fact that there is a barrier. And this repulsion. I'm sorry, the, you you you're talking about the hydration layer, Fred. Yes, yeah, sure. But I mean, hydration, you know, basically when the membranes come together, that's when they hit that hydration layer. No, yeah. No, no, it's, it's no, the zero layer of the, of the snare. Oh, so you... Inside okay. the snare, not, not yeah. linked with the barrier. But, 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 but that's precisely the barrier we're talking about, which is located at about the zero layer yeah, that's, of the that's 16, this, and that's 2KT. Yeah, that's 2KT. Yeah. But, I mean, which is essentially nothing. It's a okay. tiny little barrier. No. So that if you had a half zippered no. snare, you know, if you... If a half zippered snare sits there, it'll just spontaneously zipper yep. in, you know, whatever it is. No one yeah, really knows. It's never been measured, but presumably a microsecond or so. No, but they, they cannot right. do... Uh, it, it, it's true that <laughs> the, the thing is it becomes right. comes, uh, tricky when, when you increase the number. I, I agree with you. But, but, but that's exactly what we're discussing. Yeah. Whether there should be any influence of... Have, I mean, so Fred is proposing that it could be. I mean, it's an interesting suggestion, but then that's the essence of the model that it could be that the unzippered portions of VAMP are somehow interfering with closure of this, of, 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 of this okay. layer. I, personally, to, to me, that doesn't sound likely to be correct, but, you know, maybe it is. But, but then that becomes the essence of the model. So, so you know, why is there something preventing closure when no, you're wait, half-zipped? Wait, so there are two things. That's, that's so what you have to convince so there, there people is, about, yeah? Yeah, no, but right. is, so the, the, there is one thing is that uh, is this 2KBT present and, uh, and does it have a, a link uh, with some right. uh, structure or mechanical properties of, of, of the unstructured VAMP or, or so, so this 2KBT has, has to be linked with some uh, say structural or physical properties of the protein okay so, but if it's there and if it's even if it's 2KBT that's, that's the point then it, it, it uh, and if and the other hypothesis is that if this and this and all snares are sharing the same uh, distance, then uh, all what I said will happen. Like you qualitatively, it's there. <laughs> Maybe uh, we should continue this yeah, interesting okay. discussion yeah, yeah, afterwards. No, 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 yeah. For sure, for sure. That's the discussion we should have had on, on this meeting. Skype all right. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Let's thank all the speakers from this morning session. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation to speak at this meeting. And um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, energy efficient uh, information flow at uh, synapses in the brain and uh, how this uh, information flow relates to energy consumption. And uh, so my, there's going to be far fewer equations in my presentation than what we've seen so far, because usually uh, I present this work at uh, uh, conferences with a lot of biologists and also it's going to be at a more uh, a larger spatial scale so I'm not going to go uh, below the synapse somehow but it's more the cellular or, or network level uh, the work that I'm going to present today and okay so you can um, why are we interested about uh, energy in the brain uh, because the brain um, is a uh, often presented as an energy efficient device and uh, so you can see here this is a human brain and if you look at the biological literature you will find out that people who've quantified how much power it consumes end up with numbers that are about uh, something like 20 watts and so it's often being compared to um, uh, yeah this, which is more or less the amount of power that uh, incandes an old-fashioned incandescent light bulb would use and so this is often been uh, compared or matched to uh, the amount of uh, energy that a typical uh, desktop computer would consume, uh, which is uh, higher um, uh, even when the computer is idle. And, and also you can't really compare the performance or the capacities of the brain or this computer. I mean, this brain is meant to last you a lifetime, which hopefully is going to be several decades, uh, while this has a warranty for two years. And of course, there are many things that uh, your computer cannot do. So people typically say, OK, so the brain is a very uh, energy efficient computing device. But I think that it's actually the wrong angle to look at this question. Because in fact, uh, the brain is rather expensive from your body's perspective. And you can see uh, this illustrated here on this picture. So this is a, 
the torso of a, a, a male uh, who has received an injection of uh, this molecule here, fluoros, fluorodeoxyglucose, uh, which is radiolabeled by uh, fluoro18. And so that's how you can take an image of this. And uh, glucose is the molecule from which most of the energy is being produced in the brain. Um, and, so, and this molecule can't be really uh, metabolized, so it will just accumulate into the tissue to an extent or it's metabolized much more slowly. And so it allows you to actually quantify the, which regions in the body are consuming a lot of energy. And so you can see three areas here which are very strongly labeled. The brain, which indicates a high energy consumption. <coughs> Same thing for the heart. And uh, this is the bladder from which the radio tracer is being evacuated. So it doesn't indicate uh, high energy consumption in your bladder. Um, and so if you quantify these kind of images, what you get is that um, something like these numbers, so that the brain accounts for approximately 2% of the total body weight, but it's responsible for about 20% of, uh, of the whole body glucose utilization. And it's the same, the, roughly the same proportion for oxygen, and uh, the brain takes uh, something like 10% of the cardiac output. So you, the brain is you know, responsible for 20% of your baseline energy metabolism. And during development, these numbers get uh, are even more striking. So if you, there's this really uh, cool study from Kuzawa and colleagues where they basically measure this uh, percentage using a technique similar to that one um, across uh, developmental years. And you can see that the, the fraction of uh, uh, energy that is being consumed by the brain goes up to something like 70 or 80 percent at age five. So of course it doesn't uh, only indicate energy consumption due to uh, rezoning or to function, but there's also extensive remodeling of the brain tissue uh, in that time window. Um, and eventually in that study it kind of uh, plateaus at something like 20 percent. So the brain not only is expensive to operate, but it's also an expensive piece of machinery to build, if you like. And so this has led a number of people to uh, question whether this is uh, actually, or this was, uh, uh, this plays a role in, in behavior, or was that like an important factor during evolution? And there's actually a famous paper in the field, uh, which is called the expensive tissue hypothesis, uh, from people at UCL who published this in '95, and they came up with this idea that it was the advent of cooking that act actually allowed humans to develop larger brains. Because if you cook food, uh, you spend less mechanical energy chewing it, uh, and you also it's also uh, easier to digest chemically. And so they had this idea that uh, basically, the, 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 thanks to cooking, we could extract from more energy from the environment, and that all of that went to the brain. So now this, uh, the exact details of this theory are somewhat uh, uh, controversial. So it's not clear that it, it actually worked like this. So there, there are questions about the details, but there's no question about the fact that um, the humans have uh, large brains and that consume a lot of energy. And so if you want to be convinced that uh, energy consumption is important for brain function, um, I have two uh, examples. I like to present these two examples. So one is this paper from... Um, Fonseca Azevedo and Herculano Hausel. And basically what they looked at is um, how much energy uh, you need to fuel a certain body size and a certain brain size. And this typically, um, in all this, and, and they looked at this across different uh, mammalian species, uh, which are mostly uh, non-human primates. I mean, typically, uh, uh, all of these relations, they are usually some kind of power law. And so eventually they, they combine this um, uh, because you know, and they combine this with experimental data from how much energy you can extract from the environment by eating a raw vegetarian diet. And so they came up with this graph, which is a bit, a bit hard to read, but um, basically what, it, what this graph is showing is um, how many hours of feeding on a raw vegetarian diet you need to afford a certain body mass for different brain sizes. So you have a, uh, this, uh, this are increasing, these shades are increasing number of neurons. You have Baboons here with 10 billion neurons, orangutan 30 billion, gorilla somewhere here, and we humans we are sitting here with about 90 billion um, uh, neurons. And so this match um, behavioral da da data from gorillas, for instance, gorillas spend an immense amount of uh, hours every day just feeding on a raw vegetarian diet. And so you can you can appreciate what kind of uh, constraint it is on behavior um, to to be able to afford. Uh, such a large body size like we have uh, and such a large brain. And there's another uh, funny example, um, which is uh, the, the, in this paper from Densiger, which maybe you've heard of already. So basically, they, I think they, they collected data from um, um, 
the decision to release um, people on bail in Israeli courts. Um, and this is the proportion of favorable decisions. So I don't know if you have any idea. You can see that and this is plotted against this uh, ordinal position here, which is basically the time of the day. And you have two uh, big shifts here, which correspond to lunch <laughs> and to uh, the tea break. So if you ever need to be released uh, from jail one day, make sure that this happens immediately after lunch or ideally at the beginning of the day, because uh, otherwise you're, the probability of you being released drops from something like 70% to, to about zero immediately before lunch, which is really the... So, I mean, I hope I could convince you with this that somehow, you know, so the, the access to food and to uh, fueling, uh, energy, fueling energy to your brain somehow is, uh, is important for behavior. And to, to just to sum up, I mean, what I've shown you so far, uh, so the brain is, exp is uh, energetically efficient when you compare it to a man-made computing device, but uh, it actually consumes quite a bit of, of energy from your body's perspective. And um, it, this affects behavior. Um, and so the question is, really, where is all this energy being spent into the brain? And so I'm going to argue that um, it's being spent mostly at synapses. And uh, so uh, this is a cartoon from a paper we published uh, some years ago with Dave Atwell. And this is a summary of all the pieces of machinery that consume energy at synapses. And so it looks uh, awfully complicated, um, but in fact, uh, it boils down to uh, uh, relatively one main culprit who consumes most of the energy, uh, which is this uh, sodium potassium ATPS pump here. And so what happens is that typically you will have uh, ions flowing through the membrane, uh, typically sodium and calcium ions on the presynaptic side. And eventually all of that uh, uh, leads to an accumulation of sodium inside the cell. And you have to pump that out through this NAK ATPase. And the NAK ATPase pump three sodium ion out of the cell. It takes in two potassium ions and it consumes one ATP molecule per cycle. And on the postsynaptic side, um, it's basically the same thing. So you have uh, typically at a glutamatergic synapse, uh, glutamate will bind to AMPA and MDA receptors. This will lead to sodium and calcium accumulation inside the cell. Calcium is exchanged against sodium. So calcium is extruded through the sodium gradient. And at the, at the, at the end of the line, you have uh, basically sodium accumulating that needs to be pumped out. And this needs to be fueled by ATP, which is produced for, from mitochondria. And uh, yeah, sorry. They were, um, I mean, there's a microphone here. Sodium. Yes, I think you have a... Uh, so you're focusing on sodium. Uh, how much of a role does calcium pumping play in neurons? I mean, just to be put in the context of my talk yesterday, we put a lot of emphasis on the rise of calcium. So it's a good point, but I, th I think, as I said, I mean, uh, Calcium is extruded of, uh, using the sodium gradient. So you have sodium calcium exchangers. And so what the mechanism that really consumes ATP molecule at the end of the day is the NAK ATPase. Um, but what about the... Uh, but it does consume energy pump, indirectly, yes. Circa pump and the uh, plasma membrane pump, they consume ATP directly. Uh, that's a good point. I don't think we've really... We've really um, carefully evaluated that, yeah. to be, to be in, frank. In, so we, in islet cells, the sodium fluxes are very small. The sodium currents are small. So the calcium plays a big role. But in a neuron, which has big sodium currents, yeah, maybe I would, that's the dominant factor. Yeah, I would think so. Um, I, I cannot really answer uh, how significant it, the, the calcium would, play, would be. But it's, uh, I don't think it, it is a major contributor to, do, to energy consumption in, in, nerves, in nerve cells. Yeah, David had a question as well. Um, so, can you just be a little bit more quantitative? How long it takes for this uh, NAK ATPase to do the job of exchanging uh, compared to the time it takes for diffusion for, for, for sodium oh. or, or to, to be extruded? Uh, I don't know. It's a good, it's a good point. Um, I don't, I mean, so the, the, the modeling I've done on, on the NAK ATPase uh, shows that it's a rather slow mechanism. So I think it, it, uh, it operates at the time scales, which are typically tens of seconds in comparison to neuronal activity, which is much faster. And I think there's actually data where people have done sodium imaging in dendrites uh, from Christine Rose. And so I remember the data, but I cannot remember. 
I cannot remember with what time time constant, for instance, the sodium is is uh, being extruded or diffusing out of the. Maybe you know this this paper from Christine Rose. I I I've, I can't tell you okay. out of out of. But, but but okay, because there is this time scale and also the numbers. The the question is, it is packed. It is the, for example the dendritic spine packed of this uh, NKTPAs? If, for example, it takes a long time to be extruded, maybe this is compensated by the fact that you have many. Is it, is it documented? Um, I really don't know. I'm okay. Sorry. Yeah, okay. I have no idea actually. Oh, there were more questions. Okay. Uh, so um, you. you you speculated that that time scale that David asked might, might be tens of seconds. I, I shouldn't pin you down on a, on a number. No, You're it's okay. I, I, think, I think it's just, uh, I don't think that this is a process that, has a, that is extremely rapid, right. that is extremely I mean, fast, really, if, in comparison if, to the rest of neuronal activity. But, but for example, if we look at um, the, uh, the, the presynaptic situation, so sodium needs to get pumped out. Um, mm. if, it, if it were to take tens of seconds, say, I mean, or seconds, doesn't that mean, uh, sorry, this is a very ignorant question, doesn't that mean that the next action potential is going to have a problem if it arrives too fast, or that, um, I mean? What they, they sometimes do, but I don't think that it's because of uh, sodium, because I think that, I'm not sure that whatever sodium comes in at presynaptic terminals is going to change the gradient of sodium that much. So, in terms of, for instance, driving the action potential, the, the driving force across the membrane is probably going to be the same. I think it's more likely the it pool of presynaptic vesicles and... Why is it not affected by the presence of the sodium? Because it's spread out into a relatively large volume, is that yes, the idea? Yes, and I think, I think the yeah. concentration doesn't I change see. very drastically. I, I see. Right. Okay, so you... you um, so, you can, you can try to quantify... Uh, how much energy is being spent in these structures. And uh, so there's, uh, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, so there was one way that was uh, pioneered by David Atwell, uh, which um, eventually leads you to this kind of graphs. So I'm not going to detail this, but I mean, you can, uh, you can try to evaluate basically how many ATP, ATP molecules are being consumed for each process um, per vesicle. And so the, the way you do this is trying to, it's a lot of uh, trying to figure to estimate parameters and to do a detailed accounting of uh, uh, how much basically how active each one of these processes are and so the, the conclusion from this is that essentially you can see that there are two bars here that are uh, the amount ATP consumed per glutamate vesicle for NMDA and non-NMDA receptors and so basically the most of the energy is being spent uh, at the presynaptic terminal at the postsynaptic terminal sorry um, and to repay for the ion flows across the membrane that drive the postsynaptic potential. So this is really the uh, direct signaling. And so as I said, there are different ways of doing this, um, and you can try to make a, a, a different uh, energy budgets for the brain with different level of details. Um, but eventually you get more or less to the, the same conclusion, uh, no matter which, uh, what starting point you take, which is that about 60% of the energy that is spent in the brain seems to be uh, spent at uh, synaptic connections. And so this is basically activation of postsynaptic receptors, and there's also some energy that is being spent to pay for uh, the presynaptic calcium and uh, uh, recycling of glutamate. So keep that in mind. I'm going to make a little detour now, uh, so you can because uh, this is not the whole story. You can see here that there is these cell uh, astrocytes, which are uh, a type of glial cells, and they are responsible for taking up uh, glutamate. Uh, and recycling it and eventually uh, sending it back to uh, the presynaptic terminal and this also consumes ATP and so this is one of the main drives for whatever happens beyond synaptic activity in terms of brain energy metabolism and so unfortunately I, I didn't realize that this might be of interest to people here so otherwise I would have spent more, more on this but if you are interested we have uh, two papers on this and one uh, really that just came out where we are uh, doing um, we trying to establish a, a a workflow to do uh, a 3D reconstructions of astrocytes, uh, blood vessels, and neurons, and to try to integrate uh, these, these questions of energy metabolism in very detailed biophysical models. And uh, another detour is that there is some fraction of energy in the brain that is spent on uh, non-signaling, um, which I'm not going to talk about, but we did a, a detailed experimental quantification of this, and so if you're interested, you can look up that paper. Okay, so um, 
let me come back now to synapses. So as, as I said, synapses seem to be consuming quite a bit of energy, uh, but it's a bit strange in a way because um, they don't seem to be particularly reliable. And I'm just going to pick up two examples of this. Uh, for instance, one is that the release probability at synapses can be relatively low. So the release probability is the probability that a vesicle is being released from the presynaptic terminal when you have an action potential. Uh, so whether or not you have actually an electrical signal that is propagated uh, across the chemical synapse. And uh, there's an example here. This is a paper from uh, uh, colleagues who were at UCL some years ago. And they measured that in uh, neuron cell cultures using an optical method. And you can see that, uh, okay, so this is number of observations, and this is the release probability they observed in these cell cultures. And you can see that this is something like 20, 30%. So it means that you go to the, to the trouble of generating action potentials, and uh, something like 70% of the time, this action potential is not being relayed across the synapse. And there's uh, another uh, data set which is quite interesting, uh, which are, uh, the action potential is being relayed at thalamic relay cells, in the, mostly in the visual pathway. So the basically, action potentials come, go from the retina to the thalamus, and then uh, there's a synapse at the thalamus, and then they are being relayed to the visual cortex. And then when you look at uh, experimental literature, you find out that uh, the, ma the majority of action potentials are actually not being relayed at the so-called relay synapses. And so this, here we have an average uh, that we say is 23% across these studies. This has to be taken with a grain of salt because this is uh, for different species um, and also across different anesthetic levels. And in general, uh, if the animals are more weak, uh, this number tends to increase. But still, uh, so you have uh, this seemingly discrepancy between the fact that um, Synapses do use a lot of energy, but uh, they don't seem to be working fantastically well in terms of uh, uh, transmitting information or not very reliably. So we wanted to try to understand if we can reconcile these two, these two facts. And so I didn't pick these examples uh, by chance. So I, I'm going to uh, spend some time, uh, just a few minutes now, explaining some work we did on that and trying to show how you can uh, quite find the, uh, that essentially energy and information seems to be in balance or there seems to be a trade-off between these two quantities. Um, and so, okay, so this chemical neurotransmission is, as I said, is a stochastic process and it has a relatively low probability, typically 20 to 40 percent. So this is one data set, but there are other data sets out there that basically show the more or less the same thing. Um, and so what we did is to uh, look at this question in a very naive model of information flow at, at uh, cortical synapses where you have usually an axon makes more than one connection uh, onto uh, postsynaptic dendrites. And so if you do that, I'm, I'm not going to give you too many details about this because it's a very basic information theory model. There's actually no neuronal model uh, and you can calculate exactly uh, what, you, what you find out. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, j just to be sure to understand, so this is a probability per vesicle, per action potential? Uh, per presynaptic terminal, per action potential, yeah. Okay, so, so this is uh, because there is a pool of uh, synaptic vesicles can, that can be... Yeah, but at most cortical synapses you have a single release site, so it, it's whether there is something is released or not, basically. Yeah, but I think you do have to divide it. is a lot of sport. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, uh, as, as I remember, in those neurons, there's about three, approximately three vesicles, it's thought, per, um, per active site, so that you would actually divide that number per, by three to get the per vesicle value. Or three or two or you know whatever the number is in, in that specific paper, yeah, you yeah. Mean, uh, possibly. I mean, yeah. and and this, uh, I mean, if yeah, you look, so it's at even smaller per, mm. per vesicle. Mm. Um, okay, but I mean, if you if you look at this in a very naive model of uh, information flow uh, at across synapses, what essentially you find out that if you want to maximize information flow, uh, the trivial solution is that you want a release probability that is close to one, obviously. Uh, but if you, if you calculate not the information flow, but the uh, information that is spent per uh, uh, molecules of ATP, uh, uh, sorry, the information per molecule of ATP that you need to spend on, on powering this, this system, you typically get a, a curve like this. So I'm, I'm going to come back to that, uh, how we get there. 
uh, in the next example. And so you can see that um, uh, this seems to be the optimal energetic design somehow. So it's not very efficient in terms of uh, information transfer, but it maximizes uh, bits of information per ATP molecule. And um, so we, we argue that this is maybe the reason why, or one of the reasons why uh, the, the system is organized in that way. And with this very naive example, uh, we could actually make an interesting prediction. So if you, sorry, if you uh, look at this curve, so this will depend uh, on the number of release sites you have. And so you can calculate this curve for different numbers of release sites. And as I said, if you have a single release site, I mean, the trivial solution is that you, you need a, a very high release probability if you want to be effective. But you can, it, it gets better somehow uh, uh, with an increasing number of release sites. So you can try to make a prediction of what would be the optimal release probability versus the number of release sites. And there's actually a data set from Oxford that is in the literature uh, where people, they've actually measured that. Uh, so you can see it here. It's from this paper from Ardingham and colleagues. Uh, and what they find out is that you have a, in some of an inverse relationship between, even though they fitted that with a line here, um, um, between the number of release sites and the release probability that is the uh, x-axis here. And so what we can do basically is to take this data, although I, I, I switch the axis here, and uh, try to plot basically what would be our prediction of the optimal uh, uh, release probability. And this is the red line here. Uh, so basically, this red line is the peak of the cons the peak of these consecutive curves for different number of uh, release sites. So I mean, okay. So we get some kind of a decent explanation for for this experimental data. And so as I said, we did we did that in a very uh, a very basic model so we were try we were interested in trying to see if we can reuse this idea in a, in a experimental context and with a more serious biophysical modeling and so we went to this uh, next example i was uh, presenting earlier which uh, is uh, thalamic relay cells and it turns out there is a, a way to study that in vitro um, from, no, we shouldn't say relatively easily but there's a way to study that in vitro uh, and this is using uh, certain preparation uh, which I'm going to show before, but uh, afterwards. But essentially, the experimental we use uh, are rat brain slices, and um, why? We, and we look at uh, this synapse that is located here. And the circuit is that you have the retinal ganglion cells project onto this uh, thalamic network here, and then uh, the relay neurons, uh, which are excitatory cells in the thalamic network, then project onto the visual cortex. And there are some other bits in the circuit. And the, the reason why this is interesting is that uh, it's, a, it's not like a cortical synapse. It's a very large uh, synaptic appendage that has hundreds of release sites. And you have a one-to-one -one connection. So one retinal ganglion cell projects onto one uh, thalamic relay cell that then projects onto multiple layer four spiny stellate cells. So you have like a, a relatively simple circuit there in comparison to what you find in the cortex because this guy is, uh, uh, is receiving only one single input from the retina and then projects or sends that away to the visual cortex. Um, and so you can study that in this preparation uh, by, that was designed by Turner and Salt. So this is a rat brain. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this, so the eyes would be somewhere on the sides here. The, sna the nose is here. Uh, this is the cerebellum and you have two, two hemispheres left and right and so you do a you do a cut there's a way to cut this brain or to slice this brain uh, so that you preserve the axons that come from the retina the dentate lateral geniculate nucleus which is the structure in the thalamus that contains these neurons and then the piece of cortex that matches uh, uh, that part of the dlgn so as i said the easy way it's actually not very easy because it's a you have to you have to imagine you have a piece of gooey brain here that you have to uh, with your hands and a, a scalpel blade uh, cut at uh, these angles here it's maybe difficult to read but i mean it's quite uh, it's quite difficult to get the cut right basically and so you can do a lot of experiments and you get one cell a day or two cells a day from for, from which you collect data that you can use so we, we looked at this and basically what we are going to do is to extra, extracellularly stimulate uh, the axons that come from the retina, patch one of these neurons and then look at uh, information flow and energy consumption in, 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 in that cell. Um, and we make, there is a way to be uh, really sure that you are patching from the correct cell. Uh, so these cells express this IH current. Um, they display pair pulse depression, so the, post the consecutive postsynaptic potentials 
are are much smaller. Uh, so if you if you trigger uh, two pulses or two action potential consecutively after 100 milliseconds, you can see that you lose something like 60 percent of the amplitude, and this is presumably due to the fact that most of the vesicles have been or a lot of the vesicles have been used for the first action potential here. This is how it looks under uh, a basic optical microscope. And then we dial down the uh, amplitude of the input from the stimulating electrodes to make sure that we stimulate a single fiber. Um, and the circuit design is, is uh, as I mentioned, is like this. So you have inputs coming from the retina. They project onto this uh, local circuit of uh, interneurons and thalamic relay cells. And then these guys project to the visual cortex. There's also descending input from the visual cortex. So in order to make this a bit simpler and to isolate that one synapse here that we want to study, what we do is that we uh, basically remove physically the cortex to remove descending input from the cortex. We use gabazine, which is an agent that blocks uh, these inhibitory synapses here. And we use uh, adult rats to make sure that uh, this is a single connection here because there's a during development, there is a competitive process to innervate dendrites from these cells from the retina. Uh, so uh, after P28 means 28, 28 days postnatal, at which point this developmental phase is should be over. And then so we record from we use electrophysiology to record from that cell, and so what we get is data that looks like this. So we play TTL pulses uh, and. And the, the statistics of this input, we, we actually got data that were recorded in vivo in rodents. So we think that this has the correct statistics. And you can see the synaptic currents that are being generated here. Uh, these vertical bars are stimulation artifacts that we remove uh, after the experiments. So they basically picked up the stimulation from that we play here. And so the synaptic current is the noisy, fat black line that you can see here. And if you record that in, in current, if you record that cell in current clamp, uh, instead of recording the transmembrane current, you can record the membrane voltage. And this is typically how it looks. And again, you have this stimulation artifact here. And so what we are going to do is to basically use uh, these kind of recordings to measure how much energy is being spent on synaptic communication, because we can basically integrate these currents, uh, do a little bit of maths and biophysics, uh, and then uh, basically evaluate how many sodium ions no needs to be pumped out and divide this by three uh, for because the, ATP, the NAK ATPase uses one ATP molecule to pump three sodium ions out. And so we can convert this into basically how much ATP does it need to, to pay for this synaptic communication. And then we are going to use uh, information theory to measure how much information is flowing from that sequence of TTL pulses to that uh, output voltage. So we binarize these traces here and here, and we use uh, mutual information to measure information flow from the input to the output. And there's a specific technique to do that. Um, I can go back to that afterwards. So I guess this is now in the preparation, right? When you do this experiment, you have a specific preparation? Yes. Where yes. You, you have added ATP in the preparation, or you do add ATP? Uh, in the patch pipette, yes, the patch because it's the standard uh, thing standard. that everyone is... No, no, should yeah. I understand. Yeah. So it's a lot of ATP, by the way, I think. It's like people typically add a 4 millimolar of ATP in the patch pipette, which okay. I think is probably higher than what you get normally in, in neurons or glial cells in the brain. Okay, so I see. So, so it would not be accurate to just diminish the amount of ATP that you are perfusing to address the question of, of if suppose you have zero ATP, do you still have this pattern uh, of it's response? A, it's a good point. We didn't do that. You, you can do that. So you can, you, you have different type of uh, internal solutions uh, when you use in that you use in electrophysiology and you can deplete uh, the ATP store. Uh, we didn't look into this. The thing is that there, there, is a, there are, it, it's not, it, it doesn't sound like a difficult experiment to do because it's a, it seems like a relatively basic uh, electrophysiology experiment, but the preparation is quite tricky and then you need a lot of time to uh, get enough data to actually be able to use mutual information. And uh, to be frank, we didn't quite get there. So I mean, it, it's, there's a big limitation from the information theory's perspective. And so it limits the number of options you have 
uh, per cell, for instance, if you want to carefully evaluate all of this. But it's a good point. I mean, that could, that's good, that would be an interesting experiment to do, to see how, how the thing is that you would have to compare across cells because you wouldn't be able to patch the one cell and then switch off ATP because if you patch and you, you have access, then you will, have, you will flood the cell with, uh, with uh, you will have a point source of uh, high ATP concentration, basically. Okay, so we, we, we do this um, and we collect this experimental data and then we apply a dynamic lamp because the idea is to modulate what well, the question we want to address is to whether the gain of the synapse okay, can you change how much information is flowing if you change the gain of the synapse uh, basically how many postsynaptic receptors there is and, and would, that, would that be is there a, can you make the synapse more reliable uh, in terms of transmitting action potential how much, information, how much uh, energy would that cost and so in order to do this um, it wasn't really possible to do that pharmacologically, uh, so we, we use dynamic lamps. So basically we record these uh, uh, synaptic currents, we convert that into the corresponding synaptic conductance, and then you can scale that up or down offline and replay that using a dynamic lamp system. And so when you just replay the synaptic conductance, uh, you get, a, so this is the actual recording that was triggered by this extracellular stimulation. And this is if you replay the same synaptic conductance, you can see that the spike train are very similar. And when you scale up or down the synaptic conductance using dynamic lamp, you will have uh, much more action potential. For instance, here, if you make the synapse three times uh, bigger, or not physically bigger, but with uh, currents that are three times bigger, or much fewer action potentials. This is the blue trace here, if you just divide the synaptic conductance by two. So now we are finally ready to do this experiment we wanted to do initially. And so what we do is to basically, first thing is to compare. So this is just control to, to see what happens uh, when we play the real simulation or when we use dynamic lamp with the same physiological gain of the synapse and we get the uh, same, uh, same amount of energy or information, uh, information flowing through or energy consumption. Um, and this is how the information looks like. So this is experimental data. Here we are modulating the gain of the synapse using dynamic clamp and, and this is normalized uh, information flow uh, because we have to compare uh, across different cells. Yes? Uh, just to be sure to understand, so the, uh, what you call the dynamic uh, clamp, so this is a voltage clamp when you increase the voltage to get like saturation in current? Uh, no, dynamic clamp is a technique where you, you alternatively record the transmembrane voltage and current. I mean, it's a way to simulate a conductance rather than a current, if you like. I mean, we could have played it. Uh, Maybe I can explain that to you later. I mean, essentially what it does is that you, instead of having a current clamp or a voltage clamp, it alternates and then it's, it simulates injecting a conductance rather than injecting a current. Okay, so what you can see across all these cells we recorded um, is that you can, you, this is the physiological gain of the synapse at one. And you can see that if you, dimini, if you decrease the amplitude of the synaptic conductance, you decrease the amount of information that flows through, but you can also increase it, and you can increase it quite a bit. So you could actually multiply by four the amount of information that would flow through this synapse. And if you look at the raw numbers, not the normalized values, you will find out that this was, this 400% here was somewhat uh, very close to the amount of information we actually injected that is contained in the input uh, train of uh, action potentials. And so this tells you that this synapse uh, clearly is not uh, tuned to maximize information transfer. Uh, so it drops a lot of action potentials at the, and, and that are not related to the visual cortex. And it's not there to basically uh, send all the information through. Um, and if you look at the energy consumption uh, while doing the same procedure, it's uh, rather boring. So it's essentially linear because if you multiply by five the amplitude of the synaptic conductance, you usually get almost uh, times five uh, amount of ions flowing through, so you have five times bigger current. And so you, it's not exactly linear, but it's uh, very close to being linear. And so you can see uh, probably where this is going. Now, if you don't measure uh, how much information in bits per second is flowing through and energy separately, but if you calculate the average over how much information flows per energy consumed, uh, you get a curve that looks like this. So this is basically 
uh, now bits per ATP molecule. Again, it's normalized because we have to uh, measure across different cells. Um, and this is including only the energy that is being spent on uh, paying for the ions that flow through uh, the, during the uh, for postsynaptic currents basically and you can also include the cost of action potentials but it doesn't uh, quant uh, it doesn't qualitatively change the result so it suggests that actually this synapse is is energetically optimal in terms of information how much information is flowing so it's not trying to send everything up to the cortex but it's actually m kind of um, uh, finding the optimal trade-off in terms of how much uh, information flows per energy consumed. And that doesn't mean that this is the only reason why the action potentials are being dropped there. Because people have argued in the past that uh, the, the, the way the, the, the synapses, they do some kind of uh, filtering so that uh, uh, irrelevant information is not being sent to the visual cortex. But what's interesting is that uh, it's not incompatible with, with our finding here. It, it looks like maybe they are doing some kind of filtering uh, that would be optimal in, information, in terms of information processing, but it's also uh, metabolically clever in the sense that it maximizes the information per energy that is being spent. And so if you are interested in looking into this, we actually have a, a hodgkin oxley model that we've painstakingly um, uh, designed and, and fitted onto our experimental data. Um, that reproduces uh, quanti uh, qualitatively and to an extent quantitatively all of these experimental results. And uh, let me just, yes. <laughs> uh, and the reason why we did this is because there was one thing that we couldn't really address experimentally, which is that these uh, postsynaptic receptors are, they, they are both MPA and NMDA receptors. And NMDA receptors have a nonlinear IV relation, unlike MPA receptors, which we couldn't really deal with in an elegant way experimentally because it was too complicated. And so eventually we did, uh, we, we calibrated the model and we, we ran simulations to see what, what difference it would make. And the difference it makes is that you can see here essentially, uh, so non with a nonlinear IV relation, the NMDA receptors, so it's a, if you have nonlinear uh, NMDA receptors, is, this is in pink here. Um, you get a higher energy consumption at very high gains and so the the way it changes these curves is by making it more sharp okay correct so you you say so that the synapse is optimized for this information per energy the transmission so but how does it, how is it optimized so i mean in terms of the molecular content or what is the what is the mechanism to optimize over that uh, it's a very good question if you can wait for five or ten minutes I no. will, okay <laughs> I don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a definitive answer, but I have an hypothesis. Because energy consumption is something that is very, um, uh, how to say, um, it is very um, important to the cell. And there's a vast machinery there to make sure that if the ATP levels are falling down, something is happening to, you know, to, to, uh, to make sure that the neurons is not going to die from running out of energy. But of course, information theory is a bit more of an abstract concept. So I think, and you, you have to wonder how the cell, how does the cell know that this is the right size of uh, synaptic conductances in terms of information theory. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to answer that question later. Okay, so, um, in that part of the talk, well, basically what I showed you is that you, you, we were interested in trying to find out um, uh, if you can explain low release probability, uh, which is uh, definitely a presynaptic question, uh, if you can explain low release probability using a combination of information theory and, and energy metabolism. And what we find is that uh, basically, yes, uh, low release probabilities seem to uh, maximize the amount of information that is transmitted per energy consumed. And we have now a similar result of at, at thalamic relay cells that we could we could reproduce uh, in a, that we found in experiments, but we could also reproduce in a in a, a biophysical model. And 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 you can see that these curves they look uh, very similar, even though we asked a question about the re the presynaptic aspect here and and kind of a postsynaptic aspect here. And in fact, uh, there's there's uh, nothing really mysterious. There's a very basic uh, uh, physical uh, process here at the core that explains why these curves, they all look the same. It's usually because if you look at the energy consumption, if you, whatever parameter you modulate that modulates energy consumption or information flow, you will find out that the relation between uh, energy consumption and that parameter is usually kind of linear. So if you double the size of the synapse, you get double, uh, double as many ions that you need to pump out. Um, 
while the relation between uh, information flow and what, whatever that parameter is, is usually a sigmoid because there is some level of noise that you need to overcome to actually transmit something or you need to invest uh, a minimum amount of energy to reach the threshold for uh, action potential initiation. And so you can spend energy with small uh, postsynaptic potential, for instance, and not transmit any information. And so basically, uh, the, 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 in the end, when you divide a sigmoid by a, a linear relation, you will always end up with a curve that more or less looks like this. And I think that's basically the basic reason why uh, this, seems to be, to, this seems to be the case in, in, in both cases. What's interesting is that uh, biology seems to have found the optimal point in, in, in both these curves. Okay, so um, for the end of my talk, so there, there are two, uh, two questions um, that, uh, okay, I'm gonna go through this quickly. I mean, basically, the, the one question is whether this happens at other synapses, because as I said, this is uh, not a typical synapse for that, uh, not your typical cortical synapse, it's a very large synapse. And the other one is uh, whether there is a better metric than mutual information. Um, and okay, I'm gonna deal with that point quickly. Uh, the answer is yes, there's, there's a prob potentially an issue with uh, uh, information theory in neuroscience. That is that the time that you have for data collection is really a, a, an issue. And if you are familiar with uh, using information theory, you will know that you need vast amount of data to, to not to have biased results. And so uh, information theory has been used for a long time in neuroscience already uh, in the years of Ubel and Wiesel. So you can use it in in vivo preparation or in in vitro preparation like we did uh, in the results I've just shown before. One of the issues is that here, for instance, you have no direct access to bi the biological system. So it will be very difficult to investigate detailed questions or to do pharmacology, for instance. Uh, the good point is that you, if you have a weak or anesthetized animal, you can potentially have very long recordings. Um, if you do this kind of preparations, uh, you have direct access to the biological system, so you can ask much more detailed or specific questions. But the sample has a limited lifetime because essentially it's a dying piece of tissue. And so the question, and so it, it's always a bit of an issue. I mean, even in that case here, um, um, you know, the performance of the animal can be modulated by attention or the anesthetic state can be modulated over long periods of time. So there's also the question of whether you are measuring from the same system really. Um, and so that's what uh, one of my PhD students is looking at. And so we, we are looking at this uh, other metric transfer entropy. And uh, basically just to, to, as a teaser, I want to show this. Uh, you can see here, um, Basically, mutual information, if you m measure mutual information between uh, binary sequences, and you, you, you will know that um, if you have too small of a data set, you have a tendency to overestimate mutual information. So what you see here is uh, we have a target, which is the theoretical value we should obtain, which is the dotted line at the bottom here. And this is essentially the size of the data set. And this is how mutual information evolves with the size of the data set. And you can see that uh, you, you need uh, quite a lot of repetitions of the same input, it's uh, related to the method we use to evaluate mutual information uh, uh, before you actually converge anywhere close uh, to this. And transfer entropy seems for a reason we don't really have a fantastic explanation for yet uh, to be much better. So uh, we think that uh, this is an interesting practical result in information theory that for neuroscience transfer entropy seems to be uh, a better metric to use uh, not based on fundamental reasons really, but basically because it, it gets to close to the correct response uh, much faster in terms of the size of the data set. So this might be a better choice if you are dealing with experimental data. Um, but okay, so now one of the questions we are really uh, interested in, in trying to address is whether neuromodulators affect this relationship I was uh, presenting before. Why is that? Because at this uh, uh, thalamic, re at this uh, uh, relay synapses, um, the, the pair, pair, pair pulse depression can be modulated by serotonin. And you can see here uh, experiments from Seborg. So this is the postsynaptic current. So this is the same preparation than we used. And you can see here the initial, uh, so this is without any serotonin. So you can see here the initial response is very big and then you have a very strong depression. So the subsequent responses are much smaller and the current is plotted as negative by convention. And so you have a large response and then it eventually slowly recovers. And uh, when you apply a, a serotonin analog that binds to one of the serotonin receptors, it decreases the amplitude of the first response, but the, the subsequent responses are much uh, they are much, uh, they are essentially in the same range. 
And so what we found out when we were looking at this uh, relation between information flow and gain of the synapse is that when you apply serotonin, it actually increases the amount of information that is flowing through the synapse. And it doesn't cost more energy because what it does, uh, and this is not necessarily obvious from this, but this is what comes out of the data, is that it redistributes the ion flow over time uh, and, and just uh, doesn't seem to change the overall amount of ions that flow uh, with, a, with a typical uh, stimulation that we used. And so we, we are trying to, we are interested in trying to figure out if serotonin uh, really modulates this relationship between information and energy. And, trying, and the question we would like to address is whether neuromodulation adjusts the synaptic properties to reach some form of optimality for different input statistics. And this is work we've uh, essentially just started using the model I was mentioning before. Uh, uh, okay, so then quickly, does it happen at other synapses? This was actually a question we had from reviewers. And so we went to that next synapse here in the visual cortex. So this is the synapse between these thalamic relay cells and layer four spiny stellate cells. And uh, uh, we addressed this in uh, two different preparations. So we did multi-compartment neuron simulation. So this is uh, like a very large biophysical model of this layer four spiny stellate cells. And we also did uh, experiments. And to make a long story short, so this is how this uh, typical reconstructed layer four neuron is, is looking like. It receives inputs from many different synapses. And we, we are trying to find out if we can uh, modulate the amplitude of that synapse and, and how does it change energy uh, consumption and information flow from that synapse to the output of that cell. And it does change the output of that cell, so this is what is plotted here. So if you, uh, so this is the same simu random simulations with a lot of background input, and then when you switch on these uh, purple synapses here, you can see that it changes um, uh, the, the train of uh, action potential that is generated in the output, not by much, but occasionally there will be uh, an additional action potential or the time of the action potential will be shifted uh, or delayed a bit. So there is something, there is definitely some information flowing from this guy to the output of that cell, even though now we are in the cortex, there is a lot of background input bombarding this cell, this cell constantly. So to make a long story short, uh, I'm gonna go very quickly through this. I mean, we find the same relation. So there's a sigmoid relation between the gain of that synapse and the amount of information that flows through a linear relation between the gain of the synapse and the amount of energy that is being spent. And uh, when you look at the relation between those two, uh, no matter how you compute the energy, uh, you basically get a very similar uh, peak shaped. And, and the, va the value at which it peaks is very close to uh, the, the value you will find in the literature for the, the, pr the proper synaptic uh, conductance for, this, uh, for these synapses, which is very different now than what we had before. So it's a much smaller synapse. And uh, we have the same thing in experiments, although in experiments it's a bit less clean because uh, this was a, it's, n it's a much more complex circuit, so it's much more difficult to address experimentally in a clean way, uh, unlike what we had done before. So we have somewhat linear relationship between the gain of the synapse and energy consumption, and we have some kind of the beginning of a sigmoid and eventually this collapses here, but there is some, there's some reason uh, why that happens because we have to inject all the conductance at the cell body. So we cannot do the same kind of uh, distributed stimulation that we do in the simulations. So I think this is one example where uh, you, you, you reach the limits of what you can do in experiments and where simulations, I think, are better. Um, so now I go, I go back to your question, uh, how do we get there? And um, so I think that it has to be a local uh, plasticity learning rule that leads to this optimum because they, it cannot be that the cell is informed about how much information is flowing long distances. So I think it must emerge, uh, it must have emerged from another mechanism. Um, and so we, this is the work of my postdoc. So we are, we are uh, actually uh, investigating this in uh, simple uh, uh, network models and we use this uh, OAKS process with RESET. And the, the question we want to address is how do you make sure that this network is uh, maximizing mutual information between inputs and outputs uh, and we add an uh, energy component to it. So we want to try to minimize how much uh, energy is being spent by that network to achieve that goal. And so we derive learning rules as a gradient descent. And so this is very preliminary results, but essentially what we get, so you could already reproduce something that looks, so this is a half of the STDP window, essentially. So that would be uh, the synaptic weight modification. Um, and uh, depending on the relative timing between the input and output action potential, and that would be the right half of the spike timing dependent learning window, except that there is now a negative 
uh, term here or a negative part of this branch here that is induced by this uh, energy term. So if you remove it, you get back to the original uh, half STDP window. And so we think that, um, I, well, I think that this is how it works uh, essentially. That uh, it must be uh, emerging from a plasticity rules, but we are not uh, quite sure yet. Um, okay, so uh, take home message. So I showed you that the brain is energetically expensive, um, that the majority of the brain's energy is being spent, is used for signaling and mostly as synapses. Um, Okay, so I can skip this because I didn't talk about it. Uh, I showed you that synapses are unreliable in the, sometimes in different ways, but that this seems to maximize the energetic efficiency of information transmission. Um, and I, I just showed you before that we have some preliminary results suggesting that maybe this finding the right spot for the synapse in terms of finding the, the, this optimum can be achieved uh, through local synaptic learning rules. And uh, this is my team in Geneva that is working on this. It's mostly Mirai and Dima, our founding. And thank you for your attention. Okay. So I would like to come back to something more uh, at a biophysical level. What is energy ultimately? How? and where energy is produced. So the idea that, first of all, ATP is important, that's you know, the, the source of energy. But so is it the only source that we have? Or are there other type of sources? And where finally, I mean, do we have in a, an excess of ATP all the time so that do we have to care about the production of energy in, in normal condition? Or yeah. it's overflowed? To okay, so, so... I mean, I there are many questions there. Okay. So, but but the, the basic idea is, let's go back to what is energy at a more molecular level, how it is produced, how it is degraded. Mm -hmm. And is it something that... Is it really important in normal condition that that or is it just, you know, we have so much, we have so much energy that you don't have to, you know, like a car going back to refuel no, I think it's important because, I mean, you can try to choke yourself. You will see how, how quickly your brain shuts down, right? So you, you don't have, I mean, the brain runs on, on uh, uh, is spending a lot of energy all the time, even when you sleep, even when you are not thinking or doing anything. And, and it doesn't have a, a vast stock or vast resources of energy. And I think there's a, there's a clinical proof to that, right? So if you stop breathing, you will be unconscious after something like 15 seconds. If you have a stroke, so if your blood flow is interrupted to a part of the brain because something occludes the vessels, I mean, you have, it, you have uh, serious, you know, you, you need to get this drug, ATPA, that, uh, that uh, unblocks the, the flow and you need to get it very quickly because if you don't, you will, there's a huge chunk of your brain that will be gone after a while. So the stroked area is, dies within hours and then eventually it's being completely removed. So if you see uh, uh, brains of patients that have had a stroke, I mean, you have sometimes like entire, an entire chunk of the brain that is completely gone. So I mean, it, it, I think clearly uh, you, you, the, you need, you need uh, this, the brain needs a lot of glucose and oxygen in permanence. And I think the proof is that you know you, your brain shuts down very quickly if you that don't. That sounds have like your <coughs> your answer to his question is it's the short term that matters. So yeah, sorry. It sounds like it's the short term that matters. Yeah. So for example, well, I, well, the, the, I, think, I think this was the question. Yeah. So for example, the source of production. So let's come back, for example, to mitochondria. So does our mitochondria need to be specifically located and all the time they have to be at the right spot to provide the source of energy so you have the local energy the lo at, a, at a short time scale versus a longer time scale where of course glucose and oxygen is carried by they're carried by the blood they have to find so can you elaborate on this basically two time scale and okay, two, so, two so sources think, of, of production i think um so you have a certain stock of ATP in cells. Uh, it can be partially replenished, or it can be replenished from phosphocreatine. So you can exchange the phosphate in phosphocreatine to reproduce uh, ATP from ADP, for instance. And you know, that, I mean, literature seems to say there is like two millimolar of ATP, five millimolar of phosphocreatine, and that's the majority of the energy stores in the brain. And then you have you have glycogen, uh, which are basically big sugar balls in, that are located in astrocytes. 
but it's unclear whether it's used for energy production really. So I mean, the, the, for instance, the, the data from the magistrate, magistrate group, although they've argued that it's being used for energy production from where you have metabolites being shuttled from astrocytes to neurons, they have data showing that it plays a role in learning. So it seems to be important to manufacture proteins for learning and not necessarily for, for energy storage. Um, and okay, so and I think what do you mean by short term, long term? I mean, if you if your brain runs out of energy on the short term, it will have an impact on the long term. I think the brain just doesn't have a, a, a large, a, a big dynamic range to deal with uh, with a shutdown in energy supplies, and uh, and you can and so uh, you can conclude that from I think at the maybe at the cellular level, it will be slightly different, or it will operate at different time scales. But I mean, it's. I think it affects it. Mu it, aff it affects uh, cellular behavior very quickly because you see changes in stroke that are very rapid. I think mm -hmm. at, at the cellular level. Maybe I can also comment on that briefly. So I mean, another evidence that this is really important is that um, typically mitochondria at synapses they are different from mitochondria in the soma or, for instance, in the axon. And it's probably, th or the morphology seems to be optimized for higher ATP production. Right, so which is another indicator. So yes, actually, nature has invented something to make it, to keep the synapses happy. Right. So another evidence would be so that in new degeneration is very often linked to mitochondrial dysfunction, meaning that accumulating energetic deficits over time leads something that what is called dying back mechanism. So meaning that the, you know so the, the neuron is not able to per, uh, to persist the axon and then it's getting shorter and shorter and finally the neuron dies because it gives up due to the energetic demands. What is that? Can I, can I say what, what you've just described, I don't see what that has to do with efficiency. That, that, that sounds like something completely different to me. That sounds like dynamical response. Whereas, you know, when, it, when I hear efficiency at the beginning oh. of the talk, I'm thinking, you know, so we don't have to hunt as many, as many animals to stay alive in the, in the, in the, you know what I mean? But I, I think, okay, so can, can I say something? <laughs> so, I, so I think, I think if, you, if you have all this evidence that shows you that the brain is, is, seems to be using a vast amount of energy, that it doesn't have a lot of reserves, and that when you start messing with brain energy metabolism, it leads to all sorts of problems. Uh, I think it tells you that, uh, you know, there, was, there, has, there must have been quite some pressure evolutionarily to reach some level of efficiency, uh, no matter how you define it, right? I mean, you, you want to, you want to, you have to balance the, let's say, the behavioral performance of uh, surviving and, and reproducing with, with uh, just uh, your brain shutting down because it's spending too much energy. So clearly it must, must, there must have been some pressure towards that. Sorry. But still having optimized mitochondria at synapses, I think is an indicator for efficiency. So you really yeah. optimize locally something so that you keep happy. Uh, the region. For example, Yeah, but there, there is a whole machinery to, to shuttle them around, right? That is relatively complex. So, I mean, I think they, 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 they get so, um, I don't really know very precisely, maybe you know better, but I think they, they, get, they get shuttled to, to synapses and docked there. So, there's so, so the position of mitochondria is actually very well regulated yes. in order to provide the amount of energy at the right place. Yes. Yeah. I think it's the calcium entry in the postsynaptic terminal that leads the mitochondria to being undocked at the, at the synapse. I think I just can uh, comment about it because uh, I've checked the mitochondria in dendrites of neurons and uh, uh, most importantly I, I could see they are very mobile. Mm -hmm. Actually they don't stay at the same position and if you activate some synapse um, along the dendrite they try to move inside, I don't know what is the signaling pathway, but they move to the uh, active zone of the dendrite and actually, uh, perhaps, I guess so, supply energy this area. Okay, can I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> Not, um, my, my question would have been, so speaking about this local optimization of the synaptic uh, transmission, so 
my gut feeling, or uh, well, I'm astrocyte obsessed, so that's why. Do you think that the astrocyte could play a role there in terms of the lactate shuttle or whatever kind of feedback mechanism you have there to tune this energetic state of the synapse? Uh, or don't you believe in that? I don't. I don't see why not. Yeah. I mean, so my, my so when we got these experimental results, my thinking was okay. This is presumably the, ma the same thinking you had that okay. This is all nice, but how do how can you how does the, does the system know that it needs to get there? And so the, the way we are trying to answer that is using this statistical physics framework to look at neural networks. And it tells you what the learning role should be like this, but it doesn't tell you how the learning role should be implemented. Yeah. So it could be any... Uh, I'm a firm believer of the role of glial cells. Uh, so I, I'm 100% uh, convinced that they must play a role in this, like they probably play a role in everything else in the brain. Uh, I just wanted to make a tangential comment that the things I alluded to yesterday in talking about diabetes and hepatic glucose production is intimately related to this. The whole system is largely organized to make sure that the brain gets first crack at whatever glucose is available. So essentially it gets all of it when you're in fasting conditions and you need your brain to be sharp so that you can go find food. Um, and then you know all the pathologies of diabetes, not all of them, but many of them ultimately stem from uh, defects in this, and maybe that's somewhat related to why glucose control is so essential. I think it's, uh, it's the main, I mean, for the brain, it's 99% uh, of the ATP is produced from glucose. I know that it's not the case for, I know very little about the other organs, but I know it's not the case for other organs, which can use some lipid metabolism, I think, to produce energy. The heart can do very well with glucose. Yeah. And, but in the, the case of the brain, for whatever reason, it's 99% uh, of the ATP comes from glucose. So it's really, and I think it's, uh, for instance, in diabetes, it's one of the reasons if, you, if your blood glucose drops below a certain level, you can have this uh, diabetic coma, I believe, yeah, which is, uh, which is basically the brain shuts down from the lack of energy. And that can happen overnight, I think. So it's uh, within a couple of hours or something like that. Um, I, I've heard it suggested that um, a, a, a different kind of, exp I, I guess your explanation for the low release probabilities, <coughs> relatively low release probabilities then is in terms of the, you know, energy efficiency you describe. I've also heard it suggested that um, it may be that way to make the total, um, if there are N contacts between presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron, then if the release probability is about 1 over n, then each uh, communication between, each action potential will communicate once between the presynaptic and mm. postsynaptic uh, neurons. Uh, that's, that's a, um, do, you, do you have anything to comment about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, yeah, it's yeah. a good point. I think, I think the, these results we have on energy consumption, they don't preclude uh, another explanation which would be a computational advantage at a more, let's say, larger, uh, more macroscopic scale or something. And I think it's, that's why I was making this comment about these thalamic relay cells, because people before us, people have said oh, a lot of action potentials are being dropped and it's advantages for this and that computing reasons, right? So there's this notion that the, the, the fact that not all of the action potentials are relayed actually brings a benefit in terms of uh, of uh, computing and extracting information from visual scenes. And I think it's not, not at all incompatible. Actually, I find it really interesting that you could have uh, presumably the, the brain or the, the system evolved in a way that it's kind of uh, trying to m maximize, trying to find this optimum between uh, function and, and energy consumption. And so, yeah, I didn't know that actually, but I think it's... Uh, yeah. Any other questions, comments, remarks? No? Then let's thank Renaud again for a really great talk. Uh, okay, so our next speaker is Alexander Skopin from the University of Luxembourg, and he's going to speak on cell energy, calcium, homeostasis, and cell fate. Yeah, so more or less is right, Rudiger, so we, we, but you couldn't read, right? So that's why it's a, a good excuse. And so as you will see, I will 
try to connect some dots that has been already out here on, on the meeting and uh, will give my personal perspective to it by first focusing on the stochastic character of calcium spiking so that I strongly believe in and then show how this can have an impact on and then this is related to the previous talk on uh, metabolic effects as well as, as, as sulfate and so meaning that this is then somehow related to this question so energy and information. So uh, this said, thank you for the invitation and I'm very sorry that I have to leave tomorrow for personal reasons so because I, I really like this atmosphere here so, it's, uh, so I would love to uh, uh, ask more questions. Okay, so um, what you can see in the scheme below is so my personal strategy so that I believe so that we have to integrate over the different scale of a biological system to understand this and then in my lab we do both, we do experiments and then computational modeling and try to understand this multi-scale biology things ultimately for a better understanding of the organism which brings me then um, to the general arrogant question of what is life. So uh, fortunately, so Schrödinger already answered that. Um, <laughs> so, so that it's a very complex uh, self-organizational process. So this uh, phrase of order from disorder and that it's meant to be kind of a robust information conservation and replication. And for me, it's the coolest uh, thing on the planet. So uh, Schrödinger then already tries to give a very uh, bird's eye view perspective to that and so that, so well actually its life relies on non-equilibrium, right? So because how this works on the planet is so that uh, we get the energy from the sun at a specific temperature and then uh, we radiate the same temperature, uh, te uh, the same heat at a different temperature so and then we have a negative entropy balance and then we can use that one to build some order on our planet. Uh, same is true if you look at the cow, right? So the cow is eating up long chains of charge and then is checking that and then uh, is giving us this shit here and if you asked <laughs> what is the shit about, so then I would answer here with uh, Richard Dawson, so it's a selfish gene, so it's kind of about information, right? So, um, so far so good, so it's a very uh, bird's eye perspective, but uh, does it really have to do something with molecular life? And um, actually, I argue yes, because there is a specific class of enzymes that we phrased uh, entropic enzymes. And what these enzymes are doing, so for instance, this is disproportionating enzymes in plants, is that they start from a substrate. So again, this glucose change here. And what this enzyme is doing is that it's uh, breaking up one glucose uh, unit here and it's transferring it to another one, right? So meaning opening one glucose to glucose uh, bond and closing another one. So meaning that the enthalpy is the same. But what is changing, as you can see here, is the entropy, right? So meaning that there's a real uh, entropy increase while the energetic, the, the, the system's energetic stays the same. So then having this nice uh, system here, so we could then come up with some simple predictions here. Um, so by maximizing the entropy, so which is lovely to do. And then what you can see here is that this fits perfectly uh, experimental data that we, that we uh, obtained in a, in a test tube. So, and we then also built a dynamic model and could then simulate the entropy production over time and then given the constraints of the enzyme you see that we first reach this quasi-equilibrium state and then on a lower time scale so we reach the final end state. So this uh, was our more or less uh, information-based approach to it but then there has been a group uh, that I convinced in Luxembourg, so from Massimiliano Esposito, and they put the whole idea of this entropic enzymes into the thermodynamic framework, and actually what you see here, oops, wrong way, what you see here is that you actually end up with the very same distribution of the chain lengths of our glucose units. So, from that I would conclude, so life is a smart way um, to use energy for some kind of information processing. So, um, so this is kind of life and so what we have to solve now is so how does life work? So and uh, for this my starting point is this famous uh, title of, uh, of an essay by Dobchansky that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So and actually so this essay was mainly meant as criticism uh, against the creationists um, but I took this and was thinking, okay, what is evolution? So evolution means so I have mutation and selection, what I then translate into heterogeneity and dynamics. 
and with that one I come then up with my color, so to speak, so that for me nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of cellular heterogeneity dynamics that I try to understand from different perspectives. Meaning, so that we well, life is building this up by this biological space-time map where we have here this molecular interactions and then we have this more regulatory processes uh, on the larger scale here. So and then this regulation on the cell level and cell population level is then leading to the organism that is hopefully more ordered than the molecular soup that uh, we are built of. Meaning that for me life is noise and the regulation of it so and then under the constraints of energy and information processing. Okay, so much uh, philosophy, um, so what does it mean and why does Carlton play a role there? So meaning that if we are putting us in the perspective of a cell, so then we have our internal machinery, so with mitochondria generating ATP here, and then we have uh, our information stored in the DNA in the nucleus, and then the cell is uh, in an environment. Not always in such a nice environment uh, as here in the mountains, but can be different environments where then the cell has to use energy to stay away from equilibrium, right? Because equilibrium is then the death. And to do this, so cells have this plasma membrane receptors, as you know, and, uh, and we heard already, and then there has to be some fuel coming in there, and then this has to organize in a smart way um, to keep us happy. So, and there we are already with calcium, so because I only have to connect the dots here that you already gave me, so calcium, so since Birch we have this phrase of uh, a central life and death signal, is involved in many processes where, well, you know this calcium and use calcium release idea so that um, plasma membrane receptor detect an agonist and then can produce IP3 and IP3 is then inducing opening of these IP3R channels on the endoplasmic reticulum and then calcium induced calcium release is leading to calcium waves in the, in the cytosol and calcium is, be, uh, can be, is then pumped back by the Zerker pumps that uh, for instance Rudiger, Rudiger uh, introduced today. So very often then we believe uh, that calcium is frequency coded as shown here in the calcium uh, signal of an indiv individual cell that is changing at one point uh, from a slow spiking behavior to a fast spiking behavior and there has been several studies already mentioned uh, here so that it plays an important role in fertilization as Katarina uh, has spoken about and then transcription differentiation that I will talk later about and also in uh, ATP production by mitochondria. So as Arthur has nicely introduced already and so a lot of other processes are involved there as well, synaptic plasticity and apoptosis as well and meaning so that to understand how this is all organized so we have to understand this local uh, molecular uh, properties together with the cellular dynamics. So just as a short reminder for those who are not so deep in the calcium business yet, so a look to the key molecular uh, player, so which is the release channel sitting in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, the IP3R, and here you see a, a chiral electron microscopy picture of it, so it has its four subunits, and uh, so far we believe that each subunit has three different kind of binding sites, so one that is sensitized the subunit, so uh, by IP3 binding, then another for calcium uh, activation and then uh, and binding sites for calcium inhibition uh, with uh, another affinity. And then the idea or what we believe from experimental data is that if at least three of these four subunits are in an active state, so this pore opens and then calcium is diffusing into the cytosol. And so these different affinities uh, is then leading to this bell-shaped open probability of such a channel. So in dependence of the calcium concentration, we see this bell-shaped open probability and then increasing and saturating for uh, IP3 concentra concentration, which is kind of the basics, uh, basis of calcium-induced calcium release. So if we look into the cell level, so then we see that the ER is not a bubble, as I, uh, in my scheme before, but it's more like a tubular network spreading throughout the whole cell. And then these uh, channel from channel clusters, so here typically separated by uh, several microns or up to several microns, between half a micron and a micron. And if we zoom in in such a, a channel cluster, we see that within the cluster, these channels are tightly packed. So each of these dots corresponds here uh, to, to a channel. So, and these channel clusters have typically between 5 and 15 of these channels. And then 
the question that uh, I first want to address is how does this spatial heterogeneity is then uh, leading to specific dynamic features. So meaning how does this disorder relate then to a more ordered behavior. And this is then um, uh, already a multi-scale problem because if we look into the first um, scale, spatial scale is a channel, you see that we have large channel fluctuation as here uh, measured together with uh, Colin Taylor's group. Um, where you see that uh, the open times has a broad distributions. So on the level of the cluster, we then typically observe so-called puffs, so meaning that the uh, activation of a single channel is then activating its neighbors in the cluster, and then you typically observe this uh, fast increases of the cytosolic calcium concentration that is, again, stimulus dependent. And again, we have a very, well, broad distribution here that uh, we have to understand. And then finally, on the level of the cell, so um, we know from Oocyte, so experiments here by the Parker group, um, where they scanned the frog egg, so uh, did a line scan over time. So meaning this is a line over the same line of the cell, scanned over time. And it's a white line here. They uncaged IP3 to sensitize the cells. And then you first observe this local event here, which corresponds to a puff, so activation of an individual channel clusters. But if several of these puffs come together, then a global wave is uh, set off, and then this is corresponding to such a calcium spike. Okay, so um, meaning if this here, this uh, nucleation mechanism is uh, the general mechanism in cells, not only in this big frog eggs, but also in smaller cells, then uh, we would predict that these calcium oscillations are stochastic and would depend on the spatial coupling between these release sites. So um, with this idea, so we measured then together, so I mean this is old work that I did with Martin Falke, so I measured then uh, different cell types, so where you can see here the individual calcium traces of uh, four different cell types, so for astrocytes, so microglia, so glia cells, so when I fall in love with, with the, the glia cells. Then uh, we measured PLA cells, which are uh, adult human stem cells, and then also uh, hex cells together with, with Colin Taylor. And what you see here is that um, the interspike intervals, meaning the time between two fluorescence maxima, are not constant, but that they differ, right? So that they, and if you have a closer look, so that we see also that there are different regimes. So for these glia cells, the variability, variability is rather large compared to these hex cells that are stimulated by carbocol, where the spread of the interspike intervals is more narrow. So for a more systematic analysis, we can now, or we have measured hundreds of cells, and we're then looking into the population properties which is shown here, so where we now can calculate for each spike train, meaning for each cell, we can then calculate the average period and the variability in terms of the standard deviation. And this is shown here for the four different cell types. And for all cell types, we observe this linear relation as indicated by this uh, rather high correlation coefficient. So if you have a closer look, we see that the slope of this dependence differs. So for this glia cells, the slope is close to 1. So, and then for those with a background in uh, stochastic processes, that is very similar to personium process. Whereas for the stimulated cells, uh, for the hex cells, so the slope goes close to 0 0.5, 0 0.6, right? So meaning the variability, the relative variability is reduced there. But anyway, so the standard deviation is for all of these cells in the same order as the mean uh, period, which is a clear indicator. So yes, the spiking is stochastic. So to understand this, so we started then first with a heuristic model where we assume that an inter individual interspike interval uh, corresponds often deterministic time, so refractory time that is needed to free the channels from inhibition and to pump the calcium back into the plasmic reticulum. And then there's another part of this interspike interval that corresponds to this nucleation time, meaning to bring together these stochastic events of uh, cluster opening, and then when they come together, they can nucleate to a global wave and set up a global spike. So um, we then can build, uh, or we, did, we described this by a time-dependent uh, uh, Poissonian process with this time-dependent nucleation rate that has this classical uh, standard nucleation rate plus a relaxation 
from inhibition, right? So, and if uh, we plug now this into the probability of uh, to observe a spike, we end up with this formula here, which we can then d directly plot uh, in uh, dependence to, to also to data. So here you see the two different scenarios for the spontaneous spike in astrocytes and for the stimulated hex cells. So. Having once we have this probability density, we can directly also calculate uh, the relation between the standard deviation and the mean period. And you see here that we, for the different parameters, we typically end up with uh, a linear relation between them, where the slope is mainly dependent on this recovery rate. Meaning, so that the faster we recover from a spike, the closer we are to a pure personium process. And the more inhibition, so negative feedback we have there, so the more the slope will decrease. Uh, another, okay, so yes, then we can map this to the different cell types. And another hypothesis based on this nucleation process is that this probability will depend on the spatial coupling between the release sites, right? So to test this, so we performed the following experiment. We me measured cells for a reference period and then we loaded additional calcium buffer to the cells. And then the release calcium from one, from one release site, from one cluster, is first buffered, meaning it uh, reduces the probability to activate neighboring release sites, meaning that the overall probability uh, should be lower. And this is actually what was the case. As you can see here, after buffer loading, all the cells were switched to a slower and more irregular spiking. Interestingly, when we then look again at this variability plot, so meaning plotting now for each cell the standard deviation over the mean period, where now each cell corresponds to a red dot and a blue cross corresponding to this reference period and uh, the measure period with additional uh, calcium buffer, we see that the slope is pretty much preserved uh, for all the cell types. So, meaning that with these experiments, we actually could then further indicate that also for smaller cells, the spike generating mechanism is uh, wave nucleation. So we had kind of a hard time to convince uh, several people about this. So and then, uh, so this is what, what, uh, what I learned those days. So is that if you want to change a paradigm, you have to go very deep into the into the mechanisms. And that's why we then built up a multi-scale model. So where we then took the, well, the key elements into a partial differential equation. So for the cytosolic calcium concentration here, so we have, we have the diffusion, we have a leak flux, we have the release from uh, the channel clusters, we have the pumps and then buffer reactions. So then we have an equation for the endoplasmic reticulum, for the lumen, and then the corresponding buffer equations over there. So one numerical problem that you have there is that this say, uh, that the system it has very steep gradients. So meaning if you, we want to simulate the typical uh, time scale of a cell, so several hundred of seconds, it uh, took with fin even with finite element method uh, forever. So and that's why um, I came up with this cubistic uh, modeling strategy, meaning so that the idea is that we disassemble the whole system in its parts and then reassemble it meaning that we separated the passive processes so and then uh, had a linear diffusion equation for which we then generated uh, or calculated a greens function so we really good or today gave already a perfect introduction to that and um, simulated the channel so individual channel units by a markov chain so, so the markov chain dynamics so then for the clusters, uh, we used the quasi steady state approximation in terms of the average concentration within the endoplasmic reticulum and the cytosol. And the cellular dynamics was modeled by, by the Green's function. So meaning that we then have an analytical solution that was driven by the discrete noise. And the transition of our Markov chain was determined by the cytosolic concentration, by the analytical solutions. So Coming back to this uh, multi-scale perspective, we see that this very noisy behavior of an individual channel, so these blips that can be rather irregular, are uh, uh, coordinated uh, on the cluster level to these puffs that are have, again, uh, are more ordered, but still you see a lot of wrinkles here. And then these wrinkles are smeared out on, on the cellular level, uh, on, the, on the spike level. 
so which is kind of first evidence so that we have from the molecular soup uh, the molecular fluctuation is smear out effect on the cell level so um, what you can then also do is that we can look now into uh, the uh, cytosolic calcium concentration during a spike here and you see that it's not like in the oocytes you typically see observe very homogeneous traveling waves actually this is not the case in the smaller cells in our simulation but you see that it's more like a rappling up of uh, calcium activity and then due to inhibition you will um, end the spike so why I Last this model is that it's, it's capturing more or less the whole spectrum of calcium signals that uh, we observe experimentally. So in the upper part you always see in black you see uh, experimental traces. So actually here these are all astrocytes. In the lower cases you see now simulations that are somehow mimicking uh, the experimental traces. In red you see the cytosolic calcium concentration, in blue you see the luminin calcium concentration. In the lower panel you see the number of open channels in black and the number of inhibited subunits uh, in magenta. And what you see is that for a given uh, cell we can produce rather regular spiking behavior and the other thing that we observe is that, that a spike is mainly uh, finished by uh, inhibition so of these individual channels. Then using the very same cell and by only uh, lowering the calcium base level, meaning that this initial trigger for uh, an opening is decreased, we can now move this uh, rather regular spiking to more irregular spiking, but once a spike is happening we see that in terms of uh, channel opening we have a very similar behavior. So then playing further around uh, with uh, the model, so then we can, for instance, observe this typical uh, shoulder behavior so that we uh, often observe in stimulation, so it could be mimicked by if we decrease the circular activity and this bursting-like behavior or plateau response uh, was then also observed for lower uh, circular activity and high IP3. And now meaning that we have one model by changing physiological parameters we can somehow generate the whole spectrum of our observed calcium spikes. Yes? Yes, uh, specifically, so the, the, the cell has you approximated as a geometry as a ball, is that correct? Yes, in this case, yes. Okay, and what is the geometry of the ER that you have taken? Uh, so the ER is here smeared over the whole thing. So it's a two-compartment model, meaning so each dot in space corresponds to endoplasmic reticulum and cytos uh, cytosol as well. So. So, but, but so the ER is something connected, right? Yes, so it, it's connected, so it's uh, homogeneously connected by the pumps. So that, uh, that we assumed here um, homogeneously distributed and then the main drivers of this uh, dynamics is given by the release sites, so by the channel clusters. And, and the channels are uniformly distributed or so clustered on, on the ER? Uh, so the channel clusters are marked here by red. So these are the locations. So in red you see here the channel clusters. So you, s you, you pick up specific locations for the, for the uh, IPC receptors on the ER? Yes. Okay. Um, then we use the simulation also to look into the vari variability. So you see here again, so by changing the parameters we can change from irregular to regular spiking and then for uh, the performing several simulations we then ended, can again determine the variability in dependence of the mean period and again we ended up with a linear dependency for, uh, in these simulations. We then also simulated our buffer experiments, so by first simulating uh, one setup of a cell, then changing the buffer parameter and uh, restarted the uh, same simulation, and then again we observed this linear rela uh, relation as observed in the experiments. And for all the simulation I ended up with a slope of 1, which was kind of bothering me because I had the idea, okay, has to, there has to be a physiological scenario where we can actually find a smaller slope. And so this was actually those days try and error. Now we know more, uh, more, more profoundly that a way to decrease the slope is by feedback mechanisms. So what I then finally found in my simulations is that if I uh, increase the release 
uh, strengths of a calcium ch uh, of a calcium cluster, so that this is then actually reducing the population slope, and that once I have this specific feedback mechanism, so that this population slope stays rather similar. So I could change spatial arrangement, the stimulation level, and the pump strength. So, but they all preserve more or less this population slope. Where only if I really increase the feedback mechanism, meaning the, the response to of inhibition. I got a, a reduction of the slope. Um, so, and since then, there was this question: Okay, so far so good. We can understand the, uh, how the signaling mechanism is uh, monitored, but what are downstream effects? So, can it play a role? So, and the first question that you can then ask about is about information, right? So, as uh, introduced before, so and. Then, by using this kuhlberg leibler uh, measure, so or relative entropy, we can now compare two scenarios. Once we have the probability distributions over over here, so and then this corresponds to the information gain. And again, so as, as I said before, so glia cells, specifically astrocytes, have a slope of one, whereas the stimulation of hex cells has led to a decreased slope of 0 0.6. So by plugging now this in into our information gain. Um, we can then calculate uh, uh, the specific value and it turns out that this is only dependent on the ratio of our nucleation rate and the uh, recovery rate, right? So the balance between activation and recovery is, set, uh, is setting up this, um, uh, this slope and um, meaning that in the end we can uh, put the information that is given by the external condition in relation to uh, this population slope. And we see so that for the spontaneous uh, spiking in glia cells, so there's more or less no information in there, whereas if we go to the stimulation of hex cells, so we can quantify the information in the environment. So much we can speculate about the information of the uh, environment, but how does an individual cell is uh, encoding the information? And to address this, so uh, we performed the following experiment. We s stimulated cells first for one uh, with one concentration of carbocals, so in this case hex cells, and then uh, increased the stimulation to a higher concentration dose, and then remeasured this thing. So, and then we, for both of these periods, we then get the uh, average periods, and for all cells and all shifts, we ended up again with a linear relation. So, meaning that there is a relative change involved. So um, then this uh, is true uh, for different simulation steps and it turns out so that this Weber fraction so is actually only dependent on the difference in the stimulation, right? So it, it's not the absolute value that matters but it's only the uh, change of the concentration. Um, with what you, we can then use to come up with this encoding relation, so simply by differentiating that one to uh, the carbocol concentration, and we end up then with this prediction of an exponential dependency of the stimulation uh, strengths. So and then you can see here the uh, prediction and the data for hex cells and hepatocytes, and we have proven that this is uh, consistent with not only our data but also data from, from literature. So meaning that we have now shown that, yes, there's stochastic involved, but individual cells can use this Weber fraction, so this relative change in the period, to encode uh, relation by this encoding relation. So far so good, but what does it mean now for, for life, right? Because we wanted to understa understand life. So we have these different frequency patterns here that are acting on uh, the complex machinery of a cell. And so since Andrew Thomas, so from 95, we have already very good evidence that calcium spiking is doing something with mitochondria, so in, hepato in hepatocytes. And then there has been this uh, cool experiments by Dolmetsch and, and others, so that has shown that different frequencies can induce different expression profiles in cells, right? So now this is all more or less the idea of frequency coded, coding. So how does this goes now together with the stochasticity that we have proven to be play a role, and how does, re does this relate to the encoding relation? And so 
I marked this in color because I will try to tell you a little bit how we try to disentangle these things in uh, experiments and what it means for real life. And I will start first this with this metabolic crosstalk. So, meaning how is this crosstalk between calcium and mitochondria in terms of ATP production uh, relevant and what can we learn to do that or Maza, so the PhD student mainly worked on this project so we combined uh, calcium imaging with modeling and simulation and so we developed also a useful tool to analyze this kind of data and performed uh, uh, metabolic flux experiments and so we started there with a model Right, so now not this very detailed molecular model, but with uh, models that you have more or less already similar uh, seen before, where we now consider uh, the crosstalk between the calcium machinery and mitochondria here by the mitochondrial calcium unit transporters and uh, the NCX, and of course, obviously, so we also need some uh, fuel uh, entering the, into the system here by glucose, and then. I can connect now to Arthur. So the fructose bisphosphate is a scenario that is then leading finally after glycolysis to pyruvate as a substrate to the TCA cycle in mitochondria. So the full model is rather complex, but um, so we ha haven't had to invent everything ourselves. So here you see the Bertram model that was already mentioned before here, which is a uh, well rather careful derived model um, for mitochondrial activity and then we have a typical calcium model here so where we start with a deterministic one th and these two models are now coupled by uh, the MCU, the NCX, the Zerker pumps and the plasma membrane calcium ATPases that uses or needs ATP for, for the actions and then you see here the how calcium is entering the uh, Bertram model for mitochondrial activity. So then from uh, this first model simulation you see that uh, in black the cytosolic calcium concentration, that the cytosolic calcium concentration in accordance with the uh, Bertram model or also with what Arthur has shown yesterday is then can activating calcium uh, in mitochondrial influx and then on the other hand that this calcium mitochondrial influx is then leading to ATP production then you see here this typical uh, oscillatory pattern. Delta Psi is uh, the membrane potential of the uh, mitochondrium. Um, so and actually, so this is where you store the uh, chemical energy that is then used for uh, ATP to production. So, um, so we th as a first check, we then uh, performed a reality check and we are checking if this uh, model is somehow reflecting our encoding relation that we just derived by changing the IP3 concentration. Yes, actually we observe a very similar dependency, exponential dependency on the stimulation that is in accordance with uh, the experiments. And we were then now asking the question, so if we change so somehow this is the uh, energetic state of our cell, what would be the impact of the cytosolic uh, calcium dynamics? So and to do that, so we played around with uh, the fructose bisphosphate, which is kind of the input variable of the Bertram model. So and then what you see here is that if we have a high substrate for mitochondria, so we observe slower spiking compared to the scenario where we have a lower mitochondrial substrate scenario. Yeah. So you then, we then did parameter screens and quantified this a little bit further. So where you see here now so that uh, the cytosolic ATP is lower for the lower uh, FPP concentration. The, cytos uh, the um, mitochondrial calcium is actually larger uh, in this scenario and we, uh, we predict to have faster spiking uh, in lower food conditions. Um, so but obviously, so uh, nothing is real until you check it. So that's why we went with this idea. We then went into a reality check. And since I love astrocytes, we went uh, to an astrocytic cell line. And as you see, so biology is always com more complex than, than the model. Um, what you have here on the right side is a, typical is a typical calcium scenario machinery. So where you have this plasma membrane receptors and then re calcium released by IP3Rs from the endoplasmic reticulum and the pumping back of calcium by Zerker pumps uh, by using ATP. 
And then you have this mitochondria here um, with the TCA cycle, the so Krebs cycle inside that is using either, you can use either glucose as an input or glutamine as an input, and then this is then driving ATP production that is uh, then talking back to the calcium homeostasis. Um, so then we did the, performed the following experiments. So we put ourselves under uh, low food conditions uh, for uh, uh, 72 hours, mainly because to empty the uh, energy re reservoirs, so the glycogen that uh, were just mentioned before. And then we compared the cells uh, under very rich glucose condition compared to no glucose condition where cells could only run on, on glutamine as a substrate. And then we uh, were measuring uh, again the, the calcium signal and this is, uh, these are now two extreme cases where you see that under these rich glucose conditions we actually observed slower spiking compared to the uh, scenario where cells only had glutamine. We then looked into the ADP to ATP ratio and we observed that, that actually cells uh, are running out of uh, ATP. So we have seen that there is faster spiking, so uh, statistically significantly faster spiking for uh, these conditions, and that there's also an increase in, in the glutamine uptake, right? Because cells that do not have glucose, so they have to get more uh, glutamine inside. So, actually, so this was rather intriguing that, uh, that this can be due. So, and we were then fascinated by this calcium, or potentially induced calcium mediated uh, food uptake of, of the cells. And we're then asking the other way around. So if we now change the calcium pattern, so the calcium spiking behavior of the cell, what kind of effect can this have on the ATP production on the mitochondrial activity? So, um, and again, only connecting the dots. So what was already mentioned before, we know that there are several key enzymes uh, that are calcium controlled, like the pyruvate dehydrogenase. So that is uh, sitting here at the entry point of uh, the TCA cycle. Then uh, the isocitrate dehydrogenase is also known to be um, calcium controlled as well as the alpha catagluterate dehydrogenase. So and then you see here again the two entries to uh, the TCA cycle are glucose and glutamine and that's why we were looking into the metabolic fluxes of uh, these two uh, substrates. So in a first set of experiments, so we used only three different stimulation things and then we used as a medium either that had only glucose and no glutamine or that has only glutamine and no glucose as a thing, uh, as a substrate. And then we were measuring the calcium periods due to different stimulation and could then measure the food uptake. So the metabolic, metabolic flux uh, within these cells. And you see that we get this reciprocal relation that we then put together, if you put it together, we see that actually for, far, for slower spiking, we have less food uptake. Huh? So, so far uh, not uh, very well defined, so that's why Maza had to do more experiments and used now uh, a finer grid uh, for the stimulation. Again, for this acidic cell line, so we had now five different uh, stimulation strengths. We also used different stimulation stimuli, uh, uh, drug stimuli or um, stimulation uh, antagonists. But we then uh, ended up with this kind of metabolic relation in terms of the calcium period. We also performed experiments on with hex cells, again with different simulations, uh, and ended up again with a more sigmoidal um, relation that is relating so the calcium spiking behavior to the metabolic flux. So meaning that from this one, I. Uh, so the idea is so that we have this extracellular stimuli so that we have shown before is encoded in the calcium period and that this calcium period can then be decoded in terms of a, of a metabolic flux. So bringing these things together, so here you see a steady state behavior of the pyruvate dehydrogenase and the alpha-catagluterate dehydrogenase that is shown to be half a sigmoidal relation under steady state conditions. And you see that this is similar to our 
uh, observed dynamic uh, relation, which is indicating an integrator system, right? So meaning that's similar as in Katarina's talk today, the calcium signal is kind of integrated uh, over time and lead to a specific readout. So we then were checking again our modeling strategy. So what can we, uh, what does our model tells us? And so what we typically observed was this kind of relation in terms of the frequency to uh, mitochondrial uh, activity, which obviously you see does not really matches very well. And specifically, since the model is based on a Hopf bifurcation, you typically have this hard cut uh, on the left side and on the right side. So the scenario could be rescued. So when we used again a stochastic model, so meaning when uh, we are sitting uh, before a Hopf bifurcation and then only having the channel noise that is triggering now our uh, our system, and then actually the we were able with different uh, for large parameter sets a uh, set of parameters so to rescue this more or less similar uh, sigmoidal sigmoidal relation for our metabolic decoding. Question? Uh, what kind of stochastic model is that? So did you take your original ODE model and then change the IP3 receptor to a stochastic model? Yes, exactly. So okay, what model was that? Uh, this was a model that, uh, I mean, it's, it's based on uh, Genevieve's work. Yeah. So, and we did some, uh, by Genevieve approved the modifications uh, for some uh, specific parts, but it's more or less Genevieve deterministic ODE model. So, um, okay. So, for me, this is a further evidence that actually experiment. If you want to understand experimental data, we really have to consider the stochastic aspects of the calcium machinery. So, and then. Uh, as a, on, on the next level, so I was then wondering, does this stochastic behavior has an eff effect on our cell state uh, or cell fate decisions, right? So then starting with this idea of Weddington's, Weddington's epigenetic landscape, so where uh, a cell or a stem cell is, uh, has a higher potential and then during differentiation is finding the right valley in dependence on the, on the environment. So can we have uh, or can we modify this behavior by, by calcium dynamics? And to do this, so we have several uh, tools. So we do apply, uh, well, the traditional microscopy. We do fax analysis, and we have also um, this established uh, Fluidime 1, uh, C1, uh, uh, microfluidics chips available to perform single cell analysis. And our current working horse is actually this a uh, drop seek approach. This is also a microfluidics device that is generating millions of these droplets per minute. So, and then what you use is you use these droplets to uh, isolate individual cells. So, because you run at high dilution, so Poissonian uh, regime where now individual uh, cells are caught in these droplets together with a microparticle. So, and this microparticle is actually a bead. So, with a unique barcode, so with a unique DNA barcode. And at the end of this barcode, so there is a PODA region, and with this PODA region, so you capture mRNAs, right? So, meaning that in the end, we get in such a droplet, a cell, and uh, such a bead, the cell is lysated, and then we capture the mRNAs to this bead with this unique barcode, and that mm, we can throw everything together in a sequencer and do a very high multiplexing and end up then with a transcriptome, so for hundreds of cells, where we can then read out up to 20,000 genes, right? So, meaning that this is then kind of our expression matrix that we can then further analyze and try to understand the cell state. Um, so, as a first approach, so uh, uh, we uh, teamed up with uh, Jens Schwamborn and uh, those days still in Luxembourg, Ron and Fleming, and Jens has generated an IPS cell line from a Parkinson patient. And so th they were now wondering if a Parkinson mutation, so namely this LAG2 G2019S mutation, has an inf impact on neuronal differentiation. So, meaning starting from the stem cell, so 
how does this mutation, this Parkinson related mutation, has now uh, cha is changing the uh, neuronal or specifically is this um, dopaminergic neuronal behavior? So, and then they did this nice staining uh, where you see in green the TH positive dopaminergic neurons. And what they observed is that if they compared this uh, mutation cell line, so with the isogenic control in gray, so that actually at the beginning and the end points you have very similar amounts, but in the differentiation process you have an overshoot uh, of dopaminergic neurons due to the Parkinson mutation, which was first a little bit counterintuitive because Parkinson is actually uh, related to a neuronal death of these uh, dopaminergic neurons. So the question was why, uh, why and how? So, and then we looked into these four different time points and we're now measuring the transcriptome, so for more than 3,000 cells, and we were able to detect 16,000 uh, genes. We can then do a cluster for each every uh, individual time point and can compare the mutants and the isogenic control. So, and then what, what you can observe, or you can probably not see it because it's too small, so you have to believe me, so that actually in this data, if we look now into this mitochondrial, uh, in this uh, dopaminergic neurons, so we actually also see this in the transcriptome level, so we have a faster differentiation uh, caused by the mutation. And uh, we were then looking into specific uh, pathways, so the, into the cell cycle, and we there we have seen that actually the mutation is running faster, right? So the mutation leads to a faster uh, differentiation system that is probably driven by modification in the mitochondria. So, which is then here another hint, so that actually changes in your energetic repertoire can have an effect on your uh, life of speed. Um, so you c we then used a little bit more sophisticated clustering, uh, so here by this branching analysis, where you now can use the similarity of your gene expression profiles to predict the uh, temporal uh, relation of these cells, ending up with a pseudotime. And then what you see here now uh, is uh, the for each day, you see the uh, location of the cells for the mutant and for the um, wild type thing, and you see that the mutant in red is somehow running in front of uh, the uh, in, in, uh, of the of the wild type, and we can then combine this into a proxy for the developmental stage. We see at day zero, so these two cell lines overlay very much, but then in red. So the mutant is running faster to the uh, to the differentiation differentiation endpoint, and only at day 42 the wild type is catching up. So then at this stage I made the bet so that there will be change in calcium signaling. So that's why um, we measured now uh, for these uh, cell lines we measured calcium in the mutated. A mutation and the control cell line. So we did this in a high throughput way, ended up with a lot of these calcium traces and could then uh, do a look again into this uh, average period and standard deviation. So the good thing was, yes, actually the mutation uh, uh, exhibited a faster spiking compared to the wild type. But the bad news for me was so that the slope in this uh, sigma t average relation was not uh, changed. So I lost a bottle of wine, was very depressed. Um, but anyway, so th this faster spiking somehow matches again with this increased triggering of mitochondria. So meaning that you may induce higher mitochondrial load, then leading to higher ROS, meaning leading to faster aging. Right, so that would be the hypothesis behind here. This is still ongoing. We try to figure this out, but since I lost this bottle of wine, so I then said, "Okay, now get the big guns out." And uh, we uh, looked into another system, so the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So, and this is uh, in well in the good world. This is a cool process because it's important in development. So like if you look into embryos, it's very important, but also for wound healing. It's a mechanism that is kind of closing your wounds. But uh, the bad part to it is that it's also uh, a mechanism for uh, metastasis, meaning it plays a key role in, in cancer. 
So what you have uh, there is that you have two different cell types, so epithelial cells that are building up the tissue, and then you have mesenchymal cells that are the, uh, mobile cells. They can crawl away and do calcium signals uh, when uh, due to metabolic, uh, due to stress sensors. And the idea uh, in, in metastasis is that you have your tumor, your primary tumor, so made of epithelial cells. So then a cell can now carrying the right mutation can now uh, make an EMT, so EPC to mesenchymal switch, getting mobile, is crawling through the blood stream, traveling with the blood in your body, it's getting out somewhere else, makes the reverse transition to an EPC state and then it's building up the secondary tumor, right? So and then once you have metastasis, it's uh, very often already too late. So, um, to characterize these uh, different cell states, so uh, we can use markers. So, and we have done this here in, uh, recently in this publication, um, where you observe here the epithelial state, so and the mesenchymal states by uh, markers. So, typical uh, epithelial and mesenchymal markers. But what we also observed in the study here is that we have observed cells that are double positives. Yeah. So, and then the question would be here. So, if you have probably heard about this concept of cancer stem cells, um, where in this breast cancer cell line, so we probably believe that uh, these double positive cells having a higher adaptability are, rela are related to these cancer stem cells. So, um, we were then or asking the question: So, can we have an impact by calcium? So and this is what you see here. So we have these two different cell types, and now we build up a, mac a macrophytics device with which we can force cells to spike with uh, individual uh, calcium patterns. So, so you see here, so the, the machinery that is put under a microscope, and then we have a MATLAB controller to the, uh, written to that, so that we can now synchronize these uh, cell states. So you see here now cells are, are blinking synchronously, and we can uh, modify our stimulation protocol from fast spiking to slow spiking to stochastic spiking. So as a first approach, we then we're just looking, is there a, a difference if we have control cells, so no forced calcium spiking to the fast stimulation of uh, the calcium machinery. And um, this is what you see here. So for the stimulated compared to the control thing, first of all, we are able to resolve this different, uh, to uh, the two different cell states, so the epithelial and mesenchymal cell states, and then these cells in the middle that correspond to cells in transition. So. Interestingly, what we observed is was then this distinct subpopulation in the epithelial uh, population, and when you look into what is different in this cluster compared to the other things, so then this is related to again to mitochondria. So meaning again, so the, the impact of uh, metabolic or energetic state on on the cell fate. So. We then also were interested in these, uh, if we find a significant difference in these intermediate cells, so the cells in transitions. And well, so far in this experiment, this picture has not been so clean yet. So that's why we uh, went further on with our analysis and did again this uh, branching analysis. And what you see here is the control condition compared to the, stimula uh, to the stimulated cells. In the upper part, you see the uh, epithelial score, meaning red corresponds to, uh, to a cell that is, uh, has an epithelial character. And in the lower part, you see the mesenchymal score, meaning red dots correspond to the mesenchymal <coughs> uh, cell state. So what is obvious so that in this abstract uh, cell state, that due to the stimulation, we observe more cells that are between these cell uh, clusters. Yeah? So here you see the clusters are rather well defined, whereas in the stimulation scenarios, you see more cells in, in the middle. And specifically, we see a higher, uh, or this extra cluster here, uh, that is, seems to be induced in uh, by the stimulation. Com so, uh, as you can see better here in this 3D view, and so if we go into the gene functions, so we can uh, come to the conclusion that this fast calcium spiking is inducing a switch from the mesenchymal to the epithelial states, and that we prime these cells here to apoptosis. What is not totally surprising because we know that apoptosis is related to fast calcium spikes. 
Um, so to uh, finish this up, so we had then uh, we're looking into the uh, correlation networks and what uh, so the main message that we observe here is that compared to the control conditions, stimulation induces more co higher correlations and specifically mitochondrial genes have a stronger uh, negative correlation compared to the control condition and the question with that we are tackling right now is so what can we learn from uh, this functional networks. And since I promised Rudiger uh, this last slide, so I spent the last two minutes on that, is and to get a bottle of wine. So the question was still, so does this variability uh, coding can have an effect? So and to do to analyze this one, we use now the cell line. We're first comparing the control condition, so meaning where we do not have any triggered uh, calcium signals to the traditional uh, stimulation thing, so where we have constant uh, ATP in the thing and then cells will oscillate with their own uh, natural eigenfrequency of the calcium spiking machinery. And then we measure the number of differentially expressed genes, so meaning how many genes are now different to this control condition. And then you see so that we have up to 2,000 genes that are induced by ATP stimulation. So then if we look into the uh, deterministic periodic driven cells, we see actually something that is uh, corresponding to the frequency coding. So the faster we spike uh, or make the cell spiking, the more differentially expressed genes uh, we obtain. So that corresponds then to this one-dimensional screen on this line. And then asking the question, so what does variability do uh, does to the cells, right? And for this one, we then use this uh, period here, so six-minute period, and did a stochastic spiking, so the pattern is indicated in here. And then you see that uh, we get a dramatically increase of differentially expressed gene, not only to the control condition, but also if you look, compare that to uh, the same average period, so, but uh, deterministically, so meaning rather periodically, right? So, which is uh, shown here. So meaning that it's not only frequency coding that matters to the cell, but the question it also dr uh, dramatically depend how this average is generated. So meaning a period, so a fixed period is mainly giving you specificity and not uh, the, the, the full program. And uh, yeah, so just uh, for consistency checks, you can also then compare that to another reference point, but uh, you see so that the message stays more or less uh, the same, so that you still have a significant subset of unique cells induced by uh, the stochastic spiking. And so from, from the markers that we know about epithelium and chymal transitions, so from the stochastic spikings, we see that, first of all, it's increasing the cellular heterogeneity, but also that we induce an epithelial to mesenchymal transition, that what is in contradiction to the fast regular spiking that we have uh, seen before. So with this one, I conclude nearly in time. Um, so we have seen, or I, I hope that everybody in the room believes uh, that calcium is important, and so that we understood this something about the encoding relation before. So we now have a link to metabolic decoding, also not in, be uh, not in better cells, but in non-electrically -ele excitable cells. We uh, can use the, our systems to look into sulfate decisions, so how calcium is triggering sulfate decisions, and we have first evidences that actually variability in coding uh, actually matters. But still, um, the general code of life is still missing, and uh, if somebody has a good and smart idea how to solve this, I'm very open to that. And with this, this is uh, our current working uh, hypothesis in the lab, so where we try to combine experiment and theory to somehow resolve or to understand uh, this c connection between energy and information better, starting on the small scale of mitochondria, so what I was mentioning before in this discussion, so what you see here is actually uh, mitochondria in the, in the synapse, 
in a synapse that has a specific morphology. Here you see mitochondrial trafficking in axons, so what was mentioned before, and we go now up to the scale uh, to in vivo imaging in the fish. Since I'm so proud of the movie, I still have to show it. So this is now a fish uh, where we have a calcium indicator genetically encoded. And now we are able with our spin microscope to resolve here individual neuronal dynamics and look into seizures, so epileptic seizures. Um, and this is something to come up later on. But I want to conclude with commercials. So that we actually uh, have just published this very useful tool to analyze calcium spiking and this is targeted directly to the variability analysis so meaning that you can load your CSV files or text files or Excel files whatever in here so you have an automated peak, uh, peak detection and then we calculate for you several statistical properties that then can help to solve the problem of uh, variability encoding and with this I skip uh, this thing here and thank my lab and uh, you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time for questions, comments. Uh, yeah, you showed at the very beginning calcium imaging in microglia. The, so what kind of preparation was that and, and how, what, how did you do the imaging exactly? Yeah, so th this has been microglia isolated from uh, mouse, so from uh, from from mouse brains. Uh, I think it was uh, P10, I guess. Okay, so so they are it's primary culture. Yes, okay. primary culture, and then staining with fluo four, and then normal epifluorescence uh, okay. microscopy. Thanks. Fascinating talk, for me at least, and uh, I wanted to ask two questions. One is, um, why is there a difference between the microglial and the hex cells uh, that you find in the variability encoding? And uh, the other one, there is this big uh, model that you have put down, uh, that seven variables. So how do we know about the uh, what do we know about the relative importance of the variables do we need all of that or can we yeah. simplify that there are different time scales in place that you can throw some things out and get some um, perhaps simpler model out of that to still capture uh, the phenomena you want to study so yeah um, so f for the first uh, first question, so the main difference is there so that uh, the astrocytes uh, or astrocytes and microglia are spontaneous spiking. So I mean they do not get a direct chemical uh, kick, but it's spontaneous activity. Whereas the hex cells uh, are treated by carbocol. So, so um, now. Based, so we now know so that this change in the slope is mainly due to some feedback mechanisms. So, um, and that actually stimulation is very often inducing this kind of uh, feedback mechanisms. So, uh, so yeah, well, we do not impose we do not impose uh, a feedback, but it's uh, the normal machinery of calcium induced calcium release. So if you have a stimulation, you very often get then uh, a feed negative feedback mechanism. So where people then are still in fights, what is the mechanism? Is so that? is it the IP3 okay. uh, feedback or is it only store depletion and stuff like this? So this I would not. Well, I don't want to put me in a, in a position to solve this issue right now. So there are different okay. uh, feedback mechanisms that can do that. So, and as long as you have a feedback mechanism, this will uh, reduce the slope. So now if you stimulate your astrocytes, or we have now data for a stimulated astrocyte, and actually there we observe also a slope smaller than one. So mm -hmm. meaning okay. that it's consistent with this idea about the uh, feedback mechanism. For the second question, so if you really need the seven variables, um, well, yeah, yeah, well, in the end, if you would understand the major, the major players there, probably not, right? So if you, if you know everything, so then you could probably write this in three or four equations. So three equations are directly reserved for the Bertram model here. So for, for the Bertram model, for the mitochondrial model. Uh -huh. So 
Um, and then the other four are the classical uh, variables for the uh, calcium model. And there, I, I agree with you that we probably could merge and if we make it dimensionless and uh, consider there is some pre pre preservation laws, I probably, we probably could reduce this also to two or three variables. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. and, and your computational framework is something also the last, the last commercial it's about uh, spiking. It's yes, this is really like data. This is data analysis. So yeah. meaning, so okay. if you have any kind of spiking data, so we actually have done mm -hmm. this now also for this um, uh, fish data from from the epilepsy. Mm -hmm. So we actually also uh, have done some uh, EEG data with that, and so it's, it seems to be a rather robust tool for different approaches. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, so I thought I was doing very well with your talk when I saw the parallel between the activation and the um, the dose response curves for the mitochondrial calcium dehydrogenases, but then I realized I didn't understand something major because you showed that the deterministic model didn't have this behavior, only the stochastic mm -hmm. model. Can you give a simple explanation of why it has to be stochastic? Um, at the I know that was your whole talk, but can you summarize it in 30 words? <laughs> in 30 words, okay. Um, <coughs> so, in 30 words I would say probably that it's, when I have a Hopf bifurcation, so, yeah. so at least this is what it turns out. So, due to that I, when I end up with a Hopf bifurcation, I only get either periodic spiking or none. Yeah? So now for getting this initial phase, so this initial building up phase, so the, the, the first part of the sigmoidal relation, I think that we rely on this not permanent oscillatory pattern, but this a little bit <laughs> uh, activation. Okay, so the noise is, is smoothing it. Okay. So one way to interpret it is that the, you have a subcritical half bifurcation, so you go from nothing to spiking mm. and there's not much variation in the spike frequency as you further mm. increase the stimulus. But if you add noise then you get a sigmoidal increase in the average spike mm. frequency. This is something other people have commented on as well. So basically yeah. you're smoothing out the step yeah. function into a sigmoid by adding yeah. noise. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so you showed the slide where you had two populations of cells that were perfectly synchronized in the beginning, then I think one cell population ran ahead, and then after 42 days they were pretty much at the same yeah. position, okay? Could you explain how the healthy cells in the end catch up? Uh, so actually they catch up because uh, the, uh, so the cell line with the mutation, so their cells die faster. So meaning that the, actually it's not so much that the well the one so the mutation cell line they stop and that's why it's easy for the wild type to catch up. Okay. Good. Thanks. Any other questions? If not, then let's thank yes. both because of this afternoon's session for the excellent talk. Thank you.